over the next one and a half days, I divide them into the three groups, dynamics and optimization, uh, and space situation awareness, interplanetary astrodynamics. You are going to hear from our students uh, in the next one and a half day. And uh, in addition to that, we have a good external speakers. Uh, Professor John Junkins, he will be giving a keynote in the late morning today on the Trojan lunar orbits. Uh, some of you got a trailer yesterday, and today you are going to see the full film in the department seminar, and there will be quiz for the students. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, you cannot escape. <laughs> uh, and uh, then today afternoon, uh, Jim McAdams, uh, they will be talking about the, the ongoing work on the Bayou mission. Uh, and in a, uh, again, tomorrow, Chris will be telling us about the Dragonfly update. And the Dragonfly is very close to Penn State Park uh, because we have our alumni working at JHU APL. And then there is a direct involvement of the Aerospace Engineering Department in this Dragonfly mission. And we are the last two finalists. Uh, from the NASA, uh, we are competing with the JPL, and I think in this fall we get to know by the end of summer. Yeah, we work. It's it's Goddard mission. So yeah, it's a seizure. Uh, we just had our site. Yeah. 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 Yes, and uh, then we will also have Dr. Pradeep Tolkosh from AGI, uh, who will be talking uh, talking about this work. Uh, yeah. So with that, I think. Uh, I will hand it over to Jason, and I would like to thank the Jason for taking the initiative to start the Arbox group, and then also uh, being keep on poking each one of you, the student, to organize this event. Okay, and I think without <coughs> your efforts, we probably would, it would not have been possible. Okay, so I will give it to Jason, and Jason is. Going, also going to be our first speaker. He's going to share with you his ongoing PhD research work on the game theoretic paper for the SSC. Okay. Of how each of the different components of this kind of project will come together 
Mine is really just going to be a small portion of this, but you'll see how each of these different tools, and a lot of which that the university already kind of is using in other ways, um, interact together. So the blue boxes here are with the satellite operator, the red box is the tracking system. You notice, you'll notice that they interact and um, iterate until they converge upon a final match equilibrium solution and uh, determine a winner. Now each of these uh, boxes here is going to be approached through a, a plug-and-play um, architecture, so to speak. So each of the different ones, uh, the box of the track association, box filtering, maneuver reconstruction, sensor tasking, all of those we can go in and replace as we improve upon these, um, our methodology for them. And each of them ideally will incorporate a learned maneuver strategy. And that's where most of my work comes into play here and what I'm going to be talking about today. There are two different um, approaches that I've taken to determining an optimal maneuver strategy. First is a multi-objective optimization approach using reachability sets that allows us to optimize a single maneuver. Second is the optimization of the entire strategy using reinforcement learning. We'll talk about both of those throughout this presentation. I'm going to start out by going through um, some results that I've seen applying reachability sets to the spacecraft detection avoidance problem. So as I'm sure you all know, numerical approaches can be rather expensive, especially for large uh, problem spaces. And that's where reachability sets come in. Though reachability sets are traditionally a practical impossibility, there's some recent work that's been done by Zach, which we'll be presenting on later, uh, that we've been able to develop here that allows us to find these and solve for the reachability sets with minimal computational burden. The unique um, aspect of the space for detection avoidance makes using reachability sets uh, really a no-brainer. We have, um, unique, it's unique in that all objectives may not be met by move, moving the spacecraft just some minimum distance from our nominal orbit. And we can actually get some really good um, information about <coughs> our success in the optimization using topographic coordinates, which um, is rather unique to the detection of what is problem. We do assume that the a nominal mission for our spacecraft requires proximity to the station, which adds um, an additional aspect to the multi-objective optimization. Um, and overall, this will give planners an efficient and accurate method for designing these single maneuvers. So I designed a toy problem. We have an inclined geosynchronous spacecraft where the goal is to avoid detection by the sensor, and to monitor the ground station itself as we to be tracking. The process here, of course, is to first determine a reachable set, uh, given a maximum delta V allowed for that single maneuver, we then calculate the cost for each point within the reachable set, and determine the best point available given our relative objectives. The plot you see here shows how we've been able to create the reachable set, and then uh, transform it into our uh, ground track states. So the um, color bar on the side shows you the relative cost for each of the uh, each of the final ground tracks, and you'll see in a bit how we select each of these uh, our, our optimal ground, final ground track using our. using our objective function itself. So the three metrics being considered here are propellant usage, our ability to meet the nominal mission requirements, and an avoidance of the ground station sensor. <laughs> the ideal result here is that our maneuver changes enough to, changes our orbit enough to confuse the sensor, that we're able to maintain proximity to the ground station that can track us, and to minimize the delta V. So for trial and error, we found this cost function that implements all three of them in a way that gives us a nice distribution of points on our Pareto front, um, as well as gives us a, a reasonable, optimal solution. <coughs> That's what you'll see here. We have each of the three different metrics um, plotted in kind of a, a combination of the three. In the x-axis, you'll see we have the longitudinal ground track difference. The y-axis on the first plot here is our uh, delta V, and on the second plot is the angle between the satellite and the station. So the two points that are chosen here are our optimal point given our selected cost function. 
to see the distribution of points and how this provides us with our, our minimum score. Now it's of course not the minimum delta B solution, but it does provide us with a rather large longitudinal ground track change given a decent delta B application. You can see here how this vis can be visualized in our ground track coordinates, which of course would be even greater when we're talking about at our actual altitude. Now, that was an optimization of just a single maneuver, and it did not actually take into account the um, actual tasking of the ground station sensor, just the location of the ground station. So in order to account for all possible aspects here and to truly have a realistic representation of both entities, we can try to use reinforcement learning to solve this problem. <coughs> of course, you could approach this uh, through a two-player zero-sum game, in which both players have perfect knowledge of the action history of their opponent. Given this and the theory of fictitious play, we know that a Nash equilibrium will develop over time as we watch this game play out. This, um, using reinforcement learning, we can simultaneously adapt the strategies of both <coughs> players. Um, in this case, I've chosen proximal policy optimization, which um, I've determined to be an ideal approach, though it hasn't been applied um, much before in Astro Dynamics. It is a relatively new um, topic in the field um, and has not been approached at all for detection avoidance itself. I found that it works rather well for this problem um, because it allows us to continue to update and minimize our cost function um, while ensuring that we don't vary too far from our optimal strategy iteration to iteration, ensuring a, a easy convergence. <coughs> so, um, in reinforcement learning, we make sequential decisions and represent them as a Markov decision process, in which different actions lead our players to visit different states, each of these action state pairs have a reward function associated with them, and then that reward is immediately given to the player that has earned it. We assume we have access to our reward function and our observation data, and that all we really need here is that optimal strategy. We find this by using an adversarial training algorithm to find our match equilibrium. We pit the optimal opponents against agents from the other player, using actor critic style proximal policy optimization, and this allows us to recover those optimal strategies from the observation data. I devised a simplified problem starting off for this in two dimensions with um, non-dimensional uh, states. We assume that the, that the sensor is tasked, however, that it follows a predefined pattern, so whenever it's turned into a lost custody of the spacecraft, it then follows this pattern you can see here, so we follow this oscillation, increasing amplitude, until it finds the maneuvering spacecraft, and then resets to its assumed capillary dynamics. The goal for the spacecraft itself is to avoid detection by the sensor while simultaneously minimizing fuel. And for this specific scenario I'm presenting today, the spacecraft maneuvers over a fixed time frame, um, but with no constraint on its position. And that's what you see plotted here. So just a sim uh, simple two-dimensional circular orbit. And you'll notice the two different colors on this orbit plot here. We have our uh, light blue, which is when the sensor successfully finds the spacecraft. And we have our purple, where the spacecraft successfully avoids being detected. So you notice it's a around 40% of the time that our spacecraft is able to avoid detection. And also that we barely have to move far at all from the nominal orbit to achieve that. So additional work could be done in seeing how we can apply the, um, greater magnitude maneuvers or how instead of applying um, a continuous control, we use larger impulsive maneuvers. So there's more to be explored here for sure. But we can see, at least from this initial exploration, that <coughs> great success in avoiding detection. So some ideas for moving forward. There is still some ongoing work being done in the reachability set approach. Um, Zach has had some success in varying the onset and termination time of the maneuver, and I'm gonna be looking at how we can apply that to see how we can further minimize our, um, our 
total cost, you know, finding a potentially better um, multi-objective solution. We're also looking to optimize not just one maneuver, but a series of them in an attempt to decre decrease the overall cost, while also creating a nominal uh, maneuver strategy that can be used with the, the reinforcement learning approach. Within that reinforcement learning approach, I'm also looking to um, explore more the objective function selection, how we can potentially allow ourselves to apply greater delta V to see better results. Uh, of course, also extending into three dimensions, as well as trying to find optimal strategies for both players. So allowing this, this tasking strategy to vary as well and see how the two entities will compete. Once I've been able to optimize the strategies of both players, we can apply competitive co-evolution to expand the search space further. Um, and that will lend itself well to some mission design aspects, Working methods and other things that I think will be useful in the DOD and communities. Any questions? So, make um, sure I understand this. So, the sensor on the ground is scanning its own optimal manner. Is that correct? Yeah, so okay. for the reinforcement learning approach, I'm assuming that it's attempting to track this single spacecraft right. and that it is following along with its nominal trajectory until a maneuver is determined to have occurred, then following along the set pattern. And once we're able to apply that with the reinforcement learning approach, that pattern will be allowed to vary. Okay. And we'll be able to see what an optimal pattern would be. And maybe if you can actually proactively test right, to try to determine where it is. It's like a simple role that the spacecraft is in the sensor is <coughs> Yeah, I have a high, it's given a field of view, it's within the field of view, it's found, if it's outside, it's not. So I'll be looking no. at kind of trying to apply correlation and things like that later to make that less black. Yeah, I mean, okay. Have you, uh, have you thought about, uh, it seems like this can get really complex in a hurry once you say, I have N spacecraft and I have N sensors, and uh, suddenly I have optical telescopes looking for me and things like that, and then you have angles of, uh, Sun. The end so goal like be is to lot. expand yeah. into that kind of um, framework, that kind of architecture. We have multiple spacecraft, multiple sensors. I'm personally not going to get there with my research, sure. but I know that that would definitely be of interest, and that it should be possible. It should be possible to expand my research into as many spacecraft or ground sensors as you want, and see you can even use that within the competitive coevolution approach. And let's say we have one versus one, and we know what the solution is. That's like one more spacecraft to continue to explore the, the, the problem space and see how it changes the results. Any more questions? Zach? Oh, can you go back to the slide with the cost function for each one of that one? Yeah, so I'm just wondering, you say that one of your costs is going to be approximately to the presentation, but then another cost is also going to be the way Yes. How exactly are you like parameterizing those? So the uh, the maneuvering away from the ground sensor is literally just a longitudinal change. How far can we get such that they have to vary their, their tracking? And then the idea is we still, even if we're far enough away from them, as long as they're within our field of view, we can still see them. But we see some loss as the angle increases. So that's based on the angular um, difference between the spacecraft and the ground station. As long as it's within its field of view, we see some, some loss. So the lower the angle, the better. So there are two different parameters that I think we would pretty well model that scenario. You said that uh, deception is a key factor. Just the fact that you're publishing your method, are you, are you, are you purposefully putting things in here that you're not, you're not really planning on implementing so that you can deceive those who are trying to figure it that out. Would that would be funny. That would be funny. Not really. Not the really, the reason we're approaching it with the game theory um, theoretical approach like this is because that way it's less predictable if it were to be used so, later. It's just to, an example to show without right. real information how we can. Right, but, but even putting out your methods can. Uh, People it's a who are on the other side, <laughs> your adversaries do yes. make reasonable uh, progress at defeating the system, or is it more like a random number generator that you put your method out, but they're still not going to be able to? I think it's, it's too dependent on the hardware. 
if each result that I get is going to be dependent on initial conditions, constraints, um, the architecture that I'm feeding in general. Um, I can provide some constraints and allow it to choose the architecture at some point, that's going to be the end goal, but they still need to have more information than they likely would, hopefully, to be able to um, actually counteract what they were trying to do. the point of the goal would be effective. So you said the protocol uh, order is when the <coughs> doesn't find the assignment, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm a bit more on the, on the screen, but so there's multiple tiny purple dots along the delivery. Right? Yeah. Yes. So actually, if the sensor doesn't find the space for the But keep in mind, it's not a trajectory. There's no predictability to the actual. It can be seen, even if, like, uh, if it doesn't see the space for a short amount of time, then you can see it, you can see it, you can see it. You can, see it. Um, you can still <coughs> have an idea of what it holds, what it Yes, but we're not, there's no nominal position. There's, there's no, there's no pattern that's going to be able to tell you. If, it, if the space track maneuvers, he doesn't know when it's going to find it. So it doesn't know where it's going to be next. Because the maneuver itself, is the entire goal is to just avoid the sensor while minimizing fuel. There's nowhere it's returning to. There's no trajectory it's following. So even though it might be able to have a general idea, it's, it's nowhere going to be, be nowhere near accurate enough to actually predict where it's going to be next. I mean, it might from each individual point. Like, if it found it here, and it misses it here, and it finds it again, it's going to know where, if it successfully like, updated its state, it don't know where it's going to be next, but the space is going to maneuver again, and it doesn't know where that maneuver is going to lead. So it's going to have to constantly try to maneuver, or try, try to task the sensor to find the space track. And that's, at this point, the goal of this is so that, the, that there's no predictable state that uh, they can be tasked. Okay. I was just confused, like, if you have 40% like, dispatch in all the, like, 40%, 40% for so far, there's a difference. Yeah, I mean, there, there, we can use different objective functions to see different results here, to see maybe the goal would be to, yeah, avoid it for longer periods of time. In order to do that, we want to see it by a larger orbit change where it kind of come out like that. So for a while, it would take a second to, to really catch up if it were to have we see a larger shape. Of course, that would cost more. But at least the goal here is to just minimize the certainty in the spacecraft state, which is exactly what we're doing. Okay. So, so for these non-dimensional units, is it, this is in geo, right? This is in geo. So when you say 40%, you're talking about like 11? 10 hours out of the 24 hour day? Yeah. You're undetectable? Yeah. Like, it seems like not much. Um, and this is with assuming that the sensor and that they have full knowledge of the other person's moves? Uh, it, it assumes that the, yeah, that the spacecraft knows where the, the sensor has, has been. Okay. One of the problems occurred to me, I, have to, I assume you're using Anglo, Anglo's only tap. Uh, orbit termination. Uh, yeah, so I haven't uh, applied the orbit termination aspect yeah. to this yet. I am just assuming that the observations are of the Cartesian states, but I have the um, the filtering framework built up so that I can apply that once. So one of the things uh, going forward is if we assume that the, the uh, opposition party is using uh, an optical uh, angles only sensor, one of the means of deception might be to. Uh, in the vicinity in an angular sense of other spacecraft, either inside geo or slightly outside geo, where you got multiple objects there, uh, and then you really talk about the probability, you could think about the association probability that you could confuse the association issue. Uh, that would be, this isn't, you know, 
criticism, but just saying, thinking about yeah. other, other so ways. For this do problem. Do such, and you could essentially uh, uh, use the fact that uh, geo radar is pretty useless for the Earth, uh, and you, you almost have to rely on optical tracking. And so the, uh, there's quite a few things in geo, a lot of them dead, passive, and if you were in the, in, in the angular uh, vicinity, you might see the physical vicinity, but the, if the look angle for somewhere from Earth, uh, then that would be not really be really a use, use things that are there as kind of deliberate uh, confusion factors and decoys in addition to changing the orbit. Yeah. I mean, I've actually been considering for this problem that it's not going to be geostationary, but like an inclined geosynchronous orbit, because yeah all of the optical sensors that are currently trained to geo, most of them are looking at the equatorial orbit. <laughs> yep. So the idea is that, especially if you're considering um, well, the kind of success that commercial yeah. tracking <coughs> operations have seen, they can filter through and determine where a spacecraft is that's maneuvered just based on the fact that it wasn't, that it's, it's not, has not been updated in their, their database. Right. So the idea here is that we would likely want to incline our orbit so that it requires a sensor or two to be tasked specifically to track that spacecraft. And yeah, we could look at saying, okay, what if we use like a, like a shell game type approach? Yeah. And we see, okay, would we put multiple identical spacecrafts up there, but one of them is the one that we're attempting to hide and they don't know which one it is. Correct. That is isn't definitely something we can be looking into. But at this point, we'll likely know which, if they found it, yeah. it's just gonna be, the question is how frequently Okay, just just share my time and we'll go back it out. You mean here? Uh, still have two minutes, sir. <laughs> okay, <laughs> go ahead, I think. Uh, if you want to take I just hope I'm not called blind, but from that figure, where's your transfer trajectory? It's no transfer trajectory. The trajectory is the light blue and the purple line. It's essentially every single state the spacecraft has either found <coughs> or not found. It's not attempting to transfer anywhere, it's just continually maneuvering slightly off of its nominal orbit to um, to an attempt to confuse the sensor. So the colors you see that are not dark blue are the transfer. Okay, so all their all their unfunding and funding dots can combine the Yes, the person is trying to correct them. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, please do your time. Okay, <laughs> while we are setting up, our next speaker is Damien. Uh, Damien has been uh, working with me and uh, Professor Menton together, and he's also using this presentation uh, to fulfill his requirement for master's in science in, a, in, a, in aerospace. Uh, and Damien has been at Penn State from the one and almost one and a half years. Yeah, almost yeah. Years. and. Uh, uh, he will be now continuing for his PhD in India, and he's going to talk about when and uh, why we should not or we should use the deep learning for the astrodynamics talk. Okay. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, thank you for being here. So yeah, we'll talk about uh, deep learning, <coughs> deep learning in astrodynamics. Uh, we'll see if it's effective, if it's useful. Uh, so first. Uh, let me let me introduce these guys. Uh, so I mean, we all know that these two have been doing some great work. Uh, I've actually learned about this one yesterday. Uh, so Tycho Bray is actually the advisor of Kepler. Uh, there's weird stories about the, the death of this guy who might have been poisoned by this <laughs> advisor. <laughs> so, um, yeah, because I think this one. Would, he didn't want to share some data with his advisor, so he was not happy and talked to him. Uh, so anyway, so these these people have been working um, with that. Primarily, they've been gathering data to derive a model. So that's why we call data-driven modeling. And everything they've discovered is by observations. And with the mean of these observations, they've been able to derive some meaning um, and get at the end some mathematical model um, for their environment equations and, and model. 
so machine learning is a very, very wide domain. Uh, there's supervised learning and supervised learning. There's a, a whole bunch of applications. And it's very fancy to use the, the word machine learning today. Uh, that's a, a whole new a uh, whole new thing when you when you have computers that are capable now to perform very very heavy computations. When you are able to gather uh, a lot of data, you can bring all of that together and do <coughs> cool stuff with machine learning. But there's there have been few work in dynamic system identification using machine learning primarily. Uh, so that's the whole thing today. Um, is that possible for machine learning tools, neural networks? Uh, artificial intelligence in a wide sense to derive some meaning from the data um, and apply that to dynamic system identification. Um, so there have been there have been some examples where machine learning tools have been successful. Uh, but it's difficult to know if these tools are just approximating data or if they actually learn something from the data. Are they capable to capture the feature and learn the feature? If I give a training set, it may be capable to derive some meaning from this training set, but if I go to a whole new data, are they capable to do the same? So that's the whole question. If I show you these images as humans, you can see some features, you can derive some meaning, etc., etc. But if you give this data to uh, machine learning tools, are they capable to see the vortices? Are they capable to see the circulation of the flow? Are they capable to, to take that information, to learn that information? <coughs> and if I give them other data, are they capable to derive the same meaning? Uh, so this work that I've been doing with Dr. Melton and Dr. Singer, uh, it's an investigation work. We just want to investigate whether these tools are effective or not. Uh, so just to be sure we are on the same page, um, so we want to study the question of approximation and prediction um, of machine learning tools, and we will be focusing uh, today on neural networks. Um, so we consider the two-body problem uh, to investigate these capabilities. Uh, we don't want to use these tools to predict the state space of our objects. We don't want to replace uh, the Kepler laws and to the ben uh, theory. We just want to know if they are capable from data to derive a meaning and to, to find something in, to find some yeah, meaningful uh, insight from the data. Uh, we chose the, the, the two-body problem because it's, it's simple, the one problem. There's interesting properties uh, like conservation laws uh, that we can find. And yeah, so that, that's just because of a rich history and everybody knows the, the two-body problem. Uh, all right, let's get started. So just a reminder. And you don't do that here. Um, I just highlighted here the dynamics. So you have the function f that maps the um, position at any time to the acceleration. And that's actually uh, what we want to know if any system, so this is where the dynamics are, if any <coughs> neural network or any system can find something similar to this, or is it possible for a model to approximate this function f? and find the actual dynamics of the system. All the dynamics are here, just with one parameter mu. We'll talk about that at the end. Uh, just, rem just to remind that these dynamic, the dynamics here for the two-body problem are just driven by one parameter mu. And we want to know if some system, some model, can learn uh, these dynamics. Um, so let's go before, before going in, um, too, too far, let's go first with the neural network. So what is a neural network? Uh, it's a model. In theory, it's capable to approximate any function. You can prove that uh, to any precision. So it's just a mapping between two, between an input and an output. Um, so this mapping will put it down. And this mapping, this neural network, is um, parameterized by a set of parameter alpha. You can change this parameter to change the model. Um, You've probably seen some image like this where you have inputs, then you have um, layers and output at the end. Um, these parameters alpha define uniquely a neural network uh, with the architecture. So you have inputs, you have outputs, that's x and y, and the mapping in between is a very 
complex nonlinear mapping, and we want to know if this mapping is capable to approximate, um, we have some output is capable to approximate our input. So the very simple model that we yeah, you've seen the slide before, this is a neuron. You have some entries, you weight these, these entries, you add a bias, you go through a non-linear function, and you have your, your output. You do that for all the neurons in your layer, you stack them into layers, and you have a you have this model, and you, you hope that at the end you can approximate your, your data. Uh, if you stack them, so there's a, another writing here, you stack these neurons and you organize them into layers. And you can repeat these layers as much as you want if your computer uh, is able to handle that. Um, and I was talking about parameters. So the parameters of the of the model here, the set of parameters alpha, that's all these weights bias that you see. Uh, they are all in this in this set, uh, in this set alpha. Uh, the function phi you see here generally is a nonlinear function. You have a bunch of different choices you can make. Uh, usually it's heuristic. You, you just bet, and if something works well, you, you choose that. Um, so I was. I was presenting this kind of neural network where you, you stack layers. Uh, you, you have actually a bunch of different neural networks. You can come up with many, many ideas. Uh, there's another another one that we call residual neural network, where you, you stack, you still have layers like this, you stack them, but you also provide layer to layer, you provide the output from the previous layer. So the output of the previous layer is directly given as the input of the following layer. Uh, so that if you, if you look at the map, um, you have what we call a residual <coughs> learning, <coughs> meaning that by giving the input, by giving the output of the previous layer to the to the following layer, you want to know if this layer, the layer you add, is really interesting for your network. So instead of learning a um, non-linear mapping between the layers, you're learning a different um, a PDE or ODE. You, you're learning a differential equation between the layers. So instead of having a non-linear mapping between the layers, you now have a differential equation between the layers. Um, so there's more details in this paper and other papers also. Uh, what we've come up with also is a deep residual neural network where you have these residual blocks, but also you stack them uh, the same way we do for the, the previous network, the D4 neural network, and you still provide the input of the, um, it's probably the output of the previous layer to the next layer. So you have a combination of nonlinear nonlinear mapping and differential equation between layers. Um, so you have there's a the simple neural network, you have the residual, you have the deep residual. You can list thousands of them and test them. For this work, we've tested these three, these three networks. Um, so I presented the model, and how do we do to be sure, I mean, yeah, how do we do to, to have this model correctly approximate our data? <coughs> well, we need, that's the phase we, we call training. Uh, so to do that, we, we will I just specify the computational details here. We use TensorFlow, TensorFlow to implement the neural networks. They, if you know Mathematica, it's the kind of the same thing. You use abstract algebra, abstraction, to build the neural networks, to build the tensors, and then do computations um, in the abstract domain uh, before evaluating actually the data. Uh, for all the orbit propagation, we use Polyastro, and we use the server uh, we have in that state to um, so, how do we use the neural network to find the dynamics, the linear dynamics of our system? Well, if you start with position acceleration, um, the classical way to do that, oh, I have this animation. Uh, the classical way to do that, if uh, you are in the, 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 the classical Newton dynamics, uh, you get the acceleration from the position, then you integrate acceleration and velocity, and you get position and velocity at the next time step. And you do that again and again and again. That's what you call in, uh, in MATLAB. So in, in this work, what we want to try to see is if we replace the Newton dynamics by the neural network, so the input is the position and the output is the acceleration, 
we go through an integration scheme and we provide and we get the uh, we get the position and, act and velocity at the next time step. Is this model accurate? Uh, is this yeah, accurate enough for our data position? I just want to make a note here. When we do this prediction, we only give once and only once the true initial position and velocity, and then we let this model going alone. We never go back to the true data and give them back uh, the inside of the true trajectory. We just give true initial position, true initial velocity, we go through the model, and the neural network has to do the whole prediction alone for the whole trajectory. Um, so that's that's the model. That's what we want to. That's what we want to do. How do we actually assess the capability of this neural network? Well, we have to compare the two the two outputs here. Are they similar? Are they the same? If they're exactly the same, well, yeah, the neural network did a good job. If they're not, we have to to know um, how far uh, these two quantities are. So we use what we call the loss function. So let me focus just a bit on the loss function. The loss function is a function um, depending on the model and S, which is the training set. Um, so how do we write the loss function? Basically like this, this is the true output uh, from the training set, and this will be the approximated output from the neural network model and the whole scheme. Um, this is, if the loss is very low, you say, okay, my neural network did a good job. If the loss is very high, uh, you want to say, okay, the approximation might not be very accurate. When you say you want to train a neural network, you just want to minimize this function. So you you go to an optimizer, you the parameters alpha, the, the weights and bias of your neural network, you just change these values, you go to an optimizer that will optimize the, the set alpha, and you go through and you iterate to, to get the lower loss possible. Uh, there's also a second version of the loss. You can, if you have some prior information, you can include what we call soft constraints. For our problem, we know that angular momentum is constant. We know that energy around the orbit is constant. So if the approximated angular momentum and the approximated energy <coughs> uh, are not the same as the true one, we can include these two terms inside the loss function to enforce these constraints. But that's prior information, that's prior knowledge that we know about our problem, that we don't necessarily know for any time system. Uh, all right, so let's get let's get started. So we did some numerical simulations. So we first started training on one orbit and looking what's going on in the same orbit, training on one orbit, looking what's going on in the second different orbit. That was not doing very well, so we directly went to uh, training on 10 orbits. Uh, so we have the applications here. And we want to investigate three things. The first thing is to um, investigate whether including the soft constraint we saw in the loss function is effective or not. Second thing we want to know is uh, different neural network structures are actually, um, are they performing differently? Probably yes, but how? And what if also we change the coordinate system? What if we um, specify the math differently? What if we write the math differently? Will it change something? So that's what we want to do. Uh, so first case, so we train on 10 orbits and we want to know what's going on on three completely different orbits. So blue and, uh, blue and green, we have uh, in green the true orbit, blue the predicted orbit. Uh, usually like this, that's pretty well, but if you look at uh, the actual numbers. So the area in the position, <laughs> you are in next unit here, uh, around 10 minus seven in position. But if you include, you have here on your right, if you include the soft constraint inside the loss function, uh, you gain more than one order of magnitude. Yeah. You gain one order of magnitude if you include these this soft constraints in the loss function. Uh, error in velocity, 10 minus six and 10 minus seven, so you gain, again, uh, one order of magnitude. Angular momentum error, 10 minus six and 10 minus seven, if you include uh, the soft constraints, and same thing for specific energy, you almost, not exactly, you almost gain one, one order of magnitude. Um, so that was the first test. What if, yeah, so just a bit reminder. Uh, so what we've tried in, in a work 
for one orbit, but including uh, the self contour inside the loss function, where we, we gain one order of magnitude. So that's what we did for the whole, all the tests we, we've done after that. We will always include now the, the self contour inside the loss function. Um, so then when you, have a, when you have a network like this, with layers, you want to change the structure. You want to see if another model can do better. If you want to change the structure, uh, you want to be sure that you will gain something. There's no technique, there's no way to design, if you have a problem, there's no, yeah, best, the best technique to, to design the, the best network that um, if you If you want to, come up with some model, you want to be sh that would be that would be good if this model is what we call parsimonious, so you don't have too many parameters in that, in that new model. Um, so we, we've seen different structures, we've seen uh, different coordinate choices that we will test. And if you want a more complex model, it, it may not be beneficial for you to add more layers. It doesn't mean it's not because you add more layers or you have a bigger system that you will get more accuracy at the end. Um, you, you want to add layer only if you have some benefits and you want to be sure that your network is learning something new. So that's why we went to the residual neural network. Uh, so you have these three network. The feed forward is the, the one we just saw and I put again the results here and compared to the, the ResNet, that's the residual neural network we've seen before and the deep ResNet, the one we, where you stack all these residual blocks. Um, so that's the R in position. And we have, I, I, I remind you that we have the soft constraints in the loss function. So we have slightly better results for the ResNet and deep ResNet in position. Same thing in velocity. Each time the deep ResNet has performed a bit better than the ResNet and the T4 neural network that we've seen before. Uh, same thing for the momentum. Again, um, almost 100 magnitude and uh, for, the, for the energy. So that's a table that summarizes everything. Uh, you have the feed forward, resonant, and deep resonant, the three structures, and you have the results for position, velocity, and momentum, and energy. Uh, I was talking about parsimonious, in, uh, I was talking about parsimonious system, parsimonious models. Uh, when you count the number of parameters inside your, your set alpha, uh, that describes your model. You can see that for the feed forward, you have more than 2,000 parameters. For the deep ResNet on the far right, you have more than 7,000. 7, but just for the ResNet, with the, small, the smaller network, you have only 480 parameters. Even if it has, yeah, slightly worse than the deep ResNet, uh, if you compare to the number of parameters, you can say that ResNet is actually uh, kind of powerful and maybe more more interesting than the deep Um The last thing we want to try is is what if we change the coordinate system? So what if we write the two-body problem instead of writing it in Cartesian coordinates? What if you write it in polar coordinates so that we have directly the central force here is only uh, from the right of axis, and so the dynamics. Remember. Uh, that was F before, so now it's G. And G has a zero here, and just the dynamics of just one term uh, inside this function. So we want to know if this term here is independent from theta. The G is a function of R theta. We, have, we know that it's not a function of theta. But is the system able to find that it's not a function of theta here? And second, we want to know if here there's no uh, tangential acceleration. So that's what we ask our network. So we, we train them with this data, and we went through the layers to see the evolution of, uh, so this is gr, so this is the first component, minus mu over r squared. And we want to see if this component is independent from theta. So you, we are going in the r theta space, and you can see the value of gr. Uh, so after the first layer, after the second layer, third layer, and the output, you have theta here. So if you look at, if you vary theta, you can see that there's no, there's no difference. Almost no difference, up to two digits. So 
we kind of say that maybe the network is able to to know that this data is independent from theta. The acceleration, the radial acceleration, is independent from theta. Uh, secondly, we look at G theta. So the second component, we want this to be zero, but there's no tangential acceleration. So after the first layer, second, third, and at the output. So same thing, it's almost zero up to two digits, but there's still variations. You can still see the colors. And two digits, uh, that's not that good, actually. Um, so this is a, a table that summarizes everything. Again, you have the, the result from the Cartesians and the P4. And the part we did that with the whole of the other network structures we have. Um, for this example, where you have these numbers here, you don't have the um, soft constraints in the last one. We didn't include that because we can't, uh, we didn't do that for the polar coordinates. What we tried, it's because you have a zero here, what we did is we enforced, when we, when we initialized the network, we enforced this, this zero. We enforced it. So instead of initializing the, the network randomly, or the bias and weights, we enforced this output to be zero. So this is zero. So you have, uh, this is the norm of the weights value. Uh, the, the, the weights that correspond to this, to this zero after during the training, so they, they, they are zero almost all the time. And uh, we have now these this results where the deep resnet provides better results than the feed for um, in your field. So the, to rewrite the math, to rewrite the dynamics in polar coordinates and to get the central force only for one component of the dynamics allows better accuracy uh, than Cartesian coordinates. Uh, ResNet and Deep ResNet, they do pretty much the same. There's no big difference. So at the end, what we can uh, conclude is that for the accuracy, okay, Deep ResNet is a bit better, but has also way much more parameters than all of these other networks. Um, and also, the computational time for Deep ResNet is very, very long, it's very heavy. Uh, to work with that. Um, overall, ResNet provides similar accuracy to deep ResNet, but with much less, uh, much less parameters, and same thing for computation. Um, so what I want to say is it's good to approximate the mean motion, the mean trajectory. <coughs> uh, it's not good if you want to train on one orbit and go to another orbit, completely break them. If you, if you go uh, and include constraint violation in the loss function, it does a bit better. You gain one order of magnitude. And uh, you have also to provide a lot of data to be sure that uh, your, your model is able to, to approximate something decently. Um, ResNet, Deep ResNet, they, they provide better results than feed forward, the classical feed forward neural networks um, in Cartesian coordinates, but also in polar coordinates, we've seen that it's good to change uh, the coordinates to recover uh, the dynamics. Um, also, it's it may be, when you have this whole model, you want to optimize during the training phase. You go through an optimizer and you change the, the weights and bias. You're not certain that you will not reach a local minima in the training phase, you might be reaching one, and that's what we've seen when we when you actually initialize the weights to zero, we reached a minima for the a local minima for the previous case. Putting the weights to zero allowed yeah, allowed us to go outside this minima. Maybe we reach another local minima, but at least we're not at this one. And um, overall ResNet and provide better accurate, for good accuracy with a fewer number of parameters compared to the other, other networks. So there's a, a lot of work in that in that area. Uh, I, I won't continue directly that work from activity. I will move on and do something do something else. Uh, but a lot of people are working um, in this area. Uh, the, 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 the main question is to know whether these tools can be a valuable partner in scientific discovery, scientific um, 
knowledge. Uh, if you give them um, data and, uh, from a dynamical system, are they able to derive some, some sense, some meaning? That's not always the case. Uh, what I want to say, okay, so this is Kepler, this is, this is a, an artificial, uh, artificial brain. So Newton is still, is still uh, better than all these, all these guys. Uh, Newton has derived this law with only one parameter mu. The best results we have here, it has 480 parameters. So that's 480 times higher than uh, Newton. So this artificial brain, this artificial intelligence, they are very, very far away from uh, the actual human intelligence uh, in that time. Uh, so thank you, thank you very much. If you have any question, I will be happy to answer it. Yes. Uh, I have two questions. So speaking of your training data, are they directly from the observation data or from the environment? No, we simulate them. Okay. We have a, we have a tolerance of 10 minus 10. So we were keeping a track of uh, the these tolerances. So when we reach 10 minus 9 tolerance for some position error, we're close to integration um, tolerance. Okay. Yes. So the, uh, you're used to just a simple providing model. Yes. Have, you, have you thought about what it would take if you added just a simple perturbation to that? Model? We've not done this uh, <laughs> test. <laughs> Is it overwhelmed? It will probably completely break down. Actually, maybe for the training set, it will. I mean, for the training set, I expect something to be uh, pretty accurate. As soon as we go, uh, I think outside the bounds of the training set, I think if you have uh, any kind of maneuver, any kind of perturbation, J two yeah, or so whatever. J2. Uh, so that, that's another. So that's another term in the dynamics. So that's another term to learn. And they are not the same order of magnitude. So if you learn something, is the error we learn? Is it J2? Is it the actual error of just the network itself? That will, that's a, a great question. That's a boring question. I think there's a question. Uh, I have an implementation question. So you're, um, you're finding a map between position and acceleration. Yes. And that map is going to tell you what to put in your DE on the right hand side. Is that reasonable? Yeah. That's what you're doing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, from the project. It's a great discussion that you introduced. Now, um, when we go forward, so, so now you're training it based on several initial condition trajectories. Yes. And yeah. let's say that uh, if you have a set of position velocity, then uh, you're using that position velocity integration forwards in time, what acceleration those trajectories experience to fit the model. Right? And then after you have the approximate, <coughs> you're gonna use that later <coughs> for any initial conditions that yes. have been spanned in the domain, yes. and, and, and that's the whole process, right? Um, that's great. Uh, now, the, the thing that I'm uh, a little confused about is uh, this map that you're trying to approximate uh, in the in the later stage when you went to quarter coordinates, it's not necessarily a position to acceleration map anymore. The velocity is entered the picture. Uh, so how did you accommodate for that? Did you have to change the variables because now you're map mapping on the to to implement an acceleration function? You have some terms yes. that are not in the domain anymore. Yeah, let me uh, just so how did you do that? Right. So you get to know how that Yes. So I think yeah, that's all the other dot square and yeah, 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 that stuff. We don't. Uh, yeah. Yes. So now it's not necessarily a map from yes. position to uh, exactly. Okay. So if you remember the the flow chart I had before, yeah. so I had this position and acceleration directly. Actually, for this case, we have uh, some kind of another uh, map. Yes, another map, but because we know that from the map, yes. I directly, uh, I directly coded it. Uh, we would directly provide that to the to these two, to these two. Take by We we take that from oh, the previous time step. Okay, yeah. so you remove we those. We calculate them. We provide them to the acceleration, and then we add this term coming out from the neural network model. We integrate everything, and we see at the end what's Okay. This brings me to my real question. Uh, 
Perfect. So my real question is, so your math is, is providing an acceleration mm -hmm. for a given position. Mm -hmm. uh, but your results seem to indicate you have the highest position accuracy going forward in time. That somehow doesn't make sense to me. Because position is because two it's, it's innovations away. Before in Cartesian coordinates, you approximate the whole acceleration in yes. XYZ yes. Uh, coordinates. Now we approximate part of the acceleration. That's so we do a smaller approximation. Yeah, in both cases, in no matter what you do, your approximation errors seem to be least in the position space. Which doesn't make, make sense to me because they should be best in the acceleration level which then integrates to velocity and then integrates second time to position. So I would intuitively think it would pick up stuff, junk, twice, okay. and it would be worse in the position level. So I don't understand. Could you explain that? So <coughs> I'm not sure I really understand your question. Let me help you. Uh, so uh, just when we integrate, we integrate together acceleration and velocity yes. to get position and velocity. Yes. Okay, let me let me clarify my question. We have an approximate. Mm -hmm. and approximations always have errors; they're always stupid. Yes. So when they when you integrate whatever is the error, it becomes it, it's larger. It, get, it gets you know amplified somehow. Yes. And if when you integrate twice, it should amplify even more. Mm -hmm. But your your results seem to have the least errors in the in the second integration okay. answer. So I don't understand that. Also, because when we train the network, we do not train the network to. Um, you remember the loss function? Yes. Inside the loss function, we do not say um, approximate correctly the acceleration. Oh, okay. We say approximate correctly the position. And that's the only term we do. Okay. So yeah. the, the, the training phase takes it includes care of that. these errors and then it yes. 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 And it will directly. Thank you. Um, yeah. the, the, the that answers my question. Thank you. Real quick, if you do not want to be recorded, please let me know. If you do want to be recorded, please stand to the right of the screen. Oh, that side. <laughs> Okay, our uh, next speaker is Peter. Uh, Peter is again our uh, PhD student, he, uh, and uh, he is going to that in his work on considered carbon filtry for the maneuver detection and uh, relative orbit determination. Okay, so good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Peter, and just like I'm pushing with that, I'm going to be discussing. Um, Consider filtering uh, in a relative motion problem for maneuver detection. Um, this is kind of the outline of what I'll be going over. So I'll be going over kind of like the background motivation and going into just briefly go over the relative dynamics and then into the, the meat of the problem, going over the, the consider filter um, and the maneuver uh, uh, detection filter uh, design. And then I'll show some. Uh, some uh, uh, results at the end, some preliminary results. So um, I did this work um, with the Air Force Institute of Technology <coughs> over uh, last summer. Um, and the sort of goal of this study was to develop methods of orbit determination in which you are looking at some unknown maneuver and you don't know the, uh, the start and stop uh, time of the maneuver, and you don't know the overall duration. You have no a priori knowledge of, of the maneuver. And the specifications of uh, the spacecraft that you are trying to detect, you you don't necessarily know anything about the spacecraft you're looking at. It's completely uncooperative, and the spacecraft itself is potentially of unknown um, design and specification. And the, the overall goal is for this to be amenable to um, onboard implementation in real time. So some sort of some background information on um, on sort of like the maneuver detection research in um, the past ten or so years. Um, 
So a lot of work goes into the linear state propagation, and you assume that the maneuvers itself are, are constant. Um, doing a um, sort of variable uh, maneuver detection is a much more complicated problem, um, where you have uh, you know, either increasing or decreasing levels of thrust. Um, using uh, multiple models uh, for a common filter design is a, a very popular way of going about this, wherein you have different weighting um, mechanisms um, for your various models, and you're basically trying to find which model uh, approximates more closely to the thrust that you are, are, are getting. Um, another approach is to apply a smoothing function to uh, your sort of time histories of some and looking at your, your past states and updating your, your current state um, according to that. Um, and lastly, um, another uh, method is using the variable state dimension filter, wherein you are directly adding the thrust states to your, your state estimation um, when you detect a maneuver, and thus you're directly um, estimating the, the thrust states themselves. So kind of quickly, just going over the, the relative dynamics, um, I am looking at a, um, a chief and deputy satellite wherein the, uh, the deputy is the, um, your, your satellite that is uh, looking at um, <coughs> the, the chief's um, orbit. And specifically for the, uh, your reference satellite, you have these compact reference uh, satellite variables um, and these govern the, the motion of your your satellite that um, that you will be using to take observations on on, on the other. Um, so you have your you know, radius of velocity, or you're looking at angular momentum, trilomy, and, and inclination. And the relative uh, um, dynamics can be seen here. You have the so you're not assuming a um, linear, uh, you're not using the Kalikasi Wilshire uh, uh, formulation, you're not assuming um, any linearities, and you're also adding um, the J2 perturbation. Um, and so these are the uh, angular um, and the angular velocity uh, velocities of the, the rotating frames um, here. and. Um, this constant down here is used a lot in, in the formulation, just grouping kind of constants that are, are used in, in, in the formulations here. So these are the uh, governing uh, equations of motion, um, where these uh, accelerations and uh, velocity parameters are embedded in, in these equations for um, compactness. So kind of moving on to like the motivation for using a consider common filter to, to do this. Um, in classic common filters, um, mildly or completely unobservable parameters can cause divergence in the filter, or it can cause an overconfident biased filter. Um, so this was originally developed by Schmidt in the, the 1960s for handling uncertainty in um, measurement models and dynamic models. Um, and the solution that he um, proposed uh, was uh, done by not estimating these parameters directly. Um, so instead of estimating them directly, you're basically just considering their uncertainty in um, the states that you are <coughs> um, So the, the common gain and the, the measurement update is done using these associated uncertainties. Um, and then these associated uncertainties update your states and give your, your filter that extra, um, the, that extra uh, propagation, that extra um, covariance that it needs to um, update the states appropriately. So, the writing it in a augmented state vector, um, the the states that you're estimating are uh, x, and your considered parameters are are p. Um, so you're concatenating uh, these. Uh, uh, parameters to your overall um, state estimation. And uh, you're also uh, adding to the um, 
covariance uh, matrix where you have these cross terms um, from the uh, consider parameters and your states, and you have your um, the consider covariance itself. So kind of looking at the overall algorithm, those uh, students here that have taken StatOD um, will recognize uh, these, um, this algorithm here, but you'll also notice um, some, some key uh, additions. So you have uh, embedded in, in the dynamics and embedded in the, just like all the, the updates, time updates and the measurement updates, you have <coughs> the addition of all these uh, considered parameter terms. And the, the key um, takeaways from this is that um, the, the considered parameters themselves never update. So that goes along with what I was saying earlier, so you're not estimating considered parameters. Um, you're just looking at the effects that they have on the, um, the updates of your, your states. Um, same thing with the, uh, the considered covariance itself. Um, that also never updates. Um, you're just updating the, the overall covariance of the states and the, the overall states themselves according to the uncertainties that you are providing from the, the considered parameters. So moving on to the maneuver detection itself. So the, the way it works is you have a, um, you have two models within the overall algorithm. You have the quiescent model, and you have the maneuver detection model. So the way it works is you initialize your system assuming that there's no maneuver taking place. And um, you have some new observation coming coming in. Exactly. So you have some new observation coming in and you're propagating your states. So this, uh, there you go. So this uh, this uh, flow diagram here is basically this like compact section over here. So you um, have a uh, a metric to determine whether or not a maneuver is taking place. You're basically looking at the residual, um, and when you have you define some predefined threshold, and once the, uh, once your like residual like surpasses this threshold, um, it switches to the, the VSD model, and with, during that model switch, you're now adding the added states of abrupts to the the state vector and the uh, variance, um, and then it will, will keep repeating the loop uh, as long as a maneuver is still being detected, and then once um, once again, the residual grows after a maneuver takes place. Um, eventually, the, the filter will catch up and detect that a maneuver has stopped, and then it will switch to back to the guess model and remove the, the states and consider parameters. And during these both model switches, um, you inflate the covariance um, according to a scheme such as this. Um, basically, to allow for the uncertainty and, and the position and velocity um, that you've incurred after a maneuver has been going on for, for some duration before you detect either the, the start or end of it um, because uh, your position and velocity states are, are very um, uncertain after a maneuver has uh, been going on for some, some time frame and so you have to Increase your your variance to um, to allow for uh, that uncertainty to um, be expressed. And moving on to the um, implementing the consider filter with the maneuver detection. So um, detection of maneuvers is uh, very dependent on on tuning your parameters. So the, the threshold that uh, this threshold here. Um, needs to be about 99% uh, above the values that you would just get nominally from running a filter with no maneuver. So if, if you make that threshold too low, then it's going. you're going to have many false positives and 
you'll be detecting maneuvers and ending maneuvers, uh, you know, every time step. So you need to make that threshold high enough um, to allow for uh, maneuvers to not be falsely detected. Um, and the covariance threshold uh, here, um, when you're inflating your covariance, you need to um, pick a threshold that is not um, not too large or small, such that you inflate or inflate the covariance either too much or too little. Um, and then the overall level of process noise that you are, are using um, also have, can have dramatic effects on whether you can um, detect the maneuver or not. Um, low thrusting accelerations can uh, be very tricky to, to detect. Um, and uh, the, the dynamical modeling you're using is also very important because um, if you're using a, a lower fidelity model, you might have uh, false excitations of uh, a maneuver based on just numerical error. Um, so you're trying to eliminate as many sources of, um, of error as possible to try to eliminate any false uh, positive uh, maneuver uh, detections. Um, other things that can make this uh, a challenging uh, problem to, uh, to solve is, uh, again, your overall measurement process noise and uncertainty states resulting from the maneuver itself. Um, so as I kind of briefly mentioned before, inherently within uh, considered filters is the ability to cope with uncertain biases within uh, um, your dynamical model and your measurement model. Um, and the associated uncertainty from considered parameters adds more targeted uh, adjustment to the states than just simply inflating the uh, covariance. Um, and another added benefit of using the considered filter is that it doesn't add um, that much computational expense because like I mentioned before, you're not directly estimating the considered parameters themselves. So they're not really adding that much extra computation to the to the filter because you, you never update them. So looking at um, the overall algorithm for the uh, consider variable state dimension filter, um, you'll, you'll notice that uh, you have to um, add the, the consider terms to the um, to the uh, to the states. So like before, you are um, augmenting. The, uh, the considered parameter to the states for the state and the variance. And the, the metric for determining a, uh, a maneuver is uh, has some added terms based on the, um, based on the, the considered parameters. Um, and after a maneuver detection is done, you are augmenting the state vector with <coughs> the considered parameters that um, are prevalent in the, um, the maneuver detection model. So here you are um, appending uh, the consider uh, parameter related to the maneuver, um, and you are appending it to the, the, the covariance matrix as well. So again, once the filter detects, once the filter detects a maneuver end, um, you remove those states, so you, you remove uh, the consider um, parameter related to the maneuver and you remove it from the, the covariance as well. So you reduce the size of the, uh, the state, your state vector and you reduce the size of your uh, covariance back to what was originally. So kind of just messing with the toy problem. Um, okay. uh, I chose, um, just a, a nearly circular orbit. Um, the, the parameters that I was using um, based on the difference in the ballistic coefficient of the, the chief and deputy spacecraft and the, uh, the mass of the, the chief uh, of spacecraft. And I specifically chose the tuning parameters to be non-optimal, um, basically for the purposes of um, just seeing how both filters can handle um, not ideal, uh, not not ideal like situation, and also um, by looking at the 
non-optimal situation, you can see how they can handle um, more general scenarios because when if you're specifically tuning a uh, tuning the filter to handle one specific thing, um, it might not be able to handle different uh, different parameters. So um, the thrust levels itself, um, I also chose it to be very low to, to make it hard for the both filters to try to cope with um, the uh, detecting the maneuver itself. Um, and also, an, an important assumption being made is that the, the mass of the uh, from the fuel loss is negligible over the duration of the simulation, because an important part of the assumption, the underlying assumption of considered parameters, is that the the uh, they don't change over the um, duration of your propagation. So, looking at about 200 runs, um, the the mean of the uh, residual uh, error for the um, for just a, a nominal EKF and then the considered uh, EKF, um, you can see that for looking at the the, the position states for um, X, Y, and Z, that the uh, the SEKF um, performs uh, much better than just uh, the nominal EKF. Um, the, the EKF struggles to uh, to converge back to the uh, the orbit after a maneuver takes place. So the maneuver takes place at 4,500 seconds into the simulation. So both of them uh, have trouble initially detecting the maneuver, and this is partly because of uh, the non-optimal um, parameters that um, were were chosen for for the uh, simulation. Um, that this can definitely be improved upon using uh, more optimal uh, tuning parameters. Um, and the RMS error of, um, of the SEKF is in some cases more than double, uh, more than twice as, as good as the, the nominal EKF. Um, just taking some, some sample trials from those 200 runs, um, you can see here that uh, the the SEKF um, after the initial uh, maneuver is detected, uh, much uh, more rapidly <coughs> converges back to the the true orbit, whereas the, the EKF uh, struggles and actually um, at some point begins to diverge from the solution. Um, and just looking at the uh, the residual errors um, from these same trials here, uh, the EKF um, falsely detects another maneuver um, at this point here. So you can see that the covariance is inflated uh, a second time. Um, and at this point, the solution just starts to begin to diverge completely. Um, whereas using the same tuning parameters, uh, the SEKF is able to um, rebound from the uh, rebound from the maneuver detection and converge back to uh, <coughs> the, the orbit that you're uh, estimating. So the takeaways from from the study are that um, consider filtering has the ability to improve um, the VSD by adding the associated uncertainties with. Uh, um, unknown uh, parameters, um, and the SEKF is less sensitive to the two of these uh, suboptimal sub, uh, tuning parameters than, um, than the EKF is, which can be more applicable to more realistic situations. Um, so the next step for me um, for this is uh, pro properly tuning the, the filter and seeing how both of them perform, and then kind of looking at the thrust um, estimations itself and seeing how well they detect a maneuver start and, and stop time. Um, and then the effect on lowering and raising the uncertainty of the considered parameter, see how that affects uh, the, uh, the accuracy of the estimation. 
And then um, going back to what I mentioned uh, in a previous slide about uh, some common ways of doing maneuver detection, um, applying uh, a noticeable model um, Kalman filter to this uh, architecture to encompass uh, consider parameters and see how, how that performs. Um, and future work that can potentially be done on this is the effect of adding um, more considered parameters, because I only had had two parameters I was considering. So the effect of adding more and seeing if that has any um, improvement upon um, the results and extrapolating it to other maneuver detection approaches. Any questions? We're a couple minutes already into our break. Do you want to answer questions one on one during yep. the break? Mm -hmm. yeah. Eight minutes set aside for break. There's coffee and bagels still. Um, by the way, there is no decaf coffee. They're both caffeinated coffee. So. <laughs> both using either. Thank you. 
so what we do is we assign a probability distribution function to all of the input variables here, R1, V1, and U. And then we're looking for how you can propagate these initial uncertainties in onto the future state. So the reachability sets that we're, con that we're concerned with are, we're going to define it as the probability contours of the final state given our uncertainty <laughs> specified in the initial state and the control variables. Uh, so we're going to represent the state PDF with a finite number of statistical moments, and we're going to comp compute those desired order states, uh, state moments, due to uncertainty and initial condition as well as control inputs. So the way we formulate our random variables are we start off with a normalized random variable, uh, either the Gaussian or uniform. We're going to be using Gaussian. So it's just simply a zero mean, unit variance, Gaussian random vector. We then scale that using any, uh, any covariance that we like and add the mean on so that we can, uh, we can compute our input x based on any, we can, we can compute any x of a, x based on the normalized variable zeta. So to begin, we start with the Taylor series expansion. We have the nominal solution and the first order sensitivity, which is analogous in many ways to a state transition matrix. It's simply the uh, Jacobian of the output with respect to the input, uh, and multiply it by these deviation vectors, delta r, uh, delta v, and delta u. We can then expand out into the higher order terms, and these are the terms that we're looking to find to compute our approximation. However, taking all of these higher order partial derivatives can be extremely cumbersome, and in some cases, when you don't have an analytical model for your system, not even possible. Uh, so what we're, what we're doing is we're grouping these, uh, grouping these partial derivative terms into constant coefficient matrices and multiplying them by the deviation vectors delta x, uh, delta x1, delta x2, where the superscript denotes the maximum order of uh, that polynomial. Uh, so then we can rearrange all of these coefficient matrices into one overall coefficient matrix as well as uh, arbitrary polynomial basis functions, which are linear combinations of all of these delta x vectors. Uh, once we have our Taylor series representation, we can create a cost function, which we simply use a least, least squared uh, cost function, so it's just the error squared, integrated over the domain of the probability dens density function. Uh, we can then group, we can then group these uh, inner products into co into matrices A and B, stated here. To compute these inner products, uh, the inner products in the B matrix are relatively simple. They're just polynomials. We know how to integrate them. And specifically, if we use orthogonal polynomials, uh, we're able to make it such that only the diagonal elements are non-zero. Everything else will be zero. Then uh, we, the elements in the A matrix are really the main challenge that we're, that we're presented with. We need to figure out a way to numerically compute these inner products. Uh, so once we have these two expressions, and because this is a, a diagonal matrix, or this uh, B matrix will be a diagonal, we're able to simply take the inverse of it and compute all of your coefficients with this expression. So numerical integration, this is kind of the backbone of the method. Uh, the way that a lot of people do this is using Monte Carlo sampling, which is just basically we take lots and lots of random samples, propagate them forward, try to compute the integral, and uh, have a lot of issues because the convergence can be extremely slow, especially when you have complicated nonlinear systems. So we are looking to use a uh, deterministic technique uh, the technique that we're going to be going with is the conjugate unaccepted transformation. Uh, the reason for this is that it is able to compute the higher order expectation integrals in multi-dimensional space much more effectively than any of these other methods. Uh, for example, this orange bar is the uh, Gauss-Hermite quadratricity, 
And you can see that as the state dimension increases, the number of points that you need to evaluate increases exponentially, as opposed to this conjugate incentive method, which increases in a much uh, slower fashion. Uh, so this method is a non-product quadrature scheme. And the way that the points are constructed is such that they're on specially defined axes, axes that are symmetric, uh, so that they automatically can satisfy the higher order moment constraints of the Gaussian function, of the Gaussian input function. Uh, so now that we have the framework of how we're going to be computing our approximations, uh, we can get into some of the simulations. For all the simulations, we assume impulsive maneuvers where the uh, velocity is simply the initial velocity plus some uh, matrix T that is a function of the state and this matrix or the vector G, uh, which is a function of the control. So the first case was a two burn maneuver taken from a paper by JT Betts. Uh, it was uh, it's supposed to be an optimal two-burn maneuver transfer to go from uh, an Earth equatorial uh, zero inclination up to a, I believe it was some synchronous orbit. Um, so the nominal trajectory parameters are given here, and the nominal maneuver parameters are given here. We prescribe uncertainty to uh, just the maneuvers. We're assuming that the initial state is now exactly. So we're giving uncertainty to both, uh, both of the angles in the maneuver and the magnitude of the delta V for both the first and the second maneuver. And we're looking at how this reachability set propagates through time. Uh, so this is at the final time. Uh, we computed 5,000 Monte Carlo samples, fully propagated them through the model, and then we also used our polynomial approximation to compute these same points. We took the error between the two methods and normalized it. So all of these values are given uh, are the percent error. So you can see that for our first order approximation, it's not that bad, 1.6% 1, 1. off. Uh, but as you increase and add higher order sensitivities onto your approximation, the error goes down pretty drastically. <coughs> This is a different representation of the same data. Uh, so plotted here, plotted on the x-axis of these are the Mahalanobis distance of the, uh, I believe that's the first maneuver, and then in the y-axis is the Mahalanobis distance of the second maneuver. So what that means is the farther away that a point is from the origin, the uh, farther away from the mean it is in the distribution that you're sampling from. So as you can see, generally, as you move farther away from the mean, the approximation starts to break down. But this uh, this trend is alleviated by adding higher orders. Um, you're able to cover much more of the whole input domain and have the approximation be valid over that entire domain. Uh, we also ran a second test case, which was a uh, lunar, lunar orbit insertion. Uh, for this one, we didn't assume uh, that the maneuver was uncertain. We assumed that the initial state was uncertain, so the initial position and velocity had some uncertainty, and there was a nominal maneuver performed to it, and we're just looking at how the uh, uncertainty propagated through. So we had a low uncertainty case and a high uncertainty case, and as you can see, for the low uncertainty, there is <coughs> Very, very low error once you got the fourth order approximation. Okay. As opposed to the uh, higher uncertainty, uh, the higher uncertainty test case where there was a pretty significant error uh, in total. Pretty significant error in the first order approximation, but regardless of how much error there was in either test case, uh, you always improve the error by adding higher order. So in conclusion, uh, we found a computationally efficient method for calculating higher order statistical moments of uh, reachability sets. Uh, these higher order terms can increase accuracy, increase the domain over which your approximation is valid, and it actually smooths out the error distribution throughout the whole domain. The 
The method can also be used to approximate any uh, nonlinear stochastic function. So like I said before, this doesn't just apply to the two-body problem. This is simply just a simple test case that we were looking at uh, to uh, kind of test out the method. But we, we're actually looking in the future into adding uh, atmosphere drag perturbations, perhaps K2, some other uh, kind of complicating perturbations to see how this method holds up. Are there any questions?
So like having maybe 10 kilometers off is really not all that bad when you consider it. Okay. So that one zero so they can put that data every day? So it's uh you know, I am talking about the the the
Um, you know, throughout my career, I've had uh, less of aggressions, but there's been one constant. I absolutely love celestial mechanics. It's just, it's just part of the fiber of who I am, and I come back to it again and again. And uh, I don't have to have a grant. To, uh, I wake up in the middle of the night working on it, whether I'm getting paid or not. It's just what I love. And so this is a problem that I've thought about over a number of years. And, uh, Finally, I, I needed a good student, however, because uh, you know the uh, various uh, uh, faculties and capacities, uh, whether you like it or not, dissipate with age. So I needed somebody to help me carry through all the math and do the computations. And I was just a PhD student in the College of Mathematics, and Kumar is on the area as a research uh, assistant professor who's a doctor of family tenure practices. Professor Auburn, uh, and he's been with me for the last uh, year and a half, and, uh, and myself. But this idea has been around for a while. There's been several papers written on it, and I'll tell you what it's about in a moment. So I'm going to do this idea, talk about a couple of previous studies, and then build the uh, framework that uh, quickly for how it was the first problem. And then we're going to look at uh, very, very low altitude local orbits. And I want orbits that are frozen in the sense that they are fixed in the moon. It's a reference point, which is rotating at 2,029 days. So I'm going to look at orbits that are at least some of the elements that the elements are frozen in the reference point of the moon. And then, uh, first of all, we say, is that possible? Uh, that's, uh, that's one uh, well, question. And if it's possible, what's it good for? Uh, and then it turns out I will show that they are indeed possible, uh, theoretically possible, frozen lunar orbits, but they're only considering a few of the dominant perturbations. Uh, when you consider the full model and the fact that the lunar moon is kind of wobbling around a little bit, migrating uh, on the axes, and a lot, of the, a lot of the perturbations beyond those that uh, use an ideal uh, uh, problem, uh, it is it really frozen? And if not, are they stabilizable? Here's a God's eye view of the North Pole of the Moon, and here's a Satan's eye view of the South Pole. Uh, <laughs> uh, in 1994, uh, ice was discovered and deep craters that the sun never shines on, and it's been subsequently mapped to some degree of fidelity by some missions. And uh, if we're going to do anything on the Moon, then Number one, we can't carry the water with us uh, to do anything for all practical purposes. So we need this water desperately. So we need to map it thoroughly and also all the topography in this region. We need to own it uh, uh, so we can plan emissions with very high fidelity maps. And so that we, if there are frozen <coughs> orbits in the uh, lunar core system that, uh, that uh, cross uh, this uh, south pole, uh, Frequently, those are going to be pretty viable orbits. I think. These papers, uh, uh, the, the uh, international paper written by Giacalia and uh, Boom Days in 1970, uh, and two subsequent studies uh, on Olympia, uh, on Olympia, and Nurkel, were two relatively recent papers uh, that uh, motivated the uh, formulation of this study. They both took a uh, home point mechanics. Uh, uh, perturbation theory, the um, perturbation theory approach. I'm taking a little different approach here than my developments. Uh, so, we're going to, so there is a, some methodology established. I'm going to have a little more layer to it. Uh, but uh, it, it really is with just a few dominant perturbations. The moon is really a lumpy thing. Its, uh, it's gravity field is much, much slower if you use the Standard uh, certain harmonic series, it converges much slower. You make for the dominant two body term is quickly washed out with lots of other perturbations uh, and it doesn't have a clean K2 dominates everything character uh, on the Earth's uh, 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 gravity field. So, in order to move toward realistic missions, uh, we went to ask the approximate inside and say, in, in the presence of the highest fidelity models we got, what should look like? Today. Here's a brief short course. Uh, as you know, the Earth is very oblique. <coughs> I went into 
exaggerate the blatantness. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, when I went to graduate school, uh, I, one of my community members was a guy named uh, William uh, Cullum, uh, the author of a nice little book that you haven't read, that you should find it called Satellite Geodesy, which is essentially a very short view <coughs> of, uh, of, of an accessible document for learning about the group that Dr. Uh, Moore was about it. I, first lecture in his class, but he was on my committee, and he was head of a department called Planetary and Space Science at UCLA. And, uh, and so the, the first time I committed that, we committed that at UCLA, uh, you know, very early in your program, we, we met with this committee of advisors. He said, why don't you take this course, okay? And he said, it's the third course in sequence, but you've got differential equations, don't know how to take this course. Well, how do the PhD students in Planetary and Space Science and I live there. And on day one, uh, I said, gentlemen, there were no ladies in this class. You're all graduate students. Assume the Earth is 100% water. It's incompressible. It's visit. All the water is subject to its own gravitational field. And the angular momentum of this puddle of water is uh, given, if the Earth was rigid, it would be given by it spin rate of uh, 2 power 29 days about the z-axis. Taking that angular momentum is constant. Let's assume that this water has uh, somehow come to be an equilibrium state. Your job is to prove that the equilibrium state is a flip sort of revolution on the z-axis uh, and that the flat in that lift soil is 1.300. That's due in three weeks. Discuss this problem further. Let's get up the course. So, so my God, I'm going to get the wrong term somewhere. Uh, and, and so I went to work on this problem. And, and uh, I digression. I used one of the formulae from my blue mechanics. One of you, from the book of the Keys and Bill Sauvage. But I sat down and said, Well, hey, you told me to prove it's more so it's flat and more part of 300. Then if you get to one part of 300, let's assume it's an ellipsoid. I can calculate the gravity field of an ellipsoid of H2O. Uh, what if I put some infinitesimal particle somewhere at an arbitrary point on that ellipsoid and let's take that cross section and it's just an ellipse? Right? So that particle must be in equilibrium. Otherwise, it'll slide south if there's a component of the, uh, the resulting force on it, it'll slide south. Uh, if the uh, if the if the if the ellipsoid is too circular <coughs> and it's too oblate, it'll slide north. So what's the eccentricity of the ellipsoid can be? And on one page, I proved that it had to be an ellipsoid flat in one part of 300 just by correcting the collision motion and working with the weather system from omega squared corridor looks under the picture and, and one whole three body diagram, I had the answer. And I said, wow, this is nice. So I handed it in, I got two grades. He gave me an A for ingenuity. He gave me a C uh, for not solving the problem properly how he wanted to solve. And I said, I solved the problem to solve. And he said, you know, I have to do all these DVDs and three lines. So anyway, I, ultimately I made a beat in the class. And fast forward, uh, Nine years ago, I won the UCLA Alumni Award, and uh, Deere, UJ Deere was the dean. And when he introduced me, he dug up my transcript. He said, John, you made all A's. He said, you made a B in satellite geodesy. What's that all about? Anyway, so he did an introduction. So I went up uh, to do my remarks. Uh, this is Dean Deere. Uh, that B in satellite geodesy. I have two words. The reason I got that be William Cullen. It's <laughs> the two words. And I said, we've got to tell you, I learned more in that course that most all the other courses got to. So I, I'm all of that be. I love it. I earned it. So here's our variable blade earth that is flattened a little bit more than uh, uh, necessary because uh, I find the teaching that, uh, you know, exaggerating the truth is sometimes the way to get an understanding. 
the burial blade earth into these two symmetric mass elements if I've got an edge view of, of an orbit and it's coming out of the board or it's ascending node here, the angular moment is as shown on the plane. Look at the, uh, at this position, it doesn't take a rocket scientist, and we are a rocket scientist, to see that this uh, distance, the one over r squared attraction of this mass element is going to be a lot weaker than that one. And at mentally integrating, I can see that obliquus is going to deflect the gravity toward the south in the northern hemisphere, and so deflect it toward the north in the southern hemisphere. And even for part of this, <coughs> torque equals time rate change of angular momentum. Uh, you should be able to see that R cross out is uh, the, the, the the normal component uh, of uh, of the force is uh, is what would generate the, uh, generate the torque. And so for the problem as shown, the torque is out of the board, and the angle momentum is going to march and kind of playing along with it. And so the ascending node is going to go. So I've got it here. It's going to go. Uh, R cross out into the board, I'm sorry, the, the inverse problem is into the board, and therefore it's going to march into the board, and the passing node is going to march to the west, or the angle of the northern hemisphere, and if the angle of the southern hemisphere, the march <coughs> east. Well, we use that all the time, and that's the dominant perturbation in the two body problem. And is it useful or distribution? <laughs> well, we all know it's useful because the most common use of that is to uh, have a slightly uh, <coughs> past polar orbit like Landsat 1, which has the angle of slightly in the southern hemisphere, and that's sufficient to give me about one degree of a day precession toward the east, which would, uh, uh, since the 365 days and one degree a day uh, approximately is. Uh, is sufficient to keep the relative orientation of the satellite orbit normal to the sun constant, and therefore I could use the solar panels for illumination all the time to uh, to, uh, to operate spacecraft. But on the other hand, it took no propulsion. I used Mother Nature uh, to do the perception for me, and uh, forever you don't worry about running out of fuel for doing that. Here's the orbit geometry that you most likely are familiar with for the two-body problem. I'm very quickly going to review variation of parameters as I need. The analytical solution of the two-body problem for zero perturbation, uh, I think functionally integrated that position is a function of six constants, and one of them is not constant in this choice at all. Let's say you have a mean anomaly here. Uh, and velocity would simply be the time derivative of that for the two-body problem, when the elements, uh, five of them are constant, uh, would be denoted by G. But in the case of presence of perturbations, uh, these are variables, uh, and hopefully still variables, and maybe it is small. Uh, Lagrange had the insight that to say, if I can solve a simple problem analytically, and it's just got the requisite number of coordinates up here, six of them, four of which are constant for the new body problem, in the presence of perturbations, we can anticipate that the orbit will evolve as in a procession. And these, there will be an osculating set of elements that kiss the actual curved position and velocity. And those instantaneous elements, if I use this solution of the two body problem, for the case that these are variables in the full differential equations, then going to hold, you can derive the differential equations to the time variation of the orbit elements in the presence of perturbation. And in the case of mean anomaly, it's got a constant. Uh, uh, square root of mu raised to three halves, uh, uh, mu <coughs> as the only constant, and all the other elements have a zero two body term. The perturbative derivative, as Sam Harris, my advisor, called it, uh, involves a forcing term, and it's a generalized force in orbit element space, has a six by three matrix operator, which comes out of this analysis, uh, which the elements of which are known as Poisson's brackets. But it's something to code the energy with respect to the elements and um, see disturbed acceleration. And these differential equations for specific perturbations can be analyzed. But because they're slow varying, they're very popular targets for things like the method of averaging, our multiple time scales, and other perturbation methods because they're slowly varying coordinates. A short course on a little different take on how to look at uh, uh, the angular orientation piece of the variation parameters problem. The OVLH uh, frame, which we saw earlier already today, 
is defined in terms of the angular, uh, the, well, one of them is a radial unit vector, and the other one is the uh, cross product of the velocity angle momentum, and the tangential is the cross product of the normal dot the R. Uh, we can think of this frame as embedded in a rigid body just for mental sake. It's, it's fluid just like the frame in a rigid body. Therefore, all infinity of coordinates, uh, including quaternions and four angles and so on, I can use to specify the uh, direction cosine matrix that projects these, think of the body axes onto the inertial frame. And if you use the 313 set, which uh, actually preceded Euler a couple of centuries, astronomers were using them before Euler was around, but the, the, the most common set of Euler angles, and these are the ones that we use in order mechanics most commonly. This relationship between the orthogonal components of angular velocity projected onto the moving frame uh, and the time rate change of the angles is fundamental in, in any rigid body dynamics class, including this one, which is a particle dynamics problem. Uh, but notice I have the third, the second component zero, as was the case in the previous uh, uh, <coughs> LDLH. And if you have a flow by the deep wave, why that component has to be zero. Uh, uh, these oscillation constraints imply it directly because uh, I, R and IP are perpendicular to H. That means the velocity has to be even totally contained in the, in the uh, horizon plane, the radial and transverse plane. There is no Z component. But on the other hand, by differentiating the velocity factor and say it is the derivative in the LVH frame plus the omega of that frame across N uh, to the, this should be. Uh, this should be the R dot vector here. Sorry, I got R I R here. I don't know how to read these slides. I see an error. So it should be, so well, that's the velocity vector. I'm sorry. If the velocity vector is correct, but when I apply it to the acceleration vector, I would have a derivative of velocity in the LDL of this frame, which is this term, plus a beta cross R dot. And if I carry all that out, lo and behold, I would pick up an R omega transverse. And you say, I cannot comply with the oscillation strength unless this is zero. So you can get at it logically as well as geometrically. But so you only have two non zero velocity components. Well, why am I doing this? Well, if you do the companion equation to the particle dynamics uh, uh, consistent with this, and why R is a radial uh, unit, uh, unit uh, R times a radial unit vector, and write R dot as, as the components that we've given, but I'll name them U and B, the uh, radial transfer velocity components. Go take another derivative of this with a mega cross R. I, I will get the acceleration kinematics with U B as the velocity coordinates uh, and omegas uh, as the uh, angular velocity coordinates. And I have a mega transverse uh, equal to zero to the oscillation strength. And if I now write the equations of motion and the radial uh, components, then I guess we have this three plate and three so a, a presentation. Uh, we have AD as a disturbance, but our right AD also is the radial transverse and normal components. And now I can substitute the acceleration of the kinematics and equate terms as usual. Notice what happens. I get two differential equations. Now the first two components, these are the uh, radial and transverse dynamics. The uh, normal dynamics give me an algebraic equation. And this is the most elegant expression. I wrote this the first time in the the 1980s didn't catch on, so I keep writing it, maybe will eventually. This is the right way to look at gyroscopic precession, which is the orbital precession. It is simply obtained out of the way of the explosion of motion, and it's the normal component of the perturbing force divided by the, by the uh, tangential velocity component. And that can be derived without uh, solving a different equation, it's just that's what it is. Uh, and that's the fanciest way or the most uh, physically appealing way to derive three of the various and primitive equations of the two body problem. It's just go through the benefits of that frame. You don't have to go through the runs of progress or what's on the line. You don't have to do those. Uh, but you get it directly out of uh, the original body dynamics uh, perspective. The dominant uh, mother nature force acting on the uh, special near Earth satellites is the gravity field of the uh, potato, uh, known as the Earth. Uh, an arbitrary body can be represented as gravity filled by the uh, 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 term harmonic series, uh, breaking out the zonal terms so by themselves that they dominate for the Earth, they don't for the Moon uh, uh, to the same extent. 
uh, we have the normal harmonic a piece of this, and then we have the, uh, the rest of the sort of harmonic terms, the uh, supportals and the tessels. And the gravity uh, terms for the Earth are pretty well known, uh, 10 to minus 3 for J2, and uh, 10 to minus 4 for J3 and J4, and then smaller thereafter. But the series for what converges very fast to the point mass term uh, U over R plus this J2 term, you immediately drop by three orders of magnitude, and then uh, you're in a mud level with lots of competition. Uh, you, you get down to 10 to minus 4, you take about n equal to 4 of the tessels here, but to get from 10 to minus 7 to 10 to minus 9, nine it, it takes another 100 plus terms and up to 300 if you want to follow the globe. Uh, at, uh, uh, at orbit altitudes, it takes even more than that to get this resolution on the Earth's surface. So this series converges very slowly, but the good news is uh, 1 over R to the N is your friend as you move away from the Earth if you get sort of more and more on point mass, but that's not much comfort uh, at satellite altitudes. You've got to have uh, a pretty high order field to get uh, uh, some bigger uh, precision uh, on integration. So lunar gravity is much worse and how much worse. Uh, let me go through forward and then I'll come back. Uh, the lunar gravity is on the right uh, and the Earth is on the left. This is uh, your good friend 9.86 uh, and changed uh, uh, body gravity acceleration over the longer digits. And uh, one sixth of that is the moon's gravity. Well, look at this huge gap uh, down to J2 and another huge gap to J3 and then the rest of the, the, uh, the harmonics are drawn in. Over here, I have a, a substantial gap from a much weaker gravity uh, down to J2, but immediately all of, all of this uh, fan club of other perturbations is right there on top of J2. And so the moon is a much uglier animal uh, from the point of view of trying to do perturbation theory. You can make a good argument to use J2, include J2, why don't you do all this other stuff? Well, because my graduate students don't have one lap to go. Uh, it's just a, a, a tough problem. So back to just a little bit here, uh, I, I want to uh, I look at the, uh, this is the various parameters uh, uh, with the uh, uh, standard uh, classical elements, uh, the uh, operator. And if you wanted that in, uh, in uh, regular and uh, transverse components, and you wanted to take partials with respect to uh, the orbit elements, you have to morph the uh, central function uh, into the elements. This thing reduces to something very simple, even though I've written it that way. And I just wrote this way because this is the path I'm showing you. There's other ways to obtain these equations rather really nicely. When you have just J2 perturbing, even then these equations uh, are not the, all that pleasant to look at. You come down on one page with just J2 perturbation. But on the other hand, theta, the true uh, uh, longitude, which is r given pair g plus two anomaly, is the only fast variable here that moves at our speed. We believe everything else is very slowly changing. So the standard procedure is to hold all of the elements except uh, uh, the time element, which in this case is theta, uh, and, uh, and all of the arguments on the right hand side, average over the fast variable uh, over one order period. And if you do that, these equations uh, are blasted into trivia almost. Uh, the first three, A, I, uh, A, E, and I, average to zero, which is kind of not right that side. So these are invariant. Kappa omega is a relatively simple thing involving cosine. And if I have a kappa omega dot, I want, for example, one degree to one degree a day to the east, convert that to radius to the uh, per second, go solve the cosine of i, uh, and you'll find out that it's something in the vicinity of 100 degrees, 97 to 103 or 4 degrees uh, for all the reasonable values here. By the way, if G2 is infinitesimally small, guess what? When I solve the cosine of i, I get a, a number bigger than 1, and on the average, cosine can't be computed unless uh, the uh, number of uh, is uh, less than one. So uh, you can't get an arbitrary processional rate. There's a maximum rate for the given elements of the size of the I and when you do a solve for this. So you have a solvability condition which fortunately works for the uh, sun sequence orbits, for example. And I can find from this equation, I can find something called a critical inclination. 
uh, what information will freeze energy and it turns out to be 60 something degrees and these are very important proofs that you can drive the two by the problem. So, the moon, let's talk about it. Here's the Earth uh, and here's the center of the moon and we'll let that be our x-axis. We have an inertial green frame here that we're watching all this from and we're going to use the uh, restricted three-body problem first as our marching uh, orders. Uh, and so we let the plane uh, that the moon, uh, the, 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 the moon Earth relative orbit makes uh, be rotating uniformly about the mass center, which is uh, pulled outside the Earth for graphical convenience. It's actually inside the Earth. Uh, but you're rotating about uh, an inertially fixed line uh, the, the mass center uh, at a weight in three, which is uh, the mean motion of the moon. Uh, and we can calculate that uh, in a period, but it's, uh, two, it's two pi over the orbit period, which is 29 days approximately. And so cap omega E is the inertial displacement of the Earth and the mine is moving at a constant angular rate in three. The inertial longitude of ascending node is cap omega sub n, and the relative uh, to the Earth moon line uh, longitude of ascending node is cap omega. Otherwise, the setup for doing the formulation is the same. It's just that uh, we have a explicit time variation in cap omega e that is in the picture. Take a dark eye view of looking down the North Pole of the Moon, and a little bit hard to see in uh, your mind here, but uh, the Earth is that way. I, this is the center of the Moon in there somewhere that angle the winter factor is coming out of, and somewhere right over the South Pole where the vicinity is, Terra Moon. This is Apple Moon up here, just for the sake of uh, thinking about it. Uh, and so if you construct a, a vector from the uh, center of the moon up to a point on this orbit, you'll find out just like the uh, Earth base, by the way, the moon is different. Uh, looking down to the North Pole of the Earth, it is circular. Uh, the, the, the profile that you see in a God's eye view looking down at the North Pole of the Earth is circular, the best fitting curve is circular to about nine or ten digits. It is a circle. It is a body revolution. If you vary through the mountains and the water, it is a body revolution. Not so for the moon, it's sort of uh, cigar shaped. It's elongated in the uh, along the Earth moon line. And as a consequence of that, it's gravity gradient stabilized. We looks at a specific motivation with three gravity gradient stabilized body where the x axis on the point of the earth because of that symmetry. My first university research job, I was on the Apollo Lunar Science team here. We had a born by dinosaur here. Uh, I, I had a contract uh, when I was at the University of Virginia to analyze the laser altimeter measurement on the, uh, on the Apollo command module as far as 20 seconds. By the way, the first laser altimeter was not for aerial surveys, it was for lunar surveys. And if you want to get your mind around the way the world has changed, you know, we talk about TRL levels and, uh, and, uh, and uh, we talk about, uh, uh, you know, 6.1 to 6.23 uh, uh, levels of research. Uh, uh, we didn't have that nomenclature during the Apollo program, which I've been on the 19 uh, co-op student from Auburn. Uh, by the way, a uh, true story. Uh, uh, <coughs> one of my bosses was a guy named Ernst uh, Geisler. He was one of the one brown guys who came to Moon Day that came over to the Gold Saturn Files. And I was working on the Slash Dynamics problem at that time, Helen Slash. Uh, Saturn V was about 90 plus percent lifted. Everything there, and it was a very flexible vehicle, a fire state building call. And I do want to balance this thing on a broomstick uh, like your finger uh, in windy conditions. And uh, uh, guess what? You're going to have vibration, you're going to have engine you're going to have cobra, you're going to have stuff bouncing around in a very complicated way. And my job was uh, at that time was to reduce. The uh, uh, experiments with a box tank of a booster that we were shaking, we had salt water in it because we conduct electricity. We had plastic probes in various places. We didn't have an engine 
digital cameras haven't invented yet. Uh, we did have a movie camera looking down inside of this thing while we're doing the, essentially a frequency response of this boost of the chicken, very sound views and frequencies. We measure the propellant slash dynamics, measure the pressure on the baffles that were submerged and we want to get a slap and the liquid would come through it and I was producing all the data. And I didn't do the theory, but I was trying to fit the data with the theory that was available. Errors were like 10 or 15 percent. And I was so, I don't understand. Why don't you understand? No. So if I don't understand, I will not fly to the moon. The problems I can close around on the corner of this table, the problems we've got to solve is this whole damn building. And then some, if we can't close on the physics of the fluid inside this thing, it's all fluid. How in the heck are we going to build a model that we can fly to the moon? Yeah, 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 Earth is perfectly spherical, the moon is perfectly spherical, and the moon's in a circular orbit around the Earth. Yeah, a mathematician cannot prove a theorem that tells you that when you my best integrator that I can go to the moon and back and have any significant digits left. You can't prove that's a theorem with a particle model for everything. Yeah, you wait for it. Mathematicians, permission. You're not gonna fly a particle around a spherical earth and move back because it can be proved with that. But I can prove it to you beyond the shadow of that. With the best physics we got right now, I can have E plus I can prove to you eventually by using the heat integrators, I can integrate out, I can integrate backwards in time to recover the different conditions, uh, with random collection of orbits and different feeding methods. Yeah, yeah, this works. I can mess myself. Very long and for the various cases, sometimes the energy is conserved, but when I'm conserved, I test all that, my algorithms work, I got a solution. Now, okay, the problem you ask, you own a 57 chair with a gun, you drive to and from Auburn University, 185 miles. You know, you have a lead digital simulation for your 57 chair with a how do you get to the audience back? Now you got a map, not being your head, not being a piece of paper. And at some point on the course, you've got a trajectory, it's called a highway. You've got sensors, you've got actuators. Your model that you're using, your own model, has to predict based on your knowledge of how the car responds curve of the path you're following is that you can predict a little further into the future than the time constant of the enclosure of the system. So that's called control theory. I decided on that very day I was going to own control. I said, yeah, your model has to be good enough that you can steer and get back on the local trajectory. Yeah, we're going to have a trajectory for the moon pump based on our best physics. We're going to make measurements and we're going to keep getting on that trajectory. This is simply we got it all the way here. I got it. That's fair. Heuristics. Just like the uh, oblate earth, the moon is oblate this way. It's not a blatant cross section because the blatant accounts to one day. And this orbit is attracted into the plane. each dot is kind of toward the Earth, in this case, or the North, but it's in the direction that H is going to possess. And these perturbations, I've got to solve them such that the angular rate of reorientation equals to M3, which is 2 pi over 1 over 3. The rate of perception is 
construct in my truck with the motion. Well, let's, uh, let's go find out. If you do everything I did in the two body problem, derive the curve equation of motions with the J2 and the C33, which turned out to be the dominant <coughs> one if you look at that curve, the next one below. So the dominant two perturbations. It turns out C33 averages out, but I'm not buying it. What? It's very close to uh, this. If you go to second order, it's the big down. So it averages out, but it's uncomfortably averages out. Worried about it still because I know that this point is not quite right. There's something invisible to beat on. But where we got A, E, and I is zero, their derivatives are two body problem. They ain't zero this time. Because I have terms that arise due to Coriolis and centripetal uh, moving around right here, M3 of them. Because those terms are pretty additional perturbations because I'm writing these equations in a rotating coordinate system. So I got the lunar rotation effects in there. <coughs> a dot does average to zero. But if you stare at these equations and you don't look, have to look at them too long, you say, well, hey, let's suppose that I'm at a, an inclination that's that the sign of inclination and the square and time two, I bet that's no way. Suppose I'm getting the freedom to choose argument parity. Well, I looked at it and I said, wow, sine 2 omega appears in both those equations. Why don't we use that observation to say any of these, there's a bunch of roots for uh, argument of parity which appear to null uh, I dot and E dot. So that would give me three elements that do vanish if I use a judicious <coughs> paramoon rotation. So I say, okay, so now I've chosen that, but this is true for all other elements, and respectively, and now I've fixed omega, but I've left i equal to three here. And you say, well, uh, let's stare at uh, the cap omega dot a moment. That looks right, because here I've got the uh, the average that arises due to the moon, moon rotation, and then I've got these other things that arise due to uh, a J2 and uh, the uh, centripetal acceleration term that showed up in the equations. So if if omega is fixed at one of these choices, then uh, and the elements are all slowly varying, and in this case I've got an old E, uh, this B is just a big approximately or, or, or exactly depending upon assumptions to make constant. And so I can solve this for the cosine of i is n3 over b. And that turns out to be, uh, the inclination turns out to be a near polar, just like I do it on the previous one, we put in reasonable numbers. So that gives me a solution for i, and now I go down to omega dot. Well look, there were only two angular variables available over here, i and omega, and I've already satisfied that uh, uh, the omega dot equation and both of these equations with choice of omega and this one chose the i, so I don't have any angular variables free. The only thing I've got is a and e, and I can tell you there is no solution that will cause a mega dot to vanish. I can make it smaller, but I can make it vanish. So I can't freeze a mega dot, but I can freeze the first uh, four elements in theory the values that I want. So I said, okay, that looks like I've got some possible candidates that are really good. And in order to find out, I brought the best lunar model I got to put all the forces in and all the dynamics got rid of the free body, the certain free body assumptions, and the rest of this discussion is all numerical. And taking uh, the ideal frozen orbits as a, uh, uh, as these are, uh, these are a violent set, and I put the uh, energy in the vicinity of the South Pole, uh, and said, can I, use numerical optimization with the real force field. And I'm going to use some measure of frozenness, or uh, frigidity, let's call it the frigidity index here. I'm not getting big trouble with this, but anyway, uh, this, uh, this, <laughs> this index I want to make small uh, by uh, choosing the orbit elements and requiring them to be in some bound, uh, regenerous bounds 
for the solution. I want to hold parity constant, parabon constant, but I want to make it very small. And I found six, or, or Sandeep found for me six cases. By the way, we had to restart the optimization algorithm with a, with a random number generator because we found out there were half a dozen uh, hard to predict local extrema for those of the buckets in the gravity field. And so I found the best of those local extrema and out of these, these six cases that we moved around uh, and Cap Omega and, uh, and argument of parity to various uh, feasible points. <coughs> and because of the direction of people went in the main of various eccentricities, so the orbit was the biggest thing that changed. So the first thing we did was said, are they really frozen under the ideal assumptions that you derive them? So that they, if they aren't frozen under those terms, I made an error. So this is a sanity check. And they won't be frozen exactly because these are frozen on the average of the normal period. But within graphical precision, even with those uh, slight variations, the first four elements were deep frozen uh, for all six cases. And uh, uh, argument of perigee was had approximately linear drift for each case, and, uh, and so did the mean anomaly. Uh, and again, because the same major axis were changing, uh, the mean anomalies have got different approximate linear slopes. So all that looked good, and we said, okay, let's let's go to the show and find out if these guys can come up with the minor leaps and majors and solve a real problem. Well, the first order of business, and this is case one, is to find out how many terms I got to carry this gravity field because I didn't have a formula to tell me how many. Maybe so I start trying to see how it converges. The boy's pretty ugly. Uh, here is a study with the uh, gravity uh, field uh, going from 40, 80, 120, uh, 160 uh, degree in order expansions. And that's a whole bunch of terms. And para, para moon over the South Pole settled down pretty good. By the way, crashing on the moon is somewhere down here. It's below this, uh, this number. This, this variation is from 1758 to 1754. 1758 corresponding to a 20 kilometer altitude, so it fell off by about uh, uh, six kilometers here uh, in this worst case oscillation. And again, this isn't quite converged yet, but the variation is not too bad at the critical point in orbit, which is the point which is most nearly impacting the moon. However, Apple Moon was bouncing around uh, uh, over a much larger range. At 160, it's not quite converged. If I go to 200, it does. Yeah, I have a very slight perturbation of this curve. But this is just to get an idea of, for the sake of a simulation study, if I'm worried mainly about para moon, 40 looks like it's good enough for this orbit, but it's not good enough if I'm worried about the entire position of the orbit. So with that, I found the minimum degree for the first three cases, to uh, first four cases was about 40, to believe the para moon uh, to within a, a kilometer or two. Uh, uh, results over a month, and it took uh, 160 uh, for the uh, two cases, which turned out, it's kind of surprising, the more circular cases were the least stable. Does anybody have an idea why that might be true? Why would the circular cases be the least stable? came to the conclusion, our empirical is unstable because it's more undefined, right? because everything's close. But they're really unstable. They crash into the moon, unstable. But let's, uh, let's look at that. Sorry. Uh, no, yeah, let's look at this detail. These are the cases one, two, three. And over here is case four, crashing at below 12 kilometers, which is the highest winter mountain. It crashed in 14 days. It didn't make 30 without a correction. Uh, case five uh, crashed in uh, a similar number of days. So uh, again, uh, this isn't quite converged, but it's good enough to conclude we're in trouble. Uh, and and case six kissed the kissed the lunar surface around uh, five days plus or minus. These are the most circular cases. Why on earth is that true? Gravity. The loppiness of the gravity wheel, I'm in it all the time. On an eccentric orbit, I whiz through it. 
every perigee, and the gravity is, is much, much more than I out over most of the orbit. So I'm not when I've got a, a orbit that's stable under the dominant perturbations, it doesn't have enough. The, 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 the ugly things that are destabilizing don't have as much opportunity to do damage to me if I only fly through a protocol. That's my hypothesis. So we found out the third body effect, when we put in the third body effects, our sun it didn't change things much. And here we just said uh, for all of those orbits, we went until they crashed. And so uh, the first three, uh, and this is without correction, uh, Give me a month and change, uh, and four, five, and six. Uh, these give me uh, two weeks, uh, and the sixth one uh, uh, give me less than a week. And this is the beginning uh, altitude of uh, pair moon uh, and an apple moon. So it's very eccentric orbit. The first one. Uh, by the way, if I make it more eccentric, I'm very close to the point. If I go more eccentric, that it goes the other way because the Earth starts taking the, the, the dominant role, and it will it will take uh, it will cause the moon to go into the moon. So if I go out past 4,000, uh, somewhere between here and 4,000, the, the Earth takes over. And especially during the part of the month where I'm swinging around 90 degrees away from the Earth to record the Earth, the bank fault that where I've got the orbit located. But once it gets argument of pair moon starts marching, once there's a moment arm out there, the major axis will start headed for the Earth. Arizona will go into the moon. So these, uh, these, there's a sweet spot on, on eccentricity, and this is about the uh, our limits, uh, or the, the center of the sweet spot. So here's case three, and I've got, uh, it, it, this is perigee, and the red line down here is, uh, is actually is 12, is 12 kilometers. We don't quite get it. But these oscillations uh, are, because it's a relatively eccentric orbit, these are 12 orbits a day going through maximum and minimum radius R minus R min. That uh, is what we have. The red line here is actually the nominal pair moon, so it's not crashing. So it's oscillating between perigee and apogee. Uh, this is with station keeping and this is without. So this orbit is barely, uh, uh, you know, wiggles a little bit. So you can tell much difference here. But here is the open loop, uncontrolled uh, case. Six, the most unstable, which crashed in five days, uh, and uh, we'll general the definition of crash, uh, and uh, with station keeping, and this is every other orbit at, at apogee, we're putting the velocity impulse and try to stabilize it. Well, even then, we crash. And in fact, you've got to do it every orbit in order to stabilize this, and it costs a lot of delta B. So here's uh, with all forces uh, and vibrations and all that good stuff. And uh, here is the delta V cost of uh, stabilizing uh, every other orbit, every sixth orbit, every tenth orbit, every fourteenth orbit, every eighteenth orbit. And what it says is you can do it any way you want to. And it's about <coughs> two kilometers per second and change. The minimum is a week minimum is around ten days, but it really doesn't make much difference. Whatever works in your mission scenario, uh, do it. It'll work. Case two is almost as good, but about twice as much delta V required. There's a marginal uh, incentive to, to go as late as possible, but, but I wouldn't uh, put my mortgage on that. This is a, a, a very flat uh, delta V cost. On the other hand, the orbit three is a little more problematic and a little stronger incentive to go uh, mid month with your correction. Uh, and four and five, uh, the best you can do is. Uh, three or four times uh, these costs are, are more. These are these can be stabilized three and four, uh, and they're, uh, they're a lot more dangerous. <coughs> Excursions are a lot wilder on this, but within bounds, uh, if you if, if you uh, do uh, once or twice a month, you can stabilize those orbits, but a little more delta V. So basically, these first two and maybe the third one are good uh, possible orbits for a mission. And if you look at uh, the effect of launch date, it turns out that that matters because that repositions the moon and the Earth. And the sun. Uh, then there's a weak uh, incentive on the, uh, on the first case to go to the, uh, the second or third week of this month. Uh, and uh, up 
here is also listed as a small uh, perigee drought or perigee drought. So this stays closest approach stays within a couple degrees uh, where you put it initially, about four degrees uh, on uh, phases two and three, double D costs going up. So our first orbit, we, we numbered it number one because it's the best orbit <coughs> of the ones that we found. And again, four and five, uh, you have some large drifts. There's an anomaly here. This drift, I don't believe, uh, this is, has to be one of the local extrema. I don't know what's going on with that, or, or uh, if I uh, call it about it uh, last night again, I to you know, to check what's going on with that, because uh, I need that number to my private. But anyway, you get some large drifts uh, with these more circular orbits. It means less on, a, on Omega, but these delta V numbers mean a lot as a, as a, a lot more, as order of magnitude, bigger cost uh, to uh, stabilize these orbits. This is a very crude video. Uh, Sandeep uh, made his first uh, run of, uh, of uh, STK. Uh, and I can't get it to run, so it doesn't matter. I'm going to go over here and get it run, maybe. Uh, yeah. So what this is is uh, case one, and uh, it's a plot viewed from, uh, if you take the line from the sun and uh, uh, and uh, somewhere outside the Earth's sphere of influence and slide the set yourself off the planet to the side, uh, you'll see this view of the moon rotating, and this is going to be one month of orbit. This ground track, if you look here, there's a little white dot, and that gives you a, an idea of the repeat of the ground track, and you'll also see this pretty funny orbit, if you're a big surprise. As you go forward, uh, this rather granular plot, uh, this widening of the curve of where apogee is, uh, is, uh, is, is, is real in the sense that uh, there is growth over the month, but it's primarily uh, in plane and primarily in the uh, apogee group uh, that it shows up with the displacement. And so this orbit in terms of the fair moon crossing is, uh, is, uh, is, is pretty stable. And, uh, and watching this video is like watching grass grow, as I mentioned, it takes a while for a month worth of orbits so, uh, at uh, two hours of the top. Uh, but um, anyway, uh, uh, as, as the uh, <coughs> uh, original ascending node uh, comes around here in a minute, uh, you'll see that uh, if you took a photograph early, uh, it says that, you know, that we'll end up granular accuracy of this picture, that all the black brass bottom is still there. So it's, and it's broadening up here, it's, you know, it's primarily due to the pair of moon uh, rotation and a slight uh, bit of deformation and, and reduction of <coughs> the radius, in this case, uh, this uh, gravitational uh, wiggles of the moon and its gravity field doing some work on it. So with that, I'm going to conclude. Uh, so uh, we've studied the uh, very low altitude, uh, really aircraft altitude, 20 kilometers is uh, not too high. We select 20 kilometers because the highest lunar mountain is 12. And we want a little margin given all the temples in this gravity field. We don't want to fly at 11 mountain line uh, because if we're in the wrong part of the moon and we've got a little error in our analysis, we'll probably get what we deserve. Uh, and if you've got a, 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 an expensive spacecraft, then you don't want to do that on purpose. Uh, on my watch. Uh, and numerical optimization with a high fidelity model says, hey, there is, we found a substantial subspace, we don't find this to be full. It's an expensive search. Any way you do it, and we've done a search in the vicinity of the theoretical frozen conditions. Uh, but this is still, a, uh, in that sense, uh, an open question. Are there other attractive places? We explored some of that. There are a lot of solutions that we didn't explore those equations. Uh, that theoretically grows. Uh, the monthly station keeping cost is substantially less than 10 meters per second, which is very cheap. You can do that with a collective propulsion that burns it out the moon uh, and, uh, and stabilizes its orbits. Uh, effort matters a little bit, uh, and especially, especially with respect to minimizing the omega drift, and I think that has to do somehow with the Earth destabilizing the Earth. Uh, somehow there's probably some configuration there that uh, in the gravity field, if you get an early push into one of the gravitational canyons that are hurting you, uh, then uh, it, it, it probably 
obligates in some ugly way. And the monthly station, uh, station costs, again, are very cheap, but these these orbits, uh, depending upon uh, uh, how your uh, uh, how excited you are about uh, structural mechanics, at least in my reference frame, these orbits are very interesting. But they exist, and that they exist with all of the complexity uh, and force model for this. And if we're stable enough to uh, have some practicality, uh, <coughs> and I believe that some cousin of these will be born someday. By the way, both of you students who were present yesterday, uh, we have a lot of things that all be our goal in life. So if you write equations and do simulations for a living, how do you get my age to some of them all And you made it matter a lot earlier than that. Seven years ago, I was mad to do that two times a little time here. And I can tell you, it's almost as exciting when they matter as when you discover the first place. It's not such a little stuff. Because we're engineers, we're supposed to solve problems, and we're supposed to affect not just the state of the number of trees that we kill by papers, uh, or the number of papers that appear in journals. You should measure your manhood of your womanhood about what you really have done. Finding problems that are so important, and, uh, and doing enough work beyond the idealized, or let me assume the circle cow from the genius distribution bill. You get, 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 get beyond that. Test your models, your idealizations with the best model you get. How much test the deal with our there? And again, target a problem that you know is important. Because you know, it's a race to look at the universe. So with that, I'll close and thank you very much. <laughs> We're already 10 minutes over, so let's save questions for lunch. All right, I'll try to move that. Okay. Uh, so I think we have to stop for a brief picture before lunch. Uh, so, is that? No, I don't think so. So we're going to head to the shrine, take a quick picture, and then head to Cafe Laura to worship. <laughs> Maybe let us switch going up. Was that? I can say. Because Cafe uh, Laura is okay. I mean, it's actually a bang. Yeah, because it's, uh, we are close to that. Yeah, why don't we do lunch first? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. As long as it doesn't start raining while we're at lunch. Okay. Let's try that first. Let's try that first. Let's try that first.
about a year later, uh, and a, a couple of deep space maneuvers in there, and then approach uh, a series of uh, five different approach maneuvers uh, to come alongside the asteroid. A few quick flybys. <clears throat> anyway, there are asteroid operations going on now, leading up to a mid-2020 sample collection. They return in March, to leave the asteroid March 2021, get back to Earth, September, uh, seven years after launch, bring the sample back to Utah for retrieval. <coughs> so this is basically the best uh, from Arecibo radar, this uh, little animation up here, uh, Bennu, that, so they didn't know the shape of it and the orbit relatively well before um, we got there with the spacecraft. Uh, this just gives a quick overview of the uh, sort of the relative orbits of uh, the asteroid comes in side Earth's orbit, but not as close as Venus, and it doesn't quite go out as far as Mars. Um, so anyway, so this is a potentially hazardous asteroid that's being studied in detail. So here is a full rotation uh, from one of the cameras on the image mosaics, and this gives about one half meter for visual <coughs> resolution at 50 degree phase angle. Um, it's very uh, lumpy and uh, and of course you can see the measure of lightness uh, in, in the center part there it has large boulders. There's no real uh, smooth plains area to land good samples. Relative sizes of spacecraft encountered small bodies. Uh, that is shown here to scale compared to uh, the largest encounter, the Tisha, um, Matilda from back on the New York Asteroid Rendezvous mission, uh, Ida and uh, Dactyl was with that from Galileo. Anyway, Eros also from the Deer mission. Uh, anyway, so you can see it's one of the smallest uh, encountered objects. And so there were, you know, those are objects that were previously orbited. Uh, okay, so this is one of the smallest solar system bodies ever visited. Um, you, this gives you an idea here of the scale of. Uh, Comet 6017 Turima, Yurasimeko, and uh, Ryugu in here, which is being orbited by Hagadusa 2, and then uh, Bennu here, uh, basically 20% taller than the Empire State Building, and the U.S. scale, and Itakawa from Hagadusa. And you can see here <coughs> the uh, mean diameter of 492 uh, meters with pre encounter and uh, we only had to change that by two meters uh, with the detailed um, close-up proximity operations and the current uncertainty on that's very small. The uh, GM uh, mu was 5.2 plus or minus 1.7, one-third variation potential. Um, well, actually, so with, with three sigma, and now with uh, 4.892 with a much lower uh, uncertainty. And I say now, it hasn't changed. Our knowledge has changed, obviously. So the uh, flight dynamics team, which I'm part of, is the athletics team is kind of the, the main lead there as far as the technical work, uh, is management and uh, backup uh, independent checks are done by uh, Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, and uh, Lucky Martin has a uh, creative design and optimization uh, an element there that actually originated the mission concept. And JPL also has an independent navigation shape model and trajectory for the asteroid that they put out. Uh, mission timeline, um, basically, I've already talked about this, so I'll just move on, but there, it, it basically goes into different uh, phases within the proximity operations at the asteroid. And recon is something that's coming up um, uh, orbit A is a frozen orbit, which I'll get to later. And there's, this is actually in a state of flux. This orbit B is followed by something called orbit C, which is another frozen orbit that we'll be moving into, like orbit A. And so, so for the uh, navigation uh, campaign objectives, we uh, wanted to conduct the initial observations of Bennu as we approach the asteroid. Uh, there were four close flybys done at seven kilometer radius uh, to help determine the mass of Bennu. Uh, we captured into 1.6 by two kilometer, a little bit off that, but that was the, the target. 
uh, frozen orbit, and when I say a little bit off, is as we learned about the GM of them, and we had to adjust the size and parameters of that frozen orbit. Um, so there was a, we had in that orbit for, uh, from December 31st last year to February 28th of this year, and didn't have to do a single maneuver. And I'll show you more about that later. Uh, and there was a transition from star-based uh, navigation where you're looking at stars referenced close to the asteroid, the center finding of the asteroid, moving to uh, Bennu surface landmark-based optical, optical navigation, which is far more accurate. And how we navigate to Bennu, um, this is pretty basic. I've got a lot of material, so I'm just kind of whiz through this. Basically, you've got three different primary complexes for antennas and ground stations on Earth. Goldstone, California, Canberra, Australia, Madrid, Spain, and they send the commands up, get the data down. <coughs> and then basically, you can see uh, the solar system, Barry Center, Earth, spacecraft, and then the asteroid are the, the central points of uh, range, Doppler, and Delta differential one way range. We have widely separated uh, antennas uh, on the Earth, those different stations, like locations I mentioned before. They give you an equator, and between that, they give you extremely accurate, uh, independent means of getting lowering the uncertainty on the orbit. And also, then there's the optical, uh, the spacecraft relative imaging. And you can see here, I'm showing the stars around uh, Bennu, and, and then we move to the landmark base. So, approach maneuver. Uh, execution performance, a lot of numbers here, I'm not going to really go over it, but you just basically see that the uh, sigmas are very low, highly accurate maneuvers. Um, the last, um, back in, there are no dates here, but this one was in mid-June of 2018, and then here we're starting at uh, October 1st, and every two weeks uh, through October, and each maneuver is getting progressively smaller. <coughs> five prop maneuver, 351 meters per second. Another one is on 37. So you're gradually slowing down, all the way down to six centimeters per second, uh, and uh, 17 centimeters per second for the final two that got you right up to your target, uh, right by the asteroid. And this one was only a 1.3 uh, centimeters per second, the smallest maneuver done to date. So, uh, I think this here earlier. Okay. So, uh, op, the OPNAV, Optical Navigation Instruments and Approach Imaging, there are uh, four different cameras that are being used for that. Uh, one's called Polycam, one's called MapCam, and two MapCams, the Navigation Focus Cameras. And their specs are here. Um, I'm not going to go over this in detail because I want to get on a more interesting stuff. <coughs> uh, okay, so the nominal approach, uh, here we are in approach I uh, mentioned uh, October 1st, uh, 2018, up till into December. Uh, December 3rd was the first close flyby uh, of the asteroid. It's about 7 to 16 kilometers range at that point, about 16. And uh, you can see the range dropping from 175,700 kilometers. And you can see the uncertainties here. And it's gray, uh, different shades of gray are uh, one, two, and three sigmas. We have huge potential variations at some points here. But we can actually see the uh, ash loan is pointed out in red here. So uh, we were really down the middle. There was a significant variation uh, here. Uh, but that's because this was an extremely tight constraint, hard to hit uh, constraint, and uh, they, they did quite well though. And, okay, so then the uh, sample collection uh, device where they're actually getting the, uh, going down and with an arm and touching and, and doing a compressed gas and collapsing <coughs> uh, material off the surface, it's called this touch and go sample acquisition mechanism, tag sample. And so there was like a selfie on the spacecraft where they checked it out. Some images are shown here from that in flight, uh, back in the Earth 14. So there's an animation here. Yeah, here we go. 
th this is showing a uh, preliminary survey where there were three fly bys over the North Pole, then one of the equator, like the, the sun square side of the equator, and then uh, below the South Pole. And that led up to uh, maneuvers that line you up for orbit insertion into the frozen orbit. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so these are showing some from the NAVCAM optical navigation images of the asteroid during this time. It's during the first North Pole flyby. It gets bigger if it gets closer, obviously it's smaller as it moves away. So the reason we did three North Pole flybys in the same back and forth and back and forth was to beat down the errors because we were not confident that the uh, scientists <coughs> be able to meet their requirements for precision uh, observations of venue uh, with just one North Pole flyby. So we just did a back and forth, back and forth, and that really worked well. So by the time we got through all of this, the uncertainty of the GM was down to the order of 1%, uh, which really helped us to be able to do that final planning for the frozen orbit. Because you're going you know, to have no clue about the higher order terms in the gravity level, and much less the GM got a one here. Okay, so this is <coughs> moving on to the uh, frozen orbit insertion. We finished the preliminary survey and we're doing maneuvers to set, set up to go back, fly in front of Bennu relative to the view from the sun, and then going into the frozen orbit. And you can see the asteroid is uh, rotating here. Oh, yeah, that was it. So this is showing the first, this is an animation of the first of the orbits in the rotating frame. Okay. So this is called orbital A or sometimes orbit A. So for the frozen orbit design, there's a few, few charts on this. But basically, um, at one week, like here you can see a view from uh, from Bennu North with the sun downward. And so the, the orbit the space track is coming in here, and over the north pole of Bennu, it does the orbit insertion and proceeds around. So this is actually the location uh, nine days after. So <coughs> the orbit period is uh, around 61 hours, so roughly two and a half days. So it's completed uh, three and a half or so orbits at this point. And here's a more of an oblique view. Um, so we have a seven major axis of about 1.8 kilometers, uh, eccentricity of around 1.115. Uh, inclination very close to polar and other uh, orbit parameters are shown here. Um, so these are very round numbers of the very out to map wraps radius. <coughs> and then uh, some of these invisible parameters are shown here on the rotation rate. Basically every um, the spin rate is such that it's four point three hours is the four point two nine hours is the rotation rate uh, of that image. Okay, so uh, just to rehash on frozen orbits, here though we're going into something we don't know anything about. It. It's the higher order terms in the gravity model. So uh, to keep the orbit constant, uh, the angular momentum uh, vector is directed away, uh, is directed uh, toward or away from the sun, and the eccentricity vector of above or below the ecliptic plane. And so orbit insertion with uh, periapsis could either be at the south pole or north pole, we did north pole. So uh, the angular momentum vector is away from the sun and it's a clockwise rotation. Um, so the orbits uh, lie very close to the terminator <coughs> plane but are slightly displaced away from the sun. Um, so there's like a 67 out of a 252 meter uh, a 240 some meter radius, it's about 67 or some meters displaced uh, behind because we've got solar radiation pressure and other small forces that are acting. Um, so, so anyway, the uh, person orbits become more circular with stronger 
solar radiation pressure here. Now keep in mind, this asteroid, its GM is so small that it's barely able to be orbited. It's the smallest orb uh, object that you've ever had, there's ever been an orbiter of uh, out in space. And as far as a natural uh, made object. And so there's a physical uh, upper bound on the second major axis, and I think uh, Chris Junkins referenced that earlier, uh, based on SRP and asteroid GM in this case. Uh, orbits larger than this will escape. And, uh, there's a, and as you get to be more circular, uh, it becomes a lot less stable and does either crash or escape, depending upon uh, a number of factors. <coughs> so, first orbit design cut uh, is an equilibrium orbit. It's designed based on the equilibrium solution to, to uh, Lagrange's planetary equations with SRP as a free orbit potential. And as shown here, uh, this basic classic elements and derivatives. And this uh, value here is bended rotation rate. And so um, of the two equilibrium solutions, this is a set of equations where it's interested in just one in the terminator point. And so that is the inclination by basically by the two and ninety degrees. And so this is it simplified basically to this term here, and you have this equation that uh, Basically, the sort of major axis x intensity or match that or what we use. So, defining the Fresno orbit, this is called, we call this the sun anti momentum frame. Um, I'm not going to get into the exact definition for time's sake, but uh, anyway, so the, uh, we specify the sort of major axis, calculate the x intensity that goes with that, and also there's a fact because of the uh, solar flux. There is a another factor based upon the eccentricity of the orbit and the changing distance from the sun uh, of where uh, Beta is relative to the sun. So that's another factor, a more lesser factor in the actual orbit design. So anyway, and so here you can see the effect of um, uh, eccentricity on the uh, GM of the asteroid. Uh, we thought it was 5.2 from 3.4 to uh, 7.1. This is kind of the range. Uh, and so here you can see for different um, uh, centimeter axes uh, what the effect is. Uh, so as the eccentricity increases, to match the higher GM possibility. But anyway, we came in around either around 4.9. And also carry out radius is the effect here to show sure as well. <coughs> so higher uh, better GM requires more eccentric orbit. And so as flow. So over uh, about two months, no maneuvers, although we were always monitoring to see if we would need to do a correction. Uh, this is how good, how minimal the variation was uh, the present orbit. And I, we were very well pleasantly surprised that it, um, that it turned out that well. And you can see here the variation in uh, eccentricity uh, went down to about 0.1 and uh, max around 0.15 to 0.16. And second major axis shifting around. Um, and it definitely affects um, on the, uh, the gravity of, of band and variation show up at some point. Um, okay. So these are a couple of nav cam images from orbit, show how rough this object is. And this is something that's posted on the website. Here's a Bennu, part of Bennu from a range of 15 miles, about 24 kilometers. And the uh, polycam camera that shows this on December 2nd, 2018, as we're getting very close Venu uh, as the first actual approach before we started to do those North Pole flyovers. And so this image is brought to show uh, a section here is a uh, 20 meter wide crater uh, here. Okay, so this image shows a region near Venu's North Pole uh, on the day night uh, Terminator line. Um, so 
here the distance is only 1.1 miles or 1.8 kilometers. So here we're at 12 <coughs> centimeters or 4.5 inches per pixel. Again, this is pretty high resolution. And we've even have gotten better than this. The largest boulder is about uh, 16 meters across. And about the length of a trailer on a semi truck. And these are available on the website if you want to see them. And now, uh, this is something that uh, starting uh, on January 6th of this year, uh, just less than a week after being in orbit, uh, they noticed that there were particles that reflecting light around Bennu that were not stars and were moving away from Bennu. And so they, they had to, uh, as they're doing other things, come up with uh, new software, new processes, uh, and modify software that they already had to identify these particles. So you can see here, uh, these are two different images put together, one of Bennu and then one showing these particles here. These are, the stars have been taken out. So all of these are particles and they were emanating in different, direct from the same source uh, up in this part of uh, Bengal. So this is basically a short exposure image of like 1.4 millisecond is a four asteroid and there's a five second long exposure to show the particles. Um, I've lost track of how many particle events they are emitting from this now active asteroid. Uh, the last one was that I'm aware of was April 19th. So that was just a week ago. And it's possible something happened even since then. But typically uh, with a comet, do you know where, what part of its orbit that a comet emits the most particles? Perihelion, right? So it, as it's closest to the sun, you got that ice, dust interaction, boom, stuff starts spewing out. Well, what they've seen here is that the particles keep coming with <laughs> They were first noticed near perihelion of uh, the asteroid around the sun, and or just before. Now moving uh, quite a bit further from the sun, it's still spitting out stuff. And and also uh, on the day side where it's, it's warmer, the sun warmed by the sun. Or the night side, it doesn't matter. It's emitting particles uh, from at all times of the local day and night, and <coughs> multiple differences distances from the sun. So um, I, I don't have a lot of detail beyond this one photo, but I, I can talk about it. There have been some very interesting animations where they track the orbits of these particles. Um, they can see which ones escape. Uh, the velocities are high enough that they leave and go out into interplanetary space. And with all the ones that come back, barely come up and hit back on Bennu, just like projectile will go up and come back and crash within one orbit. Mm -hmm. Others have been tracked for multiple orbits, two, three, four, and even more. And guess what uh, they can learn from those particles that they cannot learn from being from the spacecraft orbit? Because of the orbit of the spacecraft, uh, it, it's observing it, it's farther away. So what what will they learn about Bennu? Uh, by tracking the orbits of these particles. Anybody? It's gravity yeah. yeah, the higher order of gravity terms. Now, with just uh, you know a few of these, you, you have huge, very huge uh, uncertainties on those terms. But when they're tracking hundreds <coughs> of these particles for orbits, um, I, I don't know what the number is, those uncertainties start to come down. So, like we know with Grail, or uh, when you're at the moon, you're orbiting, and you get low, uh, or and the lunar missions, you get lower and lower, you get a lot more detail on those higher order terms, because you're down flow, and you're really experiencing those, uh, the lumpiness of the moon. Well here, the spacecraft can't get too low for safety concerns, but it already has something to watch to help refine those graphs. So now we have a better gravity model based upon those observations and 
there's still a significant degree of uncertainty, but uh, it's very interesting, I think, the navigation first to use practical orbits of particles um, that are being emitted and orbiting the uh, object, small body, and then reducing the uh, gra higher orders of the gravity field. So here's another uh, image uh, from just uh, about four weeks ago on the Polycam camera. And here, the field of view is about 51.2 meters wide. And this bright rectangular rock here is uh, about 2.4 meters uh, across. And so this was uh, taken during flyby four of seven flybys during what's called the baseball diamond phase, where they're doing a series of north and south flybys. I'll show you more on that later. But as you can see, this is a very uh, rough uh, object with not a lot of good landing spots. So for uh, the transition for optical navigation to uh, terrain relative or landmark phase, um, so that happened during uh, the month of January of this year, right after we got into orbit. And so um, basically, there are the shape model of Venn has been updated and refined multiple times by uh, two at least two independent sources. And they have something called uh, SPC, which is uh, Stereo Photophotometry Software. And uh, it aligns landmarks and uh, produces measurements for orbit determination uh, processing. And so there are different things here. Here's basically showing some of the star background and a high process image of uh, Ben, the uh, sunlit portion of Bennu here. And they look for the center based on their different uh, software algorithms. And then they compare that to the known positions of stars for navigation. And these are the different star images uh, on different scale. You can't read it. It's too small and realize. Um, so here's another image, and they do an outline of where the, the asteroid actually is, even though much of it's dark because of the phase angle. And then they have these things, uh, plots where they show different landmarks, and they assign them with the uh, alphanumeric uh, system so they keep track because they don't have actual names for the landmarks. And they get to be much more dense than this as they have more and more landmarks to track. And these are different images image pairs that show these uh, landmarks. So there's something called CHIP, <coughs> uh, which is KX for kinetics, and then uh, IMP, I don't know what that's saying. It's an image processing uh, software. And um, basically, they have, what they're <coughs> showing here is there's an image data from that it will process with this um, color variation, and then a simulated image, and then the difference. So their predictions through their modeling before the encounter versus what they actually acquire are so close that there's only fairly visible difference, small differences showing up. And so it, it helps find the center finding meaning, finding the apparent center from the view from the spacecraft of Van Uh The analysis assumed uh, within 10 pixels, one sigma, uh, one pixel plus one percent of the body diameter for being able to identify the center of Bennu. But the performance <coughs> that they were able to achieve uh, was less than 0 0.5 pixels, more than 20 times better than that, uh, or less than 23 meters uncertainty, and 0.06 percent of the body diameter. So they were able to perform much better than their analysis assumed conservatively that it would be able to perform. And then the predicted trajectory versus the uh, TSE is a, a CDE is current best estimate. TSE is trajectory state errors. Basically, they do a trajectory design and then they put out to the science team, here's, here's the baseline trajectory and here are all the errors that we expect up to three sigma. And so make sure your design counsel those errors because we're not going to ever be straight back on the trajectory that we're telling you we're going to be on. So uh, here you can see that over a period, these are different orbit determination solutions over a uh, couple week period. And you can see that in the lightest color here, 
you hear are the one sigma variations, and then this is two sigma, and this is three sigma, that were promised for all the planning and science team did. And so they were delivering and projecting out everything well within the one sigma uh, variation. So that was successful. So for detailed survey, uh, this is uh, what we're in right now, the spacecraft, and it's in the second phase of that. It's a, deep, it's a primary science mapping phase where the data is critical for tag site selection, touch and go, when they're going to go and select a precise candidate for getting the, the sample from the surface. So that decision is actually coming out before the end of July of this year. So we're collecting the data on that right now. Oop. So anyway, so there are 14 close flybys, and about uh, eight of them have been done to date. Uh, and they're all from uh, 3.85 kilometers from Venice Center over a period of 14 weeks. Uh, so there's a regular weekly cadence for doing uh, a couple of maneuvers a week during this time. Um, and uh, so anyway, there are one to two science observation windows per week during these flybys. And then um, each maneuver and science window has to get a ground-based late update. We're, we're flying very close to the asteroid in one over kilometers. And so the uh, SRP, the uncertainties, and the gravitational uh, field uncertainties are, that there's significant perturbations between the projected uh, trajectory and uh, where, basically, where you want to be doing the next maneuver and telling the scientists where the spacecraft will be. So we actually have to be <coughs> doing an update with a data cutoff or the determination about 24 hours before the actual um, activity or the, or the next maneuver. And so these late updates are uh, drafted by the high gain antenna pass of the Earth ground station um, before, and they have all the latest uh, op nav and surface feature images for refining the orbit that are sent down. The anyway, this process worked quite well so far.
So in any way, that's been going on since March 7th to uh, April 19th, finished just uh, about a week ago. So this is an image from the first flyby of the detail survey, Baseball Diamond. And this is from a distance of three miles. This cracked rock up here is about 69 uh, feet long, 20, 21 meters, like that. But it's very, uh, there are easy <coughs> there are variations in the albedo or reflectance, uh, darker, lighter on the surface. So this is all at the same exposure. Okay. Uh, so notable navigation accomplishments. Um, we have the record uh, for the smallest object ever orbited. The uh, GM is uh, 4.9 meters cubed per second squared. So that is, I believe that's uh, four, basically 4.89 uh, e to the minus 9, I believe, uh, kilometers cubed per second squared. And the uh, previous record uh, was uh, the GM was quite a bit higher for uh, 67 feet Chir Chirimov, Gerasimenko, and Rosetta uh, orbited. That was at about 666 uh, meters cubed per second square. As the record for the lowest captured orbit, the centimeter axis of that uh, orbital A frozen orbit was 1.84 kilometers, and the previous record was a centimeter axis of 7 kilometers. Um, so this, uh, again, um, we will beat this again, cutting this about in half. Uh, in June of this year, coming up in just uh, six or uh, seven weeks from now, uh, this is a major axis will be 930 meters. And uh, that will be a near circular terminator orbit, terminator point. So uh, the lowest achieved spacecraft orbit velocity while orbiting an object is achieved here at about five centimeters per second. And you know that's basically two inches per second or a very fast amp, you know, a high felt amp. Um, so the uh, unpre this is an unprecedented level of spacecraft force modeling and characterization. So down to uh, modeling things down to less than three times uh, 10 to the minus 13. You know, uh, 10 to the minus 12 is a trillion, so uh, even the order of magnitude is sort of less than that. Uh, one to two orders of magnitude less than the solar radiation pressure. So they're um, the, the, the un, unmodeled forces, uh, the stochastics, being down at this level of us. Uh, and they're seeing, so they, but the modeling is going so well that all, all the maneuvers are, have been uh, exceedingly successful so far. Uh, one time they were not able to, uh, for various reasons on the ground, we had a blizzard, uh, there's like a hundred reasons, uh, and we were able to do this late update uh, that was supposed to be 24 hours before. So that made it certainly later, but it was uh, a little bit out of scope, but it's still a successful science uh, observation that they had. <coughs> so uh, anyway, we've estimated uh, many of the parameters with a high degree of confidence, GM spin axis, spin rate, uh, they have uncertainties that are remarkably low, down to like 10 to the minus 8 uh, uncertainty in, um, in, my course, in the orbit period. I, mean, I believe that's in the uh, so it's all seconds. It's still a very, very small number. Um, and the center of mass, the center of figure offset, um, J2, um, <coughs> The higher order gravity model uh, terms in the gravity field model are not known that well yet, but we do have that insight I mentioned before about tracking more than some of the particles in it and then telling you somewhat. Um, also, we can spacecraft was completed, uh, we had maneuvers that were uh, every other day for a while. So we did 12 maneuvers in 32 days. So that was a pretty busy time for the team. And that was during the month of December, if I remember. So uh, we completed this transition from the star base, centroid of the asteroid base, uh, topical navigation to terrain relative or landmark base, uh, and then 
So it's completed four a day without requiring any more to turn the numbers so there were placeholders every week for those uh, over two months with very little variation in that one. And what's next? So we're currently just past the halfway point through detailed survey. We still are about six uh, flybys out of 12, 14 plans. Uh, global mosaic images are of uh, highest resolution to date, and it gives us key information <coughs> on uh, possible candidate sample sites for bringing the spacecraft down and collecting examples. Uh, uh, coming up in June, we'll be inserting the 930 meter centimeter axis orbit for, uh, for detailed global mapping, and then after that in, in August, uh, they will be doing a repeat of the frozen orbit, but the parameters are going to be different because uh, then it's further from the sun, and it has some effect on that uh, frozen orbit. And, and then we have low reconnaissance flybys uh, planned in the fall and winter of 2019. But these are it's called the recon phase, where the spacecraft will practice going down to uh, maneuver stop points. Like there's a multiple uh, maneuver thing, like they call it a checkpoint and a match point, where they'll go to a certain point, uh, higher stage altitude, but closer than they've been, and on the way down to the sample collection. It's a rehearsal, basically, for sample collection. And they'll go to one point and then back up, and then they'll go to the next point right before going all the way down to the sample collection. So they repeat and rehearse, make sure they got it right, that they're going to have a high degree of confidence that the sample collection uh, method will work. And then the actual sample collection will be planned for summer 2020. And as I mentioned before, uh, March 2021 will be leaving the asteroid. So there's a lot of margin in there that for some reason there's a delay. And here we have a surface map of Bennu. And this is just a little over five weeks old. Uh, when this is put together, you can see it only goes to around uh, 70 degrees uh, north and south latitude. Beyond that, it gets very distorted, so this is a more visual feel. But it's a very rocky, rough uh, surface with a lot of large boulders that are larger than they expected. Okay, and in summary, So uh, OSIRIS-REx has completed uh, the five-month uh, navigation campaign, uh, nearly completed the five-month navigation campaign uh, that will be uh, completed at near the end, near the beginning of June. Uh, so we have the kind of approach to Bennu, the rendezvous, first flyby is insertion into orbit, and then the various flybys for different mapping uh, objectives. And it's exceeded all pre-encounter expectations for optical navigation and maneuver performance and predictive predictions uh, for the early part of the mission. Uh, we've updated our understanding of Bennu geophysical parameters and spacecraft navigation performance. Uh, it has helped revise the design and the subsequent uh, phases. Now, this uh, thing about the particle ejection, that has generated a lot of interest, a lot of papers are being made, um, and so because of that, can't show a lot of detail now, but there are, uh, we did, because of all the schedule margin and whatever, there are planning upcoming additional focused observation time at good phase angles so they can see the sun reflecting off of these particles. Um, they can understand this phenomenon more. Um, and of course, we know that uh, comets are very active, but there are very few known active asteroids. Uh, anyway, so we're there. Uh, Unprecedented accomplishments have been uh, already seen in this mission uh, from beyond the Earth and system in tracking the trajectories of particles emitted uh, from a source system body through all their life phase or escape. And um, that is it. Here's some of the uh, web <coughs> social media presence. Thanks for the website. Any questions? Ejection stuff. What is what's the kind of on 
ongoing theory about where that, that impact is. Like oh, no. No, these, these are not from is it oil meteorite oil? impacts. These are not. It's a oil off? There, there, there's a lot, there are papers out <coughs> that have come out in nature. There's a whole, once there is coming out on that. So there, yeah, it, one, one theory is that there are um, volatiles. In fact, they already know that there are, there's a water clay uh, mix in the regolith. Right so there's a significant water ice content. So as whatever whatever reason things are popped, it's kind of like you know rice krispies get pop, snap crackle pop. These things are just popping out <coughs> in groups, and the particle sizes have ranged from very very small to uh, maybe dinner plate size. Yes. The R omega squared for on this will be a fraction of the G, uh, one G for this object, and that right. will be relevant. It doesn't take much to bump something out. I suspect it's uh, not too far below escape velocity already. Uh, right. Uh, that's one of the surfaces so clean that there's no boulders there. Why? Right? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it doesn't take much. I mean, if you were to, have uh, you seen the uh, things from High Lucid 2 where they uh, hit the surface or drop a little explosion thing on the surface. The particle, it doesn't take much to uh, cause a big disruption in these small bodies on the surface. I frame right that. Oh, okay, thanks. Just part of the target, the task and the power and 
the specific impulse for the single power. I mean, I could have also shown a uh, mass power, but one is level, uh, calculable from the other. So the two ones. I mean, basically, it's a scatter diagram kind of a uh, uh, The input power increases, the transfer power is the floating um, So we see that, so, so the, there are various formats of these throttle tables out there. Um, and some of these throttle tables basically list some electrical engineering quantities, for example. Uh, the current and the voltage that need to be controlled to actually throttle, to do actual throttling, to get the power per lane. For the trajectory work, we are not too much interested in those. Uh, so for us, like you mentioned before, a throttle table is basically uh, a variation of fast ISP, uh, mass dot versus power, and also for efficiency. And as far as I'm aware, there is a single industry standard throttle table uh, file format uh, that's ingestible by core software for astrodynamic design, but maybe that, that would be uh, beneficial, but that's not from, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that particular aspect. So, okay, so, so in trajectory work, we need uh, smoothness. So, you know, so cross versus power, ISP versus power, mass flores versus power, they're very really smooth uh, for, uh, for, for numerical propagation or uh, numerical optimization. And uh, the existing methods that are there for carbon level modeling basically make sure of that to ensure the smoothness by passing uh, this uh, polynomial, for example, to the, to the, to the data. As you can see here, in, uh, the data uh, are in a scattered iron time, experimentally obtained. And the least square polynomial, uh, in this case, a uh, uh, quadratic polynomial, uh, on the difference, it doesn't exactly interpret the data point. Uh, which is expected to the least square is in an average sense. Uh, so what that means is that if we want to digitally simulate uh, a discrete operation mode of a frontal table, then it's not possible because we don't really exactly interpret the, the, the data. So that's the ordinary. So uh, Gaussian process filtration is an ordinary. I'm going to very briefly talk over the GPR is uh, because there is a possibility and there are lots of literature out there. So Gaussian process filtration is our treating as it is known in the geospatial geostatistics literature, which basically provides machine learning technique for processing. So we have a set of data, uh, perhaps it's generated from a process, which we don't know about, but want to approximate. Uh, we want to uh, we have the observation, and we want to know where they came from, or where the approximate where they came from, uh, the data came from. We want to create a map, a digital input output map, a regression, that's what we need. Uh, so, uh, so what GDR does is assumes that uh, the structure of the process is, is, is composed of two, uh, <coughs> two subcomponents. One is the completely deterministic from the trend, and then on top of that, there is a random fluctuation, basically zero in second order uh, stationary Gaussian process. Uh, and we estimate the parameters of this model, uh, for example, the, the beta coefficients of the, the base function, and the uh, characteristics of this, uh, this, this, this monitor from the observed data. Uh, uh, <coughs> by doing a maximum likelihood of the standard process. Um, and it's precisely because of that random fluctuation term, that, uh, the addition of that, or the consideration of that random fluctuation term, uh, uh, that, that, that GPR is, this is, the, this is, this is particularly where GPR is different from uh, ordinary least square regression. In OLS, ordinary least square regression, for example, the, the neighboring observations are considered IIE. There is no statistical correlation between them. Whereas uh, for GPR, we do consider a covariance, uh, a covariance model uh, for the neighboring observation. And this is precisely the, the, the characteristic that helps uh, the targets, the response targets, to interpret the data points exactly. And, uh, and on top of that, create a smooth surface in what you want for any trade or any trade work. And again, I'm um, so going to go much detail over GPR. There is a picture over here. <coughs> so once the GPR model is trained, we can think of it as a you know machine learning. It's, it's, it's not you know philosophically not very different from a, a neural net, for example, which is you know as far as regression is concerned. So once the GPR model is trained, we can use it as a black box, a digital submodel, for example, uh, uh, which, uh, which is which basically just used to predict. Uh, so we <coughs> take the power, the power value, the scalar value, 
on the PPU, uh, part of the uh, for example, in you know, our simulation. Uh, we pass the sort of the meta model, which is very easy to do, and get this to tell you about the cross master rate right, ISP. Um, and so we have essentially digitally meta model that whole property uh, one one engine here here property um, and there are uh, sophisticated uh, open source software implementations for example for using Python with Python tensor flow is of course uh, very well done and in C++ uh, Python uh, whatever you do like MATLAB they're, they're all there um, so very near noise free uh, as are in our case and you know Level, then the GPR produces an exact interpolation, which is what we argued, uh, and which is not available in traditional uh, ordinary disk surface. Which means that we can now do two things. We can we can use the GPR model to, to simulate the discrete operation mode of a hard disk, and as well as the continuous mode, mode because we have finally fitted a continuous uh, mode anyway. Um, so this is this is this is one aspect of it. Um, so here is a uh, fast format, the one that we have talked about before. So you can see the, the, the data points are shown here. We have the fitted quality polynomial, which does not exactly interpolate the data points. For, uh, but the GPR meta model, you can see that it does interpolate the data points exactly. And on top of that, you also see. This is, this is what we were looking for. Anyway, so, uh, now we, so we have looked at how uh, Gaussian process regression technique can, can re replace. Uh, 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 the operation or the mode of operation of, of, of a single uh, engine or support, you know, it's a single cluster with a power uh, value and it outputs the uh, performance. Now we're going to see how this is useful in simulating the, the monthly cluster operation, for example. Uh, what the, the case that we are thinking of is the following. I mean, we have n engines, right, <coughs> four engines uh, uh, on a spacecraft, and all four engines can operate at full power when the spacecraft is close to the sun, for example, at 1 AU. But as as the spacecraft is far away, uh, sufficient power is not available. But we want to support as many engines as, as possible at full power. Uh, so essentially, what will happen? What we need for see is that uh, uh, there will be discontinuity in the force model. Uh, the engines can switch on and off. And if this behavior, uh, if this behavior is not really desirable, uh, if we are doing trajectory work, and if we are modeling the help. Uh, some folks have got and looked at it, uh, looked at this particular problem recently in this paper. Um, so we're going to do a bi-level GPR model. You know, each, we're going to, we're going to globally start to capture the behavior of these n number of engines in GPR. Where, uh, whereas in, uh, each of these engines are going to be modeled instead of a polygon <coughs> using the Gaussian uh, 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 model. So, for example, this is the famous Bryson and Crow problem. I'm not going to go into much. I debated whether to have put to describe it and then set it up in the end. It's basically the classical two body fixed time radius maximizing circle to circle problem and a constant fast and flat And this is the, the traditional problem out there. So it's uh, uh, for, the, for the data that is represented, the uh, transfer happens in about 192 days. Uh, so in this kind of a case, there, there are no flybys. What would be the, for example, uh, uh, how solar, what the solar power decay profile look like in, in such a mission? Uh, not exactly this mission, but such a mission where we already know what the minimum and maximum radius would be a priori. Uh, we also assume that uh, the spacecraft has about 1A, and 1A has got about 30 kilowatts of power, uh, the default value from STK. The four instar engines uh, each operating in this lower range. Uh, and we want as many, we would operate as many as, uh, as possible at full power because that's efficient. I mean, that's, uh, that's one way of operating. There are other ways to, I'm, I'm going to go into that. So what would the engine performance profile look like between, uh, uh, between this range of uh, radio uh, planar transfer? So like that. Uh, inverse square power decay. And if we do consider that there are four engines, uh, and each offer, each one we offer, we want to offer each at full power, or the maximum number of engines should offer at uh, full power if possible. Then this is what cluster switching profile will look like. For example, at one AU, there is a maximum power, so the four clusters are on, and then it's set to uh, three, finally to two. So it means that with this state profile, the task 
and the mass storage would both be discontinuous, which is not to really that great for credit optimization. And for example, there is this little thing in trust, two little things, because in trust, two steps. And in the mass storage model, uh, the effect is more dramatic. So it means that in the differential equation, the right hand side, there will be discontinuity. And then we can do something about it uh, using GPR, because we saw GPR uh, movement. So uh, there are some there are some remedies that are previously suggested, which is the use of smooth stepping, uh, basically uh, a sigmoid like approximation of that step, or uh, again in the same paper that I talked about recently uh, from Butter, they have used logistic approximation to, to smooth out the uh, step transition. So in this work, we suggest that you know, use GPR data modeling from offline simulated data, like the one that we just shown, because we just dropped this kind of data. Uh, we drop this data and why not try to put a uh, Gaussian process integration model to the data and see how that performs. Because we, we in this in this particular you know scenario we already know what the minimum and maximum radii are. So we can calculate trust and mass storage and ISPS functions of R and then simply create a meta model. And the size sorry, five more minutes ago. So anyway, so this is what the meta model looks like. It's not very really, the meta model is essentially smooth. Uh, it's moving out those things. Uh, uh, this is the uh, mass flow rate. And anyway, with, that, with this smooth, uh, smooth data model, uh, we were able to solve, uh, without any flyby, the name is a work in progress, uh, the, 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 the maximum radius problem. And we change the data values of the problem a little bit to make sure that the, the best card actually does apply to those things. Uh, and there are no problems. And, and uh, before so in conclusion we have introduced a new manner of digitally representing uh part of it, uh <coughs> that is in Gaussian process integration. It does allow for both continuous and discrete modes of operation of an MD and it can be useful in registry design and And one thing that we are thinking of uh, is to create a ASCII file, industry standard ASCII file format for a project that we for a across uh, uh, parts, pretty pretty many And that's the way it happens. Thank you. Yeah, 
Yeah, just yeah. Well, so for example, yeah, right. So the, the, yeah. for that, we look to the characteristics of the. I mean, okay. Yeah. For example, in this case, we created a, we created a quadratic mu. So it, even if it does look like a solid, you know, it's, it's basically quadratic. It's not a solid. Okay. So second order. So it's basically C two. But yeah. But if you do linear okay. instead of. Yeah. Uh, quadratic, then it would be an uh, it exact so, so you don't foresee a problem of it going to the power level three kilowatts to six kilowatts. Uh, it was, it is, I get it. Oh, uh, well, you have to zoom in and see what the micro is, right. but okay. yeah, probably, yeah. That may, we have to look more, but for that part, this, for this particular case, it didn't create that problem. Okay. Also possible that it didn't go to the power range, but again, right. yeah. Right. Right. Solutions. 
does not necessarily wake up good computation time. So continuing, so before we get into inverse dynamics, what are the direct dynamics? Uh, the direct dynamics say that we have some history of our control inputs, and we have some initial conditions for angular velocity. We have Euler's rotation equations that we can numerically integrate to find our time history for our angular velocities. We can then take those time histories in conjunction with the initial conditions for our attitude. Uh, in this case, you integrate this set of ordinary differential equations related to your quaternions, and you find the time history for your attitude over those control inputs for your maneuver time. Uh, to optimize this, you can either do a direct optimization method, set up your cost function with all of your constraints, uh, construct your Hamiltonian, get all of your optimality conditions, your differential equations, uh, solve those all together, assume the control switching, so optimal time, you either have max uh, ports or you have min ports throughout the maneuver and use an optimization method like shooting method. Uh, an alternative to that is heuristic methods, uh, hybrid methods. You set up some kind of cost function with constraints that relate to your dynamics or whatever conditions you're imposing. Also time, if you're interested in time optimality, you approximate your control history, you integrate the dynamics again, check your cost function, and update your approximations based on your uh, heuristic method. And an example of that is part of the form optimization. Uh, the inverse dynamics says the reverse. It says instead of assuming we know the control inputs, we say we assume we know the attitude over the course of the maneuver. In this case, for three to one Euler angles, we assume we know some angle history for alpha, beta, and theta. Uh, they relate to the, the principal axes and then to the quaternions. Going to the quaternions in this formulation is not necessary but uh, for compatibility with what you might see in a real uh, reorientation maneuver, you often work with quaternions. So we go through that extra step, even though we do have a relationship between the principal axes and our force. Uh, so then we set up all the equations, we take derivatives, take more derivatives, and then solve for our control inputs that would correspond to that reorientation maneuver. Uh, so, uh, and in here, your maneuver optimization, in this case, we're using fiber methods. Again, you set up your cost function, approximate your oil angle, uh, oil angle histories, take derivatives, check your cost function, and update. So the main benefit of the inverse dynamics over direct dynamics is you have to take derivatives instead of integrals, which can save you a lot of time on integration. And then the benefit of heuristic methods is you don't have to go through those uh, very difficult differential equation solutions to, and necessarily difficult uh, algorithms to determine optimality. Heuristic methods often don't give you the true optimum solution, but they get us close enough with faster computation time. Uh, so in this research, we, I'm using particle swarm optimization. Uh, particle swarm opti uh, optimization includes some swarm of particles. So you'll have, uh, say, 100 particles in a, a swarm that is searching your uh, search space for solutions to your optimization problem. Uh, over time, these particles in the swarm evolve, depending on certain uh, variables inside of your swarm, and then they adjust over and over throughout, uh, throughout however many iterations or until whatever tolerance you need is met. So uh, the algorithm for PSO would be you take your particles, you evaluate your cost function for all of your particles, for all of the approximate solutions, uh, you find your best particle, you update your velocities, in, in a sense, how your particles are going to be moving to the next iteration, which is a function of the current location of your particle, uh, the best location the current particle has ever seen in any iteration, and then the best particle ever seen by the swarm in any iteration. So it's some function of all of those things. You update your particle, uh, you save your best cost function and your best particle information, and then you can do the process. And you do this until either you run out of steps that didn't converge, or until it leads to tolerance, or whatever else you Uh, so, problem constraints for the problem I saw. It's a rest arrest maneuver, rigid body, independent axis control. Uh, because it's rest arrest, I'm assuming the angular velocity is at acceleration for zero, at time zero. Uh, the initial and final attitude point is known. I know where the thing I want to get to is, and I know where my sensor initially is. Uh, for simplistic uh, representation of the initial conditions, we could just say the sensor is aligned uh, initially with some inertial one axis, and we also say that the sensor is aligned with this axis, which is our body one axis. 
and there's some relationships between the quaternions and the different uh, directions of that uh, that vector. Uh, there's potential path constraints due to the high intensity bodies, and your path constraints say I need to be a certain angle away from those uh, direct pointing of the the uh, constraint bodies, and then that angle could be represented as a function of the pointing of your sensor and the pointing of the the constraint body. Uh, we also assume uh, assume throughout the maneuver that the constraint body pointing or the direction of the constraint body is stationary. The maneuvers are happening uh, on such a short time scale that we don't have to worry about those changes over time as well. Uh, the torque magnitude about any axis is normalized to one, and that leads to some normalizations. And then the optimization column is part of one. Okay, so this is an example of some constraint body uh, orientation you might see. Uh, so right here is the moon, blue is the earth, and yellow is the sun. They compose some kind of uh, cone constraints on your system because there's a certain angle you can't uh, be within to meet the constraints. The implementation method. So uh, the main difference between any of these methods is how you go about in implementing the approximations of your attitude angles, so your Euler angles in this case. Uh, every method I attempted was some linear combination of polynomials, so different bases of polynomials, different kind of polynomial fit. Uh, every method was tested with PSO with the identical conditions in both the unconstrained and constrained case. I took it, if it can't find the solution to the unconstrained case, it probably can't find it to the constrained case, and then I would just move on. Okay. Uh, the first attempt I made was Chapter 7 polynomials. Uh, Dr. Belkin's work uh, on one of his papers was solving the direct dynamic version of this problem with Chevy Chef polynomials for the control torques. Uh, so the first thing I tried was Chevy Chef polynomials. They have some nice properties where between minus one and one, the magnitude of any polynomial is plus or minus one. So that's nice for the torques, but not necessarily for the angles, but in the turn anyway. Uh, you have a personal relationship for your Chevy Chef polynomials, uh, linear combination. To meet the initial conditions, I say, uh, Essentially, alpha is zero, beta is zero, beta is zero equals zero, and also theta dot zero uh, at zero equals zero. Uh, you need to set certain coefficients of this linear combination to zero to meet those initial conditions. So I have some of those relationships right there, depending on what we need. And in this case, the PSO elements are the coefficients to the polynomial. So they'll be initialized with whatever order approximation I'm making. The Chebyshev polynomials will approximate my order angles, and then I'll just evaluate all of the equations. Uh, second method I tried was power series approximation. So instead of championship polynomials, it's a nice simple power series. Whatever order I wanted, I could change that to see you know, how things change. And the PSO elements for the coefficients to the different orders of polynomials. The last method I tried was something I call higher order derivative uh, modeling. Essentially, I say that I know all of my conditions, and then I'm saying I don't know the higher order uh, fitting of my angles. So I could use PSO to guess at the higher order derivatives at the uh, initial and end points of my maneuver and use that to fit a polynomial directly between the initial pointing and the final point. Uh, the benefit to this, so if I do a time normalization on my final time to say it's between zero and one, I can automatically satisfy my torque constraint with the following condition saying that the final maneuver time will be the square root of the maximum magnitude torque I've seen throughout the maneuver. And then here, the PSO elements are the unknown higher derivative values for the Euler angles at the endpoints. And then there's three additional elements representing the possibility for plus or minus 2 pi on those uh, endpoints because it shouldn't affect the approach. So the effective approach was the higher order derivative method. Uh, the reason that I see this one work the best was because every single evaluation of a PSO particle would perfectly satisfy your endpoint conditions on both sides. Whereas the, uh, just the approximating a polynomial, you have no idea where it's going to end if you don't have some kind of fitting to it. Uh, it also perfectly satisfies the torque constraints. So the only thing you really need to be concerned with was the final time and the straight points. And then alterations to the other methods could be considered, but once I found a good method, I stopped with it. Uh, so the first condition I tested was no path constraints. These were my conditions for a part of the swarm, 200 particles, or 200 iterations, 100 particles per iteration. Fifth order, uh, order polynomial approximation for everything. Uh, 50 random, randomly generated iterations to search the space before I actually let the velocity function start. 
focusing in on uh, near optimal solutions. Uh, there is one ambiguity in the 3 to 1 Euler angles where if beta is pi over 2, alpha is arbitrary. In that case, I let PSO solve for that element. I chose this case for every example because the more particles I have, or more elements I have on a particle, the more difficult it is for PSO to converge. I found it depends on the problem, but for my solution, did. And the eigenaxis location would be 135 degrees to the solution. So this is examples of the plots I get. So the first plot is the Euler angles over time, then you have the torques, the angular velocities, and the cost function over time. So the first 50 iterations of the cost function is just randomly searching. And then it starts to convert very rapidly, and then it gains very little over time. And then the, the GIF in the bottom right is essentially the best guess per iteration. So I just look into how it evolves over time my best guess. That's an example. And then some information on what these solutions look like. So I found that my maneuver time is 3.28 time units. The computation time was about 14 seconds. And the percent over uh, the optimal solution was 13.7%. For reference, uh, from reference one, the eigenaxis solution is about 6.5% over the optimal solution, and your optimal solution is 2.88 time units. And then from Co or uh, Basu and Melton's paper, they found that they had to come about 4 TU, and it took them about 2 hours to calculate, which was 39% over the optimal solution. Uh, all my calculations done for these was using MATLAB, uh, a relatively new i7 processor, not parallelized, uh, 4 gigahertz. The CPU they were using in their research was an older i3 with like 3 gigahertz, 2.8 gigahertz, I think. So not directly comparable, but the large difference in computation time leads me to believe that it's not just the processors that are leading to better, better uh, maneuver generation. And also the final time is better. Uh, so then we get some path, uh, path constraint conditions. So the same uh, uh, modeling of the angles, the same conditions for the angles. I have some constraint body orientations for the three cones. And then these are the half angles for the cones. These were taken because these were examples of what the SWIFT satellite might have seen. I know Dr. Melton did some research related to this kind of problem for that use. Uh, and then this, this is the example. So the only different plot here is on the bottom left. That is the angle between the, the current pointing over time relative to the cones. And then the bottom dash lines corresponding to the colors are essentially what my constraints are. So even though it looks like that black line is sitting in the blue line, they're not corresponding to the black line to the black line. Okay. But yes, and then this is the maneuver over time. And then it eventually finds up right there. Great. Uh, and then here, the maneuver time for that was roughly four time units, whereas the other reference was 4.3 time units, and then again 14 seconds versus 6 hours. Uh, and then the last one, I just added an extreme path constraint to look into the robustness of the solution. Same conditions for everything. The orientations are slightly different from the last one, and then I changed the half angles. So Earth had a very large half angle, and I made it so the only path that it could take had the smallest angular gap of 1 times 10 to minus 8 degrees. And I wanted to see if it could find its way through that. And it does. So that's great. Uh, yep. So that's what the solution looks like for the final time. It narrowly escapes that gap. You see it. It looks like it almost hits the constraint cones throughout the maneuver, but it does a good job. The animation is a little yeah, bumpy looking, but it's great. So it's good. Uh, and the results from that were a maneuver time of 6.8 time units in 35 seconds, because I did more uh, iterations and a little bit more of a searching beforehand. But that could be adjusted. Uh, no matter what, it would find a solution, but depending on how I went about it, I could drive the final time down. So that's beneficial. Uh, I also created a GUI in MATLAB to be able to adjust everything and play with it and go forward. That's good. And then my conclusions from this are that this is a relatively robust method for finding solutions. It does not find true optimal solutions. Yeah, I wouldn't expect it to. But it finds uh, relatively near optimal solutions, and in a general sense, solutions that are under, at most, I've seen seven time units, uh, which I think is pretty good, but that depends on your use case. And then there's a potential for this as a, either an initial guess for conventional optimizers or use in real-time reorder case maneuver generation. 
again, that would depend on the use case. Any questions? This is just completely random new registration. <laughs>
All right, next speaker is uh, Dade Conti. Uh, Dade is a PhD student of mine, and uh, he's our next uh, graduate, and uh, tell him about it. Good job. Oh, sure, sure. So, first of all, thank you, Dr. Spencer. Uh, and I need to also uh, thank you for uh, the work that I'm doing. Is that my name on, on here? But you know, a lot of the work has been uh, thanks to Dr. Spencer and a couple other colleagues actually from uh, outside of Penn State, which I'm talking about here today. Uh, and I recently, just yesterday, officially signed uh, an offer to be a professor in Arizona. I saw Arizona. Hold your class for the end. John Day, where at? Arizona. Arizona. So if, so if my brain you know, sucks, at least I can clean those clouds for you. Uh, but yeah, so today I'm going to, the reason why this title is so generic, from Earth to Mars once once at a time, is because honestly we didn't have time to come up with a nice title. Uh, and that's because as I've been using for the past like weeks or so, months, uh, you know, it's a good excuse to say, oh, I'm busy, I have to work on my dissertation, I can't do it, you know, something like that. So I just figured I would use this excuse once again. It's nice because you can use it for both good and bad. You know, when people you know, that you don't want to hang out ask you to hang out, and I'm sorry, I can't do my dissertation. I know. But also for a good thing, unfortunately, you know, such as, hey, you want to go to see Endgame? Yeah. Uh, no spoilers, by the way. I had to go see it. Yet. So but today I'm going to be talking to you a little bit more about some uh, past research that I, I did with Dr. Spencer and we published a couple papers on this and we also had help from uh, colleagues from, uh, well, now a professor at uh, UIC <coughs> and uh, a uh, postdoc at the uh, University of uh, Strathclyde, a friend of mine and uh, great colleagues as well. So uh, this is obviously not a spacecraft, uh, <laughs> that's like in my car. Uh, today I'll tell you a little bit more about not cars and not gas stations, but cars and gas stations are actually a pretty good analogy for what I'm going to be talking to you about. In fact, if you think about when you go uh, buy a car, uh, the first thing you do in Italy, where I come from, is you have to go to the gas station and fill it up because they give you with just enough gas that you can make it to the gas station across the street. That's how skinny they are. Uh, here, when I bought my car, they gave it to me with a full tank. I was amazed. I was like, wow. <laughs> I went, when I got home, I told my dad, hey, you're from the pool. I went, wow. But if you think about it, you know, spacecraft work a little bit the same way. When they are launched from Earth nowadays, they're completely full. Uh, and uh, they never get refueling. At least it hasn't been done before. Um, so I have been uh, essentially working on finding out a way to uh, optimize the location, various locations around the solar system where you could put such locations. So a good analogy is that is, you know, let's put in this car, you know, this is my uh, pretty old uh, uh, SUV. Uh, it would probably do like 470 miles with the full tank. Probably doesn't bring it that efficient. That's what the computer is that way. Um, but say that you wanted to uh, go to, you know, say Miami, a much uh, nicer uh, weather wise place, uh, like I had done two years ago. Obviously, you wouldn't drive all the way there uh, straight, but uh, you would probably make stops along the way. Uh, there are a couple things to consider, you know, food, resting, uh, time and money, you probably don't want to drive for you know, 12 hours a day or maybe. And so, of course, there are some other constraints. Uh, now, if you want to figure out where to stop and how and everything, there's a map for that. In fact, you can just pull it out on your phone and do it right now. In about 10 seconds, you can probably find a very similar result. Of course, it varies based on the cost of gas throughout the, uh, uh, the journey, but I mean, it's pretty accurate, pretty good. The question is, why don't we have an app that does the same thing for uh, the solar system? That's why don't we have one yet? Uh, of course, there are some problem cons here. I'm not going to go through this. So, you know, this keeps coming up. This, you're running out of storage. Where's that, Dr. Spencer? It's yours, huh? Uh, well, as soon as you get rid of my presentation, it's like 50 or anyway, so, uh, so anyway. Oh, and this stops working too. Great. There we go. So the question is, why don't we have uh, the same, uh, you know, why is there a solar system gas station app where I can just plop in where I'm going and, and tell me where to stop? Well, obviously because there aren't as many uh, space missions as there are cars roaming around the country or the world in general. Uh, and also because we don't have any infrastructure that has been deployed for such a scope, at least not yet. 
Uh, some locations that may be of interest for these uh, kind of stops uh, would be something like the Moon Gateway or something similar, maybe around Earth Moon, the Martian Moons, what was in Demos, and maybe other asteroids uh, where you can do in situ research with the ISRU, as I'll refer to throughout the presentation. But we want to avoid big gravity wells, that's the, uh, the main takeaway. We don't want to go deep into uh, big gravity wells because then getting away from it is, is, uh, is not efficient. Imagine, you know, when you go uh, refuel, you don't want to go a lot off the highway, you want to just go as little as possible off the highway, get your gas and go back on the highway, that's pretty much the same, same thing. This may not be an actual representation of an astronaut, you know. uh, So anyways, if you look at the time versus energy constraint, constraints, or you know, just the, how nature works in the solar system, in order to get from uh, Earth's surface to Leo and then to lunar orbit, the Moon's surface and Martian orbit, this is pretty much the amount of time it takes give or take, uh, and notice this is a log scale, so to go to Leo it's a matter of minutes, uh, lunar orbit about a week or so, moon surface maybe 10 days even less, and Martian orbit, uh, we're talking about 250 days or more, uh, if we're doing, for example, home transfer, but in the order of months regardless. And if we look at it in terms of energy, we see that the same locations, actually the energy uh, is, uh, of course it increases, uh, but uh, it's not as steep as the increase in time. So here we see a very like, exponential increase here, a little bit uh, gentle. So if we could put uh, gas stations where these steps are, and then we could help smooth them uh, pretty much this path that the space travel would take going from one place to another. Uh, and also notice that if we uh, add three to stops, then not only do we decrease the propellant cost for the overall mission, but we also, but we also uh, <coughs> produce the propellant tank mass per minute segment. So if uh, you put your eyes and pretend this is a spacecraft, the dry mass is this part here, where you have the payload, structure, propellant tanks, and everything, and everything else is the propellant mass, so that everything is the wet mass. And what we're trying to do is not minimize the propellant mass, but minimize the propellant mass and the propellant tank mass. Because if you minimize one, then usually the other is a function of propellant, so you know, both can be driven down to a lower amount. That means we, we, we don't you know, need to launch uh, as big of a spacecraft anymore, and we can save a little bit on, on, the, uh, on the mass at launch. So I'm going to go over a sample case, which I'll carry through the entire presentation, just to give some uh, actual mass values to the thing. Uh, let's say that we want to deliver a 50 metric ton payload on crew from the Earth to uh, low Martian orbit by the year 2040 and we want to use uh, chemical propulsion, say IC of 150. So the question is what is the initial mass in Leo or uh, I Leo, Leo here, uh, needed? So 50 metric tons Y was the equivalent of the human radiant uh, Martian landed plus habitat. The reason why I said on crew is because I want to take out the uh, variable of having a consumable on board. So of course, the more time of flight, the more consumables you need for the, uh, the group. Uh, however, if it's robotic, then uh, that's no longer the case. So if you want to take that variable out, so we can clearly see um, how the numbers change solely based on um, essentially delta the on flight. And then uh, 450 seconds is a very uh, optimistic uh, ISP, the equivalent to the main uh, space shuttle. Uh, of course, you wouldn't get such high ISP for solar propellants, but it's just to give it a number. It doesn't actually affect much in the uh, result. And let's add some constraints. We say that one of the part from Leo from a 300 kilometer altitude and arrive in a low margin orbit of LNO at the same altitude, just to give it some, uh, some constraints. So of course, if you want to go from Earth to Mars, we've seen this before, we need to do delta V in Leo, going to planetary, arrive at Mars, another delta V, arrive in low margin orbit. We've done this multiple times. Uh, juniors in the undergraduate program here and anywhere else to do this. Dave is nodding, he can do that, if I might not remember. Uh, but everybody in this room could do this very easily, probably on a piece of paper. However, for this and all calculations, I'm using actual famous models from JPL so that uh, it is a little bit more accurate and it's also time dependent. It's not typical, uh, circular, open the whole So this is what it looks like. If we look at the year from now until 2040, the best delta V solution happens to be about a total of 5.65 kilometers per second, as we would imagine, and a time of flight of about 200 days or so. 
And of course, since we are assuming a direct transfer for this case, uh, we take the 50 metric tons. I assume a uh, propulsion and structure and everything else mass of about 10 metric tons. So if you add the propellant into this, this is how much mass you have to launch into lower orbit to deliver that thing, which is a huge amount of mass, so 450 metric tons. Now let's assume that instead of going directly there, we're actually making a stop. So that's the uh, same uh, analogy as not driving straight from the end, but driving and taking at least a stop. Right? So uh, same thing, we're going to assume Earth departure and we're going to planetary. But then this time we're going to add an extra stop. Remember, these stops are not time-wise, they're based on energy. So you have to think about it in terms of, uh, not in terms of distance, but in terms of uh, the amount of budget for <coughs> Step place. Um, and in this particular case, uh, we chose the Mars Sobos CRO, distant retrograde orbit. We perform our refueling, and then we depart and arrive into a low Martian orbit. And notice that uh, for from now on, VRO uh, stands for distant retrograde orbit, so I'll just use that uh, acronym instead. So, why did I choose uh, Mars? Uh, you know, why did I choose Phobos, and why did I choose the VRO? Well, Phobos because it's one of the moons on Mars where you could actually it is thought that you could uh, extract material from it, uh, performing ISRU. Um, the same for Demos, but I don't think both, because why not? Um, although you can do the same exact pattern for Demos as well. These are some uh, orbits that uh, could, um, could be used for parking this potential uh, refueling infrastructure uh, around Phobos. We have uh, lacrimal orbits, stable orbits, and vertical orbits. These are all unstable. Also notice that they, they, they come very dangerously close to the Phobos. And these are distant retrograde orbits, which in the, um, as I'll show you in the slide, they actually orbit uh, retrograde with respect to uh, the rotating frame. Now, of course, they're still prorating in there, but I'll show that in just a second. The reason for choosing that is because these retrograde orbits are actually neutrally stable, meaning that if there were no other forces uh, acting on the uh, spacecraft, but just that of uh, Phobos and, and Mars, and namely their gravitational forces, then uh, if you were to prefer the motion of, of a spacecraft, it would not drift uh, away uh, too much from the uh, nominal orbit. Now, of course, you have to take into account the fact that you're orbiting very close to Phobos, so nudging the spacecraft a little bit too much might end up crashing into Phobos, but it's not good. Uh, but uh, at least, you know, it's not as unstable as other orbits. <coughs> And also the uh, station keeping the <coughs> required are not as big as the other few orbits. So what are these retrograde orbits? So I plotted here a few. Uh, here is Phobos and here are the Lagrange points, L1 and L2. <laughs> as you can see, they're not as, uh, they don't look as uh, impressive as those of the Earth and Moon system. They're very close to the Phobos. As a matter of fact, the uh, um, field sphere influence of Phobos is below its surface. And that's why you can't orbit Phobos in the player sense of the two body system. So once you plot a few of these, you notice that uh, they can come pretty close, but they can also be you know, further further away. And here we have a plot that shows a particular example with an AX of 300 kilometers. AX is the distance from the center of Phobos to the biggest X distance, and where Mars is pointing this way. So this is in the rotating frame, and the orbit would rotate this way. And this is in the inertial frame. There's Mars, so it's a Mars fixed inertial frame, I should say. And we have the dotted line is Phobos, and the blue line is the DRO, so it stays really close to the orbit of Phobos, and uh, close enough to the, the moon that we can uh, we could potentially have an infrastructure and uh, have an, a vehicle that goes back and forth, extracting extract material, and then use it for uh, uh, refueling capabilities for incoming spacecraft. Also, here's an, uh, an animation of uh, exactly what you just, what I just told you. In the rotating frame, you see spacecraft would go in a prograde, apparent prograde motion. Uh, in the inertial frame, these uh, these two dots chasing each other are Phobos and the spacecraft, as you can see they're always close. And these are pretty much sync, um, almost frame to frame, sort of. Actually, this one and the other, and kind of like my eye, hoping that it's uh, in the audience. Um, anyways. So how would you arrive and, and, do, uh, and do this? Well, you have your typical Mars arrival here. Um, and this is all done using the two-body approximation, but then you can use the, those guesses to translate those three-body uh, problem uh, using uh, Mars and Phobos as, their, as the uh, primaries. Uh, you perform a 
first self that you can get captured, and you want to have your uh, upper urium or APA with respect to Mars pretty high up, so that when you perform your inclination change uh, and also periodic change, you're also able to target your insertion point eventually. Boy, is that what we do here with the delta V2? Now, if Phobos were here at the time of arrival, not a maneuver would be necessary. However, Phobos is likely not to be there when you're arriving, so you have to do a phase maneuver that's delta V3, and the orbit in red represents the phasing. Now, this, of course, would depend on where Phobos is located, so the, blue, the red uh, orbit would change based on the location of Phobos. However, the energy required to do all these maneuvers would sum up to the same amount, regardless of the word phasing. That's because you're going from one orbit to another, so the energy to go from one orbit to another is the same. And in, in, um, sorry, in black, we have the actual distant retrograde orbit, as you saw before. And now we can insert ourselves in, uh, in the final orbit. And here we have a close up of what we can both sides. So just like we do portrait plus for uh, drawing from, say, Earth, Mars, or you know, Mercury, or any other planets, we can do a similar uh, plot. In this case, it's a purely delta V uh, for going from uh, uh, the um, Earth to a Mars Solus DRO. And we notice that we get uh, <coughs> here all the possible delta V combinations. The in white here is where delta V was just too high to be plotted. We didn't really consider it. But it turns out that uh, that maneuver to go from the uh, from Earth to a uh, Mars Solus DRO <coughs> comes up to 5.2 kilometers per second. This is considering all the possible scenario periods from now to the year 2040. We said we wouldn't go beyond 2040, but if we were just to go a little bit beyond, we'd actually find a better solution. But, uh, so if we sum up all the maneuvers, we see that that 5.21 kilometers per second is the sum of the largest maneuvers before we perform refueling. And then we have to do another 0.6 kilometers per second in order to get to the actual final destination. But because we are refueling at Phobos, then we don't no longer need to uh, uh, carry all that fuel with us, meaning that we can, our propellant, propellant tanks can be smaller, and so can be our... And so can be our launch mass right here. So we have 355 more metric tons instead of 450. Now let's say that we are adding another stop, and this is going to be the last uh, uh, stop that I do, otherwise it would be here until tonight, uh, rather than one um, But we could keep adding stops on and on. So why not stop at our moon since we stopped at Mars? Why are we discriminating against our moon? So if we uh, perform a, uh, again, lunar of the arrow, I'm not going to go into the details of why I chose the arrow, mostly for the stability reasons, and uh, you can think of it as also uh, where potential uh, even uh, asteroids that would be brought back uh, would be located where we could harvest their, uh, um, their volatiles and uh, eventually transform it into spacecraft propellant, just like the asteroid recognition suggested uh, before it got scrapped. Um, but then, so then we would stop at the Moody Arrow, perform uh, refueling, go into planetary, stop again around Phobos, and then again arrive at Mars. So now we're we're breaking, breaking down the uh, mission into various smaller chunks. Uh, performing uh, all these maneuvers, of course, that's our new intermediate stop. And this is what uh, a zero around the moon looks like. It's sort of similar to you know, Mars Solos, except they're uh, obviously much further uh, because the moon is uh, gravity, which we've heard about the moon today, not that I don't think they can say anymore. But uh, essentially, the moon is obviously much ma more massive than than uh, Phobos is with respect to the parent planet. And here we have in the rotating frame, of course, the rotate uh, prograde, and you can in the rotating frame. And then uh, here in the inertial frame, it would actually still go uh, right away. <coughs> and so it turns out that if we do a pork chop plot, you may be thinking I forgot to plot all of it, but uh, I actually did not. The reason for uh, creating this portrait plot like this is because if we're adding multiple stops in multiple locations, now we also have another constraint to take into account, which is the geometry. The geometry between Earth, the Moon, Mars, and Phobos. So we have four bodies that we need to line up pretty much. Well, not line up at the same time, but we have to consider <coughs> various mutual orbital locations. So it's no longer possible to perform uh, Mars departures, I mean, departure, trans Mars injections 
from uh, Lunar DRO at any time, but we actually get a window of two to three days every month. Every month, of course, because the moon will be in the uh, best position to, to transfer at least once a month uh, because of its uh, orbit around the Earth. And so we find that the minimum delta V to be here, or in numbers, we get about 2.7. So it's kind of cool that we can find ways to go from the Earth moon system to the uh, Mars solar system at a cost of just 2.7 kilometers per second. In this case, I use the uh, lunar mirror with AX of 6,500 kilometers. But uh, that's because it was uh, one of the closed uh, bureaus for the moon and it was one of the most stable uh, according to a lot of uh, references uh, from R and other uh, references. When you implement the full camera model. So uh, we have two stops now. And so here's the summary of all the maneuvers. One thing I want to point out is that now uh, the biggest maneuver is actually getting to out of essentially the, uh, the Earth's gravity uh, and That's our last largest delta V. And this assumes that we're transferring to lunar DRO using a lunar powered gravity assist as well, in the case for, which looks like this. This is obviously taken from another reference, but uh, you could recreate it. And uh, it takes about 300 meters per second to accomplish the orbit insertion at the uh, lunar DRO. So then, uh, since this is our largest delta V, we can do some simple uh, rocket equation stuff and find out that our new total mass we launched uh, into the uh, Leo is 176 metric tons. So if we compare all the numbers, uh, it's not rocket science, 450 is bigger than 355, which is bigger than 176. <coughs> so assuming that we have the uh, refueling capabilities, uh, we can drive the propellant uh, requirements down quite significantly. And as a uh, as a uh, comparison, I also put the amount of SLS launches you would need for each of these cases, assuming that you could break down the mass in equal chunks, which is not necessarily the case, but uh, just as a thought experiment. Of course, the time of flight increases slightly because you're stopping at various locations, you're performing you know, refueling operations, so you have you need time to do all that stuff. And so does the total delta V. The total delta V goes up, but the, total, the delta V the largest delta V from mission segment actually goes down, meaning that uh, our total re uh, requirement for launch, uh, mass launch, is actually uh, driven to a smaller amount. So, in uh, conclusion, almost at the end, uh, staging locations could be used as you know, a space camp. Uh, think of you know, going to Mount Everest, you have the base camp where everybody gathers and then you go to various steps sort of thing, uh, and uh, can be used to assemble large spacecraft, because they assemble large spacecraft in a location that is already highly energetic with respect to, say, the Earth and the system, it doesn't take as much delta V and as much thrust to send them to um, uh, interplanetary space and other destinations. And then, of course, you're doing Eagle, that's the main focus of this presentation, and also say, hey, let's say something goes wrong, you know, you, you're going to... Uh, to, to Mars, let's say, and something goes wrong along the way. If we have some refueling capabilities at an asteroid, let's say, between the Earth and Mars, we can stop there for um, whatever needs besides chemical fuel and anything else. So we, well, we, we may, well, we still may lose the mission, we at least uh, may be able to conserve the crew and have a very safe. Of course, higher total mission with delta V, but lower delta V per mission segment, which, of course, lowers the overall space travel. So beyond us, so, so beyond Mars, we, we could stop. Uh, we could stop at just the right planet, but why not all the planets? So here's what uh, it will look like if we were to go from this is a lunar DRO here in the middle, this red box, and these are all the various locations to go to you know Earth-ish orbits around the Moon-ish or Lagrange point. That's not an orbit. And, uh, and here are various other uh, destinations throughout the solar system. We have all the major planets, the Martian moons, we could put as well the other moons, the Jupiter and Saturn have so many moons that they don't have to take them from the side. And you know, you have um, <coughs> hyperbell objects and of course near the asteroids as well. So with that, I would like to then go to the next slide. Or I guess not. So that concludes my presentation. And if you have any questions, this is my own time. But that answers that question. Um, uh, I'm, I'm happy to answer.
regularized velocity vector, that just ends up being the, the transverse vector. So we know what those are. They, they physically make sense to us. Uh, the rest of the states wind up being, one of them is a single lattice rectum, just a, you know, a class of orbital element. And then this one over R, the sort of scaling factor for this. The other nice thing is uh, it turns these, you know, classic but highly nonlinear equations of motion in the Cartesian space. Uh, it maps them to this nice, clean, beautiful harmonic oscillator in the rare space. Um, in the case of uh, the motion. The rest of these states, their equations are well behaved too nice and linear, uh, except for this time equation, but that's how you get the whole thing in the first place, so we deal with it. The issue is, uh, as Dr. Simple likes to say, there's, a, there's no free lunch. So uh, the price we pay for that is increased state dimension. Uh, it's sort of better represented down here. It's kind of hard to see small, but we wind up with 10 states, or, sorry, not 10, 10 included, uh, 9 states instead of uh, 6 in Cartesian. And the 10 comes from, we're going to basically tack on the uh, tack on time for the end of the state vector. It's going to help in the estimation process later on. So because of that increased space dimension, uh, we have to constrain the system to, uh, to better represent that original six dimension. Uh, if we don't do that, then when we go through and propagate, we try to propagate a covariance matrix, uh, we'll wind up with some more singularities, which obviously we don't want. Uh, so since we know from before the sort of physically intuitive this transformation, we know that the, the position and velocity vector become the mutually orthogonal unit vectors. So we get three nice constraints. Uh, <coughs> the other challenge comes from that uh, independent variable mapping, where when you have a measurement come in, it's, uh, it's tagged with time. But since time isn't our independent variable anymore, we can't just use that to propagate our equations. We need to map that back to a uh, true anomaly. And so we, to do that, we just solve the equation. The issue with that is, since we're doing estimation, we don't know the truth. We only have our, our best guess, our estimate. So we're feeding a previous state estimate into the equation. And then it's giving us, outputting uh, some future true anomaly value that we want to propagate to that's associated with the time of the measurement. Uh, that previous estimate obviously has error. And so the true anomaly that we end up propagating to will also have error. And uh, that's kind of, yeah, it's kind of stuff that we don't want that. So first, to, uh, to refresh a little bit, or if you haven't seen a uh, common filter or filtering algorithm before, uh, it's basically just an algorithm that combines measurement information and a uh, mathematical model. So here we have. Uh, your mathematical model for your, your state dynamics and, and the measurement model. Uh, two basic steps. You propagate your uh, your dynamics forward in time until you get a measurement, and then you use that predicted state uh, from your from your propagation, and you compare it to the measurements and, and correct it from there. Uh, these this W and U K are assumed to be zero mean Gaussian noise uh, with uh, Covariance Q for W and RK for mu. Uh, so your your state ends up being a random variable, and what you're really doing when you're propagating is you're propagating the uh, the Gaussian PDF that that sort of encapsulates that state information. So you're going to be propagating uh, the mean and the covariance. Like, when you do an extended column filter, like I said before, you have to linearize, and that comes in these matrices A and, uh, and H, and they're uh, just Jacobians of your dynamic model and your method model. So now how do we implement that EKF in the rare space? The first step is uh, to, to apply the constraint equations. Because like I said before, if you don't, you're going to have some, some singularities come up in the, uh, in the covariant problem. So we take the constraint equations and take the first variation of that. And then we define a new sort of constrained state vector uh, simply by taking out 
three of the initial uh, first six, six states uh, and neglecting them in the in the propagation. You can pick pretty much any combination of those states that you want. It's not unique. Um, the problem is later on they're gonna you might run into some more singularities. It's a fitting ironic that our transformation removes the singularities and then so many more are coming up now, but that's the uh, that's the price we pay. So we can actually uh, we can actually isolate the uh, the excluded states, the, the excluded state variations using these constraint variations, and from that we can turn our equations of motion. Uh, we can express that in this form, where that A is analogous to that uh, Jacobian from the EKS overview. Uh, once we have that, we can use those equations from the EKF framework and find the uh, the constrained Propagation uh, equation for the Fourier We do a similar thing for the measurement model, uh, finding that Jacobian gauge with respect to the, uh, the constrained state vector, and we uh, then just apply them to the uh, measurement of the equations that we have from before. Uh, once you do that, you're, you're again you're only propagating the uh, constrained uh, covariance matrix, and you only have from that, you only have update information about the, uh, the constraint state vector. So, if you want to get back to full information about this entire 9 by 9 uh, covariance matrix, you have to go through some other uh, Jacobian nonsense uh, that I won't go into here. But it's a little bit more complicated than just uh, what you have to do for the state, which is apply the constraint equations once you've updated the constraint state vector. Uh, so, like I said before, you pick three uh, of your states and you want to exclude them to, to allow you to do the covariance propagation. But when you do that in that A matrix back here, it's kind of hard to see, but say for this example we excluded uh, X1, X4, and X5. So in here you see an X1 in the denominator in, in these fractions that, that make up the A matrix. And so, if you have that state, x1 go to 0, that's even more singularities, but we don't want that. So the easy way is it, not that complicated. You just okay, re-choose which ones you, you're excluding from the computation. So, uh, so now we're done uh, with the easy part, that is. And uh, the hard part comes in when we have to take into account that uh, independent variable transformation. So, during the propagation step, we have to solve Kepler's equation every time. Uh, like I said before, you're using the, your initial condition, how you initialize it is uh, your previous state estimate. So that has error. And then you're getting back some true anomaly value that also has error. And you're using those to propagate. So uh, you wind up with error compounding onto error, and you want to figure out some way to deal with that because the, the end result is the time, remember I said you're, you're, you tack on uh, time to the end of the state vector uh, and it helps out with the filtering process. Well it helps out because you can propagate time forward with respect to true anomaly and, and see if it matches your uh, your measurement time. And in general it won't. But, so we have, to, we have to account for that somehow. And the approach to that is uh, taking a first order Taylor series expansion of our state and its mean about that propagated time, we're calling it uh, T bar three. Then we just uh, apply that that uh, independent variable transformation and make this look nicer so that the, uh, the derivatives are in terms of true anomaly rather than time. And this over here just becomes the, uh, the corrected uh, mean propagation. So the, the mu at T bar is your propagated mean. And then this first order term becomes your correction. That's relatively painless. Uh, unfortunately, the covariance correction is not quite so painless. Uh, so we start with that, that Taylor series expansion of the state of the value. And we're going to call the first order term G. Uh, then we subtract them to get this uh, sort of state deviation. Uh, and again, the, the bar is, means that, that at the property. So we end up with this equation for, for delta x. Uh, and it's in terms of delta x at t bar and this, this difference in the g's. 
And once again, we take a, a first order Taylor series of, of G about the, uh, the property of time. And we end up being able to express this delta x in terms of uh, this matrix B times delta x bar. Uh, calling H B here the uh, Uh, okay, so now that we have that, uh, we know that the definition of the covariance matrix is uh, this expected value of delta xc, so the constraint covariance matrix, delta xc to delta xc transpose. Um, we can apply that to the, the propagated time as well. Or, sorry, we apply this over here uh, and to make use of the propagated time. And to do that, we, we have to again constrain uh, the B matrix. And that's sort of shown here, it's kind of cumbersome, and I won't go into detail, but we end up being able to constrain that covariate, uh, sorry, we end up being able to constrain the D matrix, and then we can apply it here and uh, get back the, uh, the nice <coughs> corrected uh, covariance matrix from the propagation. So in summary, uh, you have to initialize your filter using some popular information, uh, and then do some initial transformations using those Jacobians again. Uh, solve the, the Kepler's equation to get your true anomaly so that you can actually propagate. Pick which states you want to exclude based on how close they are to zero, and if you want to change that, you can make that decision there. Um, then we propagate, uh, correct, and update. Uh, so yeah, and, and update and, and solve the constraint equations to get the, the full picture. So now, uh, to validate, uh, we chose two test cases. Uh, we have sort of a, a tracking station. It's just a simplistic measurement taken from the center of the Earth. Um, and we're doing, uh, trying to estimate the orbit over a single pass of measurements for case one. And then case two is that same pass, but you have an initial guess. And from that initial guess, you propagate forward uh, three periods. And then your, your measurements start coming. So you have a really long propagation time, which uh, sort of lends itself better to the, the less nonlinear uh, state dynamics. Uh, so we defined a single pass as just a quarter of the over period. Uh, you'll see in the graph that my time unit is one over period. Um, and then the, uh, we're, uh, so we run, uh, to validate, we run Monte Carlo, uh, sampling the, uh, the initial state and uh, uh, from the AC parameters <coughs> We're uh, trying to estimate the sun sample as well. So uh, yeah, Monte Carlo, 10,000 samples, uh, sampling the initial state measurements. Uh, for each case, we've done two different measurement sets, uh, one with a range and angles, and the other one just chopping off the range, uh, the range measurements. And um, each, uh, each pass is going to have 25 observations. From those, we run the filter, and we get out uh, the uh, the RMB Cartesian position and velocity states. And then we map them to uh, the orbital elements to create that too. Also, those, the, uh, the errors there are uh, average RMS errors over all uh, the 10,000 of those. So, uh, for the single pass case, this is just a, uh, a snapshot, one of those runs, uh, just one set of data. And this is now the uh, estimation errors for uh, x1, x2, x3 position states in the Burdett space. So we haven't mapped them back to the Kirby. But um, it, it's good to point out that it's well behaved, right? The, the three sigma bounds uh, adequately capture the, the uncertainty of the errors in the, in the estimation. Uh, same is true for both the uh, range and the same both cases. Uh, same, same can be said for the uh, the velocity states. <coughs> so now, uh, the single snapshot again, we uh, can try to map that back to Cartesian to get some sort of meaningful data out of it. Uh, on the left, the range and angles case, I promise you there are two different measurement sets there. I, I've just uh, sort of split them up. Uh, the Burdett result is in solid for all these plots and uh, the Cartesian result is in daddy lines. So on the left, the, the range and angles case, they're virtually identical. Uh, it's a very, very small difference in performance there. 
uh, the covariances are different in the end of only case, but the errors themselves are, are still extremely close. So now uh, we run Monte Carlo, and these plots are sort of a CDS, uh, cumulative density functions, uh, showing the, the total errors up to uh, you know certain it was top, sorry, the total uh, the frequency of the errors up to a certain point. So uh, the blue is going to be behind the green. The blue is the Burdett result, and the green is the Cartesian result. So for these, you know, you, there is basically no difference, again, for the single pass case. Uh, small little bar popping out here for the Burdett, uh, converging later, but basically the same. The same thing for the, uh, the angle only case. A little bit of Cartesian sticking out, but virtually the same. Um, okay, so now, oh, sorry, these are, these are positions still. Now this is velocity. Uh, the same idea, the errors themselves are virtually the same as And same thing for the other uh, history. Now if we map those to orbital elements, starting with a semi-major axis, you can see the little if it's not little, but it's a, a noticeable uh, difference early on, but then they slowly converge, and, and you have to zoom in really far to see any any difference at all. This is now 10 to the minus 4, I think, 10 to the minus 4 uh, kilometers. And the angle's only case, too, it's very similar. Instagrams show the same thing, virtually identical, a tad bit of a Cartesian sticking out here at the end. More or less the same. Same can be said for the eccentricity. Qualitatively, the same for uh, inclination. And so now these are uh, probably hard to see, but they're average RMS errors uh, for each of the, the parameters we're estimating over all the other points. And these deltas here are the difference between the Cartesian uh, result and the Cartesian result. And they're extremely small. So on the order 10 to the minus 5 kilometers and the minus 7 kilometers per <coughs> second. Um, the largest one is in centimeter axis and that's only like 2 meters different. Same over here. It, it just provides 2.7 meters. Basically negligible. So now for case 2 with the extremely long propagation time. You can see the you know, covariance is, is rising noticeably in the errors, and then once the measurement starts coming in, they, they go back down, it's more reasonable. Uh, velocity plots show the same thing, but the point being that the Burdett adequately captures those errors in the, uh, in the uncertainty. When we map it back to uh, Cartesian and compare that to the actual Cartesian filter, we see that the uh, it, it's a vast outperformance. Really. Uh, Cartesian is bordering up failing for a lot of these cases. It's hard to see, maybe, but I guess that's not the point. Once that measurement comes in, even though for this propagation uh, time, uh, the errors seem to be within the bound, once that measurement comes in, they shoot up way into the ceiling. You can't even see them on the plot anymore, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to see anything. Uh, that's also not so much as the case for, as the, uh, for the end of one case. And uh, I'm not totally sure why. That's not the case for the, the So far, the, the Cartesian has seemed to increase in performance a bit when, uh, in this case, for the end, it's only in the new information, I'm not totally sure. But regardless, this this case drives uh, me And these are those same uh, CDF plots. Uh, it's it's kind of ridiculous. This is when the, uh, the Burdett starts to converge and reach full probability, and then it takes so much longer. So, so same over here. It's less uh, takes longer because there's less information <coughs> for the Burdett, but still same idea. Uh, these are the velocity plots, and again, this is the Cartesian going out and coming back down. It's still not even close to within uh, the three Same idea. Moving on to uh, <coughs> You see the same behavior. It, it spikes up and then starts to come back down once more measurements come in. But the Burdett estimate is, it never even approaches that kind of behavior. It's 
phase relatively small years throughout the world. Same sort of thing with the CDF plots. These interests see similar behavior, or the same inclination. Uh, the Burdett sort of loses out in inclination in the main case. That's pretty much the only uh, the only place that it loses in, in these test cases. <coughs> but over here, it's, again, it's so much over here. RMS errors show the same thing. The, the delta here is 21 kilometers. If the 21 kilometers uh, error here is 0.6. Uh, again, uh, Cartesian seems to, to do better when in the end is only case. But it's, like, overall, the Burdett is still one, which is the, the main idea. Here. So to wrap up, uh, we developed an extended column of focal formulation uh, in the Burdett coordinate system. Uh, we had constrained systems to account for the uh, excess state dimension, and then correct the time due to the, the transformation from the uh, independent variable. Uh, the performance difference between the Burdett filter and the Cartesian filter is uh, basically indistinguishable for the single pass case. But when long term uh, propagation times are involved, it's clear that uh, the Burdett needs to be And uh, in the future, you can apply this to single point filters, UKF, uh, time to content transform, uh, and also start to work on uh, different regularized ports. Lagrange molecular right? So okay, sure. it will automatically pick up which constraint is that is you know inactive and so on and so forth. Okay, I, I, I think I misunderstood the question. So, okay. yeah. so, so I think we'll take a fifteen minutes break. Yep. Uh, just a minute. Yep.
Beagles are like Beagles are and you should know. We should know. They're funded by the I 
sometimes we don't agree that it's just a more factual.
still be able to do her as you're passing by the planet. So that is also considered this was uh, So we try a multivariable optimization with particle swarm optimization, which you guys have heard a little bit today about from Mike's presentation at least. Um, so <coughs> all the planets that I modeled are elliptic and not coplanar. So I, I use uh, JPL provides its model to, to do all the optimization. I assumed link conics uh, <coughs> for the fact that this was a preliminary design tool. Um, and also, it, it goes into some of the dynamics as well that you have to kind of know the time of flight and the sphere of influence of each planet. Um, a detail that I won't go into in this presentation for sake of time. But, um, so, link conics is assumed. And we're using a good method to calculate each lambert trajectory in between. Um, and uh, I mentioned already that synergetic flyby is just a power gravity assist, the same thing. So just executing the maneuver as you're flying by at the very, very apps of the, of the planet that you're flying. So, looking <coughs> up on the platform, just brief review of what you heard earlier in heuristic, it's not a gradient based method. Um, a particle is basically something that, an array that contains all the parameters with which you're trying to optimize over. Uh, a swarm is a collection of these particles, so you can think of them as potential solutions to your optimization problem. And a cost function is defined in this problem as uh, a, just a, a simple addition of your launch cost. Each uh, synergetic uh, maneuver as you fly by the planet that you may or may not use, some of these may be zero, may not be very, very small. What's your arrival cost? to match the velocity of the planet and continue moving along with it. And any weights associated <coughs> with any, so we have a constraint that we'd like to stay above a, a planet periaps. So you want to do an idea of not getting planet rate. So that's what this is all about, is just taking into account that. Um, so the particles all update the velocities with these coefficients that are pretty well, well known in particle swarm research. So they're, they're kind of standard. And I used like a very vanilla part of the to do this. So it's very basic. Um, a, a little bit about a synergetic gravity assist if you're unfamiliar. Basically what happens <coughs> is you're uh, gonna go ahead and apply this maneuver, so you're changing the energy at the point. So what happens here is you come up with the equations where your magnitude, your hyperbolic excess velocity in and out is no longer uh <coughs> So you have to take into account that maneuver, and along the way for some of that math, you end up getting two expressions for the turn angle of your gravity assist. And one comes from geometry, and the other comes from orbital mechanics, and they have to agree for a solution to exist. So that's where this constraint equation comes from. And the, any solution that you have has to satisfy that constraint. So your orbital mechanics and your geometry have to agree and, and say, hey, it looks like the same flyby to me. And uh, you can go ahead and calculate that the, that the radius of periaps better agree as well, right? So uh, I think that qualitatively makes a lot of sense. Um, so we went ahead and picked some scenarios that there's no textbook answer to the multiple gravity assist problem. But the next best thing is we have some missions that actually did this, right? So uh, Voyager 1, Voyager 2 are uh, really good cases, and Cassini is another one that we looked at. And then I went ahead and played with it and designed my own for fun because it's a master's research, and that was kind of fun. So um, the Voyager test case, we take all of the dates that we know that Voyager actually flew at and compare them against what we get from the optimizer, the PSO. Um, remarkably, to my surprise, I didn't think it worked this well, but the <laughs> curves basically fall on top of one another. We have a slight difference in uh, the date of arrival here by like about one day, which if you think about it, is pretty cool. So that's not too bad. And uh, Voyager 1 was, it did not require a maneuver necessarily. There wasn't like a synergetic maneuver planned of any significance. So having a very small delta V is a good sign as well, right? So, um, yeah, the, the conclusion here is that, hey, we got a program that could run with 50 particles, which is pretty modest. 100 iterations is also kind of modest for particles more. 
and you can run this on a laptop computer in less than a minute, so that's pretty neat. Um, we went ahead and take, took it to Voyager 2, which has more variables with which you need to operate. <coughs> because you have introduced more planets with which you're flying by in between uh, departure and arrival. So what this looks like is, again, another solution that was very satisfying for me to see <coughs> that Particle Swarm was able to identify uh, the correct trajectory in a sense of we've seen Voyager 2 and what it actually moved. You would hope that uh, the trajectory would be pretty similar. We don't know for certain that it was optimal in any sense because nobody did any analysis at that moment. I don't think on that that I that I understood. But uh, it stands for reason that it would be a pretty good solution. So it's satisfying to see that giving this program full uh, authority over changing the dates on, like, pretty much, you have between the arrival date and the uh, launch date that you originally started at, flybys can happen at any time in between there, so there's really no constraints placed on that except inside of that window, which is a logical window if you think about it, right? Um, so that was pretty neat, and it runs, in this case, for uh, under 70, or, yeah, just under 80 seconds, so about a minute and a half, give or take, on whatever computer you got. Uh, I did it on a laptop, but, um, again, 50 particles, 100 iterations, and uh, it was, again, pretty neat. <coughs> and the two doesn't have any synergetic, significant synergetic maneuvers. So, again, the, the this is the Voyager 2 solution when I ran it through my, my propagator. <coughs> so the previous one, I guess I should clarify, this Voyager one is not necessarily real play data. This is using my same model, apples to apples. So just making sure that I'm not comparing against real data when I don't have all the force models and all that stuff. Right? But anywhere you see a real, that's an actual data point from a NASA publication on the, on the actual mission. So that was just to, to see if I could fall apart everything within kind of all the same distance. So that was a good sign as well. And uh, none of the none of the flybys intersect the planets, so that's also good. Um, so Cassini was a case where we went to uh, an inner planet and, and conducted some of this multiple gravity assist trajectory design. Because the other two were completely sort of out of planets, so we wanted to switch it up. Um, this one was a little bit more interesting in the sense that uh, it didn't go as perfectly. The, the ESO solution was pretty good, um, but the model trajectory, because of the assumptions I made about length lines and things like that, it's obviously not going to match, and you're going to get violations in some of these things because it will let you do trajectory correction maneuvers that are pretty serious, and they're not modeled in. In my model, right? and there's GCMs in this optimization procedure. Could add that in, in principle, but we did not. So, so and for fun, I, I did a question to Saturn that uh, we compared the three year mission and the four year mission with PSO here. And uh, it was kind of cool to see that it also could produce some, some interesting looking trajectories that seem reasonable. They, the three and four year mission was just. Uh, like if I did a PhD right when I graduated and I did it three years versus four years. So it's just like an anecdotal kind of fun thing to play around with. So in the time that it would take me to get a PhD, I, the spacecraft could make it to that. So that's kind of an interesting thing to think about. Um, and we, the only thing you have to compare in this case is the direct solution, which is pretty, pretty crappy, uh, which makes sense because you have to have the correct alignment. Taking a direct route is not necessarily going to not at all going to be the best solution in this case. <coughs> so that's pretty much what's captured here. And uh, again, you can like run this tool in about a minute on, on a laptop computer. So that was kind of the aim. It has to be something fairly basic that you can obtain a result really quickly. Somebody can design something. You can go back and forth on dates, play with it. And then you can go ahead and feed that into like a, a much higher fidelity tool as an initial test <coughs> for a much more robust optimal Problem. Formulation. <coughs> I just think the hybrid is Great, 
So conclusions uh, about this work. The particle swarm optimization seemed to work pretty well for the multiple gravity problem that I laid out. Now, that problem has many different levels of detail to it, so you could add much more complexity by adding more variables. But as you add more variables, particle swarm in general tends to behave a little bit less uh, favorably. <coughs> so that's something to keep in mind. But the future work all kind of lies on either adding a little bit more detail to the modeling or adding more variables to the optimization. So uh, this is kind of what I'm looking at doing potentially in the future to try to push this thing towards the journal paper instead of just a conference paper that I just presented. So uh, any any critiques or any comments that you guys have, um, I'd be welcome to hear, especially a couple of the very experienced <laughs> trajectory designers in the room. So thanks for listening. Uh, that's it. So. It's true that you don't actually have to initialize the particle swarm with any gas, right? So you're not yeah. like feeding it. Like you tell it what space it's allowed to live within. Okay. But I was, just, I was wondering if yeah. you were like giving it a gas that's like close to the void. Yeah. That no, that's the, actually the beauty okay. of it is that you go in and say, I'm in a blind room and I know absolutely nothing. Just rapid fire shotguns to points and then let them converge and play around with each other and interact and tell each other what works and what doesn't. And that's kind of one of the fascinating parts of PSO in my mind, why I think it's kind of interesting that it actually works um, to some extent on these rather complex problems of aerospace engineering. So you probably found this out, unfortunately, if you see any kind of stuff you're solved up with failure. Yeah. Has that come over here? Yeah, the TCM. Yeah, it's just, yeah. it completely Well, changed. after I did it, I'm like, go ahead, that makes a lot of sense. You know, yeah. And then model that and don't. But then it gave me an appreciation for the fact that when you do design something like that, you really do have to have to pay attention to the resonance of those inner planets and get that right. Yeah. Because of that same reason, like, otherwise you didn't have it. So. And then just sort of a follow on um, one mm -hmm. of the things that we play with every once in a while, you might want to think about. As far as the combinatorial search goes, back in the 90s, one of us came up with this kisser and graph method of finding yeah. these combinations. However, phasing, phasing the planets was ignored, but yeah. it energetically would tell you that, yeah, if I have this combination, I can get, I can go work on a bunch of these. It would be interesting to attack that one. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I definitely, I remember reading this paper and having that same conclusion that this is interesting work, like, it's pretty, it's a really cool way of looking at it, but it has no no comment at all on like the base part. Right. And yeah. And doesn't solve that. Right. Right. Yeah. So it could be a good combination. Any other questions?
You might want to escape and do control L. Control uh, L. This 
state a term governs the attractiveness of the case, the distance, uh, the list of uh, an associated minimum attractiveness that each firefly has to each other, and uh, the levy fly is just from the type distribution I showed earlier. So this, is, this would be called the levy firefly algorithm. You could also just, in a regular firefly, which Yang published, um, you would use a, a uniform random distribution or a, or a Gaussian distribution to govern this distance of state set. Um, as far as its performance goes, uh, initially I'll just be showing you some examples of minimizing this function here. It's called an active function. It's uh, extendable to as many dimensions as you want. Uh, and it's got a, a single global minimum and an infinite number of local minima and maxima. Uh, so here's a piece of the active function. Um, so in the black, I have some particles from particle formal optimization. And in the red, there are some butterflies. And this is after uh, the initialization step, 10 iterations, 50 iterations, and 100 iterations. And so both algorithms are pretty capable of finding the minimum of this algorithm. A few so laying out uh, a little bit here uh, in terms of uh, iterations you want to get there. Uh, for, for higher dimensional cases, though, um, so in these two graphs, I have the, the function evaluation uh, for a 16 dimensional actually function. And the uh, black curve is just the regular firefly algorithm without any levy flight included. And the blue line is the PSL, and the red line is the uh, levy firefly algorithm. And so for the first sort of 200 iterations, the levy flight, uh, so the PSL does quite well. But it bottoms out along with uh, the firefly around 200 iterations. But uh, using levy flights, we're able to significantly drive that minimum down um, in a 16 dimensional case. And this is a table here showing the, the function value following 1,000 iterations of these algorithms for two up to 64 uh, parameters, which we're trying to uh, minimize. <coughs> the levy flight uh, generally does better than uh, either algorithm in, in every case, with the exception of the lower dimensional case of this one I just put um, So um, I'll now sort of discuss a few different uh, more textbook optimization problems where we've had some success applying this algorithm to. So this is uh, Zermelo's problem. Uh, it's a navigational problem which uh, deals with the minimum time for uh, a ship to move uh, between two points under some sort of um, wind field. This is the analytical solution to this problem here, which I took from Bryson and how and these are the, um, the optimal costs that they gave and the best initial lambdas that they found. Um, and we're, we're moving between these two states. These states are described. Uh, so as far as results go, um, here are the contours of this function in the lambda 1 and lambda 2 space, uh, or lambda x, lambda y. Uh, the color axis indicates the value of the objective function. And this light point here is the analytical solution. So again, an initialization, 10 iterations, 50 iterations, and 100 iterations. <coughs> both algorithms are pretty uh, good at converging onto the analytical solution. But again, the particle swarm does a bit better in this case. Uh, some more detailed results uh, from Monte Carlo um, and, and extending 500 iterations. The levy flight algorithm is capable of getting pretty much dead on with the analytical uh, lambdas. Uh, and Produces, reproduces within 0.2% the annual cost function. Um, and if you would take these lambdas and put them into like a shooting method, other than which I did here, you get basically onto the exact analytical solution within about, uh, I think, about seven iterations of um, that algorithm. And so you're generating quite a good initial guess for these solvers um, to pass this which, uh, your initial lambdas into. Uh, the trajectories that you get. Um, the Levy Firefly, this is the ones that come down in the, uh, the actual trajectory, uh, are identical to the analytical solution with the residuals being quite small. Uh, the Levy Firefly, uh, the actual Firefly algorithm without any Levy Fly does a, a terrible job of showing that, getting that analytical solution. About 90% of the time, it gets within about a, a norm of 0 0.1 in the lambda 2, lambda 1, lambda 2 space of the analytical solution. So it would still serve as a reasonable initial guess for plugging into a solver, but um, initially at least you get a fairly diverging trajectory to just want to end your residuals to the analytical solution are quite large. Uh, the PSO, as you'd expect, also does quite well uh, with, with very small errors uh, compared to the uh, analytical solution. 
explore a, uh, a more complicated problem with uh, a few more lambdas, <coughs> I guess, and this is a thrust orbital transfer, so a constant uh, plane of thrust uh, A, which um, in these units we're using A of 100, and a control parameter beta, which controls the thrust angle. Um, and we're minimizing the uh, kinetic and potential energy uh, at a final time. So uh, I took another solution from Bryson and Howe with these uh, initial and final states and a fixed final time of 50 time units. And uh, the, the, the optimal cost that they give is shown here. Um, so this type of guess is for lambda, so I can't obviously visualize that for you. But the uh, trajectory you get is um, in, in pretty much perfect agreement for, uh, for both solutions. Uh, for the lambdas that we uh, guess we can really like, and the cost functions uh, without passing them through any other uh, solver um, to reduce their uh, pretty much dead on the analytical solution. I mean, you'll notice the lambdas are quite different, but there, there isn't any unique set of lambdas that solves this problem. It's more um, the ratios internally, uh, as long as these, these ratios are similar, you'll get solutions that uh, reproduce this cost function. And the errors between the final state are, are certainly quite small, that you can just put this into a provocation kind of as an initial guess or into a shooting method or some other uh, solving process, and you would, you would arrive at the uh, solution and the optimal cost of process. Um, here you can see the <coughs> fundamental pollution of the lambdas, and, and you know, there's some pretty big similarities between these two uh, for the, the different methods. Uh, the, the evolution is, is identical minus uh, small changes in amplitude. Um, uh, I, don't really, I haven't been able, been able to do it in Monte Carlo for this uh, yet, it's still running. Um, so I don't have any indication of what the error or uh, indeed like the, the variation on what lambdas you get with having different lambdas. Uh, the solution, but both algorithms, at least at this stage, seem to be performing uh, quite well for uh, generating initial guesses. Um, and so I think uh, I've shown here, at least with some preliminary results, that the levy firefight algorithm is at least as good as PSO at generating initial guesses for these uh, optimal control problems uh, for the lenders. Um, but I think it, it would be necessary to explore some higher dimensional cases and more complicated optimal control parameters. This is something I didn't really talk about too much here, actually, but uh, it would be good to examine how many fireflies you actually need. I use for all these problems to take fireflies and um, 10 times the dimension for the number of particles, so 40 in the second problem and 20 in the first problem for the particle swarm. Uh, I found that eight fireflies are pretty capable of solving um, most of the problems that I've done so far. But then there's also the these parameters which govern the uh, scale of the problem and uh, the randomness and uh, minimum attractiveness of each part, which uh, should probably be explored. Um, thank you. Yeah. Whether you say a 
So the first thing why we want you why we want to look at this topic. So here's two photos that I want to share with everyone. Captured very early this year. Uh, it was captured by the uh, Chunker number four uh, together with Lunar Lander uh, Unit Two, which means the Jade Rapid. Um, this is the first time human successfully landed on the dark side of the moon. So um, I'm really, really happy that the human uh, achieved such a thing. Aside from China's project, U.S. of course their uh, a project Apollo, which is very fancy, and also ESA has their smart one, Genesis Calpia, in India's um, lunar project Chandrayaan one, uh, number one and number two, and even Israel and Luxembourg has their own lunar project. Actually, I'm a little surprised that Luxembourg has a, has a lunar mission. Um, it is very beyond my expectation. So, a lot of countries have their interest on the moon itself. So, as you can see, the moon is a very hot topic itself. Aside from that, the halo orbit around Earth is <coughs> reserved for a potential bus station for the future exploration to the other planet in the solar system. Uh, the lunar gate play is not example um, by NASA and which served as a realization for our <coughs> exploration to Mars, to Phobos, and to the near Earth asteroids. So that is then why uh, why we want to um, move our focus, uh, move our research focus uh, on the lunar uh, halo orbit. So um, all the thing about background theory, this is uh, this is a feature that very common on um, all the astrodynamic textbook. You have uh, Earth as a primary, uh, primary. you have the Moon uh, as an here and the Moon as a secondary, and you have satellite here, there, We derive everything based on the restricted body problem, and uh, this is uh, and it, this is our rotation frame and the X Y Z frame. So everyone is already pretty familiar with this part. And uh, the first step of our research is to generate a very accurate halo orbit. So in order to get, uh, to get those cells of the halo orbit, we have a three level of optimization. The first one is trying to give a analytic, analytic approximation with very low fidelity, and we use that as a inner gas and roll them into particle small optimization. So uh, after the particle swarm, we got some halo orbit with its accuracy around 10 to the minus 6 to 10 to the minus 8. And after that, we uh, we use that as another initial gas and uh, for the differential correction. So finally, we got this speaker, the halo orbit, with very high accuracy, with uh, <coughs> consistency, with 10 to the minus 12 to the 10 to the minus 3, uh, minus 13 which we're very satisfied for this result. Uh, after we have those halo orbits, our next step is trying to develop a transfer strategy from Earth to the Moon. So our first strategy is what we call direct transfer, it's which, which literally means just we apply two impassable number from, the, from here, the, uh, the Earth Leo, uh, to one of the halo orbits. So as you can see, the green trajectory is our transfer orbit, and uh, uh, based on <coughs> based on our result, the time of flight is almost five to six days. However, the the, the velocity propellant consumption is, for most cases, is bigger than four kilometers per second. That's our first strategy. Um, the second one is we try to combine the impact of the together with the stable manifold. It's still again that we starting from here, the Earth's Leo, and try to uh, and try to transfer along this green trajectory and around back here, which is the closest point of the moon, and we apply another impact maneuver here to try to make our satellite into one of the safe manifolds uh, of the halo orbit. And after this phase, the satellite goes into one of the stable uh, stable manifold and slowly into our target halo orbit. And for this strategy, most of the transfer take one of 20 days. However, our 
per pound of consumption is smaller than 14 meters per second. And so here to figure that how we um, generate the segment flow for one of our hail orbits and the UR satellite in departing from Earth and into and of the stable method here, which give, a lot, give us a lot of options for a lunar insertion. So, <coughs> when it comes to our object design, um, at the very beginning, we design our methodology that only um, the, Leo, uh, the altitude of the Leo and the, the amplitude of our halo orbit as the parameter that we choose um, by ourselves. <coughs> then, uh, those parameters will go into our algorithm, uh, depending on which, uh, which strategy that you use. You can use either, say, uh, either medical transfer or direct transfer. And here, um, we use an um, optimization, uh, optimization algorithm called Blackboard algorithm to try to optimize uh, the transfer to achieve a uh, minimum power consumption uh, transfer. And uh, uh, for Two different, uh, two different transfer strategies. We have different, different uh, object, objective function to act, evaluate the performance of the, such transfer, and the algorithm will keep it waiting until we find an optimal transfer. So next phase, I will give a very short, brief introduction about the Bywork algorithm. Uh, just like the particles more, the flyword algorithm is that you initially um, generate a lot of red gas in the lava search space. And uh, those uh, those gas red gas will keep evolved until uh, optimal solution has been found. Uh, has been found, uh, found. And uh, instead of using the information uh, from gradients, uh, the heuristic optimization uh, is more like to use the information of the whole population. So that's basically how the heuristic optimization works. And the difference between the five word and particles one and other heuristic optimization is that here we have um, a whole five work, which is always uh, the one with the best fittest value. And while the other one, we call it non whole five work. And each file work, we have two parameters to define, uh, which is the uh, explosion amplitude and the number of the generated sparks. Once those file work, uh, once the finished value of those file work has been evaluated, uh, an operator called explosion will be uh, will be initiated, and uh, the file uh, the file work with the best finished value will have a uh, Rather small amplitude, but many, many generated sparks, which allow the best one to perform local search. While the other non by work, there are generated sparks, the number of generated sparks is relatively slow, but it has a very large amplitude, which allows those non by work to play local search. So the uh, so the, the advantage of the by work algorithm is that during the whole uh, you know, uh, during the whole search, there's always some white work keep global, keep you the keep you the global search, which prevents the whole population getting to some local extreme at that very early stage. And also, we have an independent selection, uh, which means uh, for the white work <coughs> the next iteration. Um, the only the five work with its own generated form are categorized in the same group, and uh, the back uh, and the one with the best fitting value will be selected as the five work for the next iteration. Also, we have a private avoidance operator here, uh, which means if one of the non whole five work is too close to the whole five work, it will be initiated, uh, in reinitiated in the whole space, which. Um, which give enough resource for the global search. So the result, um, for the direct transfer, we investigate all the transfer, uh, uh, all the transfer uh, targeted from the uh, halo orbit with the amplitude from the 1,000 kilometer 
to the 70,000 kilometer. And uh, as you can see here, is the uh, total the total wind change required to finish the transfer. Um, <coughs> the direct transfer, as we as I mentioned before, they're mostly about 4 kilometers per second. But the time of flight, you can see here, is only around the six, six days. That's for the direct transfer. Um, for the manifold transfer, um, the total that will be uh, for the low, uh, for the low Z amplitude over here, we can find a very good, a very good result here. As your Z amplitude increase, um, the most, the best result is around four kilometers, but uh, there is some part which is bad. Uh, that, that is mainly because the final algorithm points uh, finds a local, uh, uh, local optimal solution there. Uh, and uh, also our time flight, <coughs> the distribution of the time flight is based around point A's. And we also compare uh, our performance uh, between the bundle algorithm and particle swarm. So here is the figure uh, that we investigate. Uh, we investigate a major comparison between the <coughs> algorithm and PSO with different halo orbits. And you can see there's only two cases where the particle swarm is able to uh, beat the bundle algorithm, uh, while in most case, by what are we the find that solution? And uh, here is an example uh, of the progression of the best base value. Um, the blue one is particle small. It can find a kind of local uh, automatically that at the very early stage, uh, the fiber algorithm is, uh, is relatively bad at the beginning, but at the late stage, um, the fiber algorithm can actually find and we also compare our results with some of the very known literature, and uh, which, and you can see here, this is the this is the solution that we got, and uh, those <coughs> are the solution get by the other literature, you know, and we can see we find a solution while the total that we is very close to those literature, which proved that, that our methodology has work, that actually works. And uh, yeah, this is another comparison for the dark transfer. And you can see the total, the to, uh, the total to be the great cost. So uh, let's make some conclusion. Uh, the first one is that we developed such a methodology to investigate System the transfer in a very efficient way. We only need to change the radius of the halo and the halo orbit. And, and everything else, we can just leave that to our algorithm and without any initial gas. So it's very efficient. And we also investigate those direct and natural transfer. And so we can do a trade off. Which one is better uh, based on the specific mission requirements? And finally, we compare our results with those cases in the literature and prove that our methodology is reliable. Some of the possible improvements. One of the things is refined search base. Uh, in our current uh, in our current research, we define search base is kind of large because we don't want to it, it, exclude some of the solution. But since we have, uh, we already have some result there, it give us some insights what could the possible solution be. So we can base on those results to <coughs> refine the search phase and uh, rerun those cases and try to find out a better solution. And also, um, more rounds for me. <coughs> Also, for for optimization problems, it is always true that we want to invest more computational resources, more iteration number, more particle, uh, more file work, uh, invest there to find a better solution. As long as we have enough computational resources to do that, of course, that's 
That's not actually half that. So that's possible uh, possible improvement that we need to make to get that solution. And we already have this methodology. What we want to do in the future is try to build a comprehensive that will be roadmap for the transfer. Because um, the lunar mission would be a very hot topic in the future, and there would be a lot of mission based on different Leo, uh, different uh, different Leo orbit, and we want to go to the different uh, different Halo orbit. So how to um, if, uh, how we have such a DLB estimation uh, for the preliminary mission design? This is something <coughs> this is something no one done before, and uh, Dolly and I come to this idea, uh, and we have such a methodology. And maybe in the future we can investigate all the possible combinations of this different Leo, uh, different Lagrange points, and uh, also different pale orbit for each one of the points. And uh, that's something we wish to do in the future based on this research. So that's all I want to give today. And uh, questions? You had mentioned the dark side of the moon, which is a song, and I think you meant the far side of the moon, meaning the side opposite. Uh, there's not a visible from our
uh, you know, see where we are going with uh, what we are doing uh, in national average today. It has illustrious past, as Professor Jenkins mentioned. Uh, we want to see uh, how, how things go in, in the future. The first question I want to ask if, uh, everyone is that uh, we teach and you listen and struggle through a lot of math. <laughs> So, so, and the modeling part of it. So, uh, the question I want to ask is, uh, what is the role of uh, classical methods of astrodynamics, the analytical methods of astrodynamics, in this uh, increasingly popular world of uh, machines teaching us what to do? Um, I, I want to ask, you know, where we are going with uh, all the analysis and tools that we are developing. And I think that's a really important question. Um, yeah. My, pers my personal answer is that analysis is really important and uh, if we actually are losing the ability to do good analysis because of computers, uh, and that's a, that's an efficiency. For example, um, we, the, the most in interesting and important thing we are losing nowadays is patience. Uh, we want an answer, we go to the computer and, and run some numbers and get, get, an, get an answer. Uh, but uh, at the same time, I, I appreciate the need for that. That's an important we need, we need answers uh, immediately as to what happens to the particle that's, uh, that's going to collide or not, uh, and, and so on and so forth. But, uh, but there's a dichotomy in, in getting a speedy solution and getting a, getting a solution that, uh, that does some work for it. So in, in that light, I think there's, a, there's actually especially a tremendous need now uh, for you know, for better analysis and looking at the same problem and same dynamics in, from multiple vantage points, different coordinate systems, uh, like we did in one of the uh, papers today, for example. So I think there is a, a strong need uh, for that, and, and uh, I want to specifically point out to Dr. Junkie's paper when he first uh, did uh, analysis. And I reduced the problem for a little bit and then went to the computer. So, John, I'd like to uh, listen to your view on this question. Where, uh, when, do, when, do, when should we stop analyzing things and when do we start computing? Uh, uh, that's, a bit, that's, a, that's an impossible question to answer. It's a problem specific question to answer, I'm sure. But uh, um, what, what, when do we stop learning esoteric stuff? Just for the sake of math, I think that's another way to put the same question. Well, no question. I'm not in the best point. Assume a point over here where we are, but I'm not going to crank your next question. I think maybe a, an implicit question, not exactly the one you asked, is. Uh, what are we teaching? Yeah. And that's on U of E. Yes. And, uh, I think the, uh, the fact that we've got a lot of code, we've got SPK, and we've got MAL code, and we've got all kinds of optimization codes uh, out there, and we have a lot of new way things, new as in uh, <coughs> 15 years, that are fusion of machine learning, neural nets, and, and particle swarms, and all the uh, learning-based uh, methods that apply to things other than astronomics, and certainly applied astronomics. What's the balance? What's the balance? And we just at uh, SciTech, up on a panel uh, with uh, about an 80 people, uh, that's, uh, supposed to be very old guys, but uh, you know, we can write the person's name out of it, but the uh, person from Stanford uh, announced that um, he was teaching uh, machine learning and it's a joint course between aerospace and computer science. And almost overnight, 80 or 90 percent of the graduate students in computer science, aerospace, uh, or aeronautics, that's not a standard. 
swarming, particles swarming this course. Uh, and he had a teaching the biggest auditorium available and have distance learning to the other rooms on campus just to meet the demand. It's, a, uh, it's not healthy. And I, in a sense, that uh, it worries me. Not that it's not an important topic, <coughs> but it were to assume that level of uh, centrality and as our place engineers and as astronomers, we need to spend a good bit of time on fundamentals. I try to learn very well position. I can understand the rule of I understand the simulated meeting and many other particle based methods. I think they're for us. They're not a replacement.
Max Gross as they get into the nitty gritty of design. And so they run this through their super does it all program, at which, and they get a, a delta B for the this interplanetary mission that increased by 1.5% just due to that NM light. The only way I understand from a physical sense that that could happen is if you have a power flyby, real close, low gravity, well, a significant delta B or an orbit insertion where you've got significant gravity loss and you've got a much different mass. Uh, and you know, that can affect your delta B of the gravity loss. And so I'm watching this email change. I'm going, okay, I'm going to see if they figure this out. Uh, and, and they were, the initial reaction to two PhDs was, well, this is surprising, but the program is, we're both getting the same result with the program. Kind of like, uh, something's wrong. And, and, it, and anyway, they finally traced it down, and um, they said, oh, well, we they ha didn't change their launch vehicle model, so they forced, without realizing it, a different seat, launch seat rate. So they were constraining the launch to match the capability of the launch vehicle at the higher, you know, the, what, what can the launch vehicle deliver uh, into orbit? Well, it changed the C3 and then they fundamentally changed the whole problem and came up with this one and a half percent difference, which is probably the right solution for that constrained launch. But here they are with this super amazing program that they're trusting in and they get this different result and like, how can they think how can this be? And then they start thinking, well, it must be because of it. they're justifying. So the warning is don't blindly trust a result. <coughs> and then try to think of how uh, to justify a bad result. Does this back up for yes. you? Yes. Yeah, so then this happened, and uh, they finally figured it out without having to be lectured by me or whoever else was watching the duo was going on. So be careful. You know, understand the physical what's going on. Let me, uh, let me give you a, an example from the real life, and it's in the context of what we've seen here. And in 1981, I was in Solomon, and John Hopkins, and I was And Harold Black, a really bright guy that I thought was the head of the State Department. And this is pre GPS, and Navy Navigation Satellite System was about to put an updated uh, satellite, and they had been. <coughs> there was a sequence of the uh, called foundation satellites to reach the GPS, uh, and they had been doing magnetic attitude movements. This satellite was, uh, uh, it, had a, it had a thruster motor on it, it was a big deal of final kick or it, or it, and this kind of cylindrical satellite with four bat wings of uh, solar panels, uh, and the quad motor, it was spinning about its largest axis of inertia. And along that same axis, they had a coil for electrobiting. And the current would either run positively or negatively. And based upon prior experience, they knew there were about four switches per orbit that the Earth was rotating and carrying some magnetic field with it. And it turns out in this year, we were using a fourth order spherical harmonic expansion to approximate the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, a little bit, but anyway, the cross product of the spacecraft dipole and the local uh, Earth magnetic field generates a torque that wants to align uh, the spacecraft thin axis with local north as seen by the ma local magnetic field. But the Earth is carrying that with it, and you're flying through the orbit, and your attitude is changing. So it's a really exciting problem. But based on prior discussions and prior experiences, they knew that it was usually about four switches per orbit because they had been running a big numerical optimization code to solve this problem. However, they only had one tracking station, which is a APL strength, but our AF APL by this side of the strength, and it was in Laurel, Maryland, the APL. And the satellite came over the horizon and it was visible for about 12 minutes, roughly. 
looking down the attitude data, the attitude is spending about hanging on back to this position, and they want to go to this position, maybe seven, ten hours later. But they want to upload the commands before it passes over the last, I mean, that is how not the control problem is going to quit. Okay, the traditional method, and they knew there was something wrong with it, but it didn't always give the result, was to guess four switches per orbit. Where you change the sign and put plus one minus one and iterate a nonlinear programming problem that they call machine learning. But so basically, they guess that there will be four switches per orbit and it's going to take about five or six orbits. So there's going to be some pretty sized double digit number, maybe 30, 40 switches. Uh, and the switch times are unknown. But you guess four per orbit. And the switch times start moving around and you either get the final. Attitude or not, if you can't reach the final attitude, it's okay, let's go up another orbit down another four unknowns. Okay, so they're entering 40 or 50 unknowns, and most of the time they couldn't solve the problem for that spacecraft over the horizon to upload the uh, commands. The real, real time to solve the problem was longer than the window they had to do it. I took that problem home with me. and control the cloud work that was given to me a couple years later because I came up with, uh, with based on dynamics inside fused throughout the control theory, I came up with a solution that reduced it to a one variable scalar search. One variable boundary. Like an angle variable, zero to five. How'd I do that? Well, first of all, the spacecraft had a damper on board, and the damping time constant is spinning about its uh, largest axis of curvature. And if it was tweaked off of it, and, and the damper was itself was dissipating energy, then the spacecraft would spiral and go spin about its angle of vector again with a time constant of about one to two minutes. The maneuver time was at tens of hours. Maybe a torque is pretty small, but you want to do a big torque and long torque and pound, and you're causing somehow the spacecraft to slowly reorient this thing. So the first thing I did is that this is really a two time constant problem. The fast time is damping, and I've got the slow time, how am I going to go from this part of the sky to that part of the sky to be 20, 30, 40, and 50 degree maneuver? That's going to take a long time. And I said, well, wait a minute, I don't care about rotation, about the axis of the center, you know, the reason I'm reorienting is the only part of the cluster that does the orbit. And I said, so I really don't care about rules, I only got two attitude degrees of freedom to worry about. And then the light bulb went off. And I said, holy oh, smoke, I'm talking about very small cone angles, it's just last time. Torque equals each dot. All I have to do is reorient the vector, the angular momentum vector, to get the space right. I'll let that thing catch up with it. Stay close to it, really move it. So that reduced it literally to a two degree of freedom problem, two angles oriented to the moon. And this approximations is all I'm just to turn and go read it for a few minutes, not funny. But I ended up with two. Scalar vector difference equation that was a gyroscopic precession rate of angular momentum. And when I applied a minimum time law, I had one that wrote time to the minimum time, now this approximate problem. Then I got two post dates. I like the question that I mentioned earlier is minimum time problem. So I'm free to scale the co states, all infinity of co states. Uh, a scalar factor time zone will produce a solution. So I made them on a unit circle of time zero, and the angle, the phase angle on that circle became my sole unknown. And when I got the optimal switch history, I ran out of the sound in parallel with it, and it was graphically almost the same. It was better than my normal analysis problem here. And would run in about one and a half minutes even the machine for that day, I can solve, solve this, this two more five problem with the one variable search. We have loaded commands. 
we have something called Tektronix Terminal that you guys don't know anything about, but it was a green phosphorus screen. And I had on there the gyroscopic precession cusps of the maneuver. And the data was coming down and I couldn't see anything. And all of a sudden I realized that there was a dot tracing absolutely on top of my, my curve of my gyroscopic precession precession definition. thing is, when the analysis, insight, computation come together, that's that's really the way you know you're a little man. You own the model, you own the physics, and you make something happen. And a person that just grabs that 12th order nonlinear set of differential equations, which puts the states and cosines together, and then goes and starts iterating, I don't care how good your particle swarm method is, uh, even a deep food that can compete for this, even today we can do it. We saw the phenomenon. I thought it was just trying to do it as a group as well. But I think this this is the kind of thing I'm trying to get at. It's almost religious. And it's our fault that we aren't doing it right and we need to do it better. Religion, the pastor, religious aspect of uh, astrodynamics. <coughs> Really, really important. And it's, a, it's, it's, it's a calling. It's absolutely a calling. Because these physics are here forever. We're going to be flying things forever. And if we turn into machine learners, and that's all the really deep learning. I, I call some of this, even though I respect what it's all about, I call some of it deeply superficial learning. If you aren't learning the mechanics of the limit, and the kind of passion of the owner of the mechanics, it's a coupling between all these computational tools and understanding that the mechanics will power us. That I think is a, it's not the EOR, it's both foundational things, really, are the interrogation of the empirical results based on the limit. That's what I'm thinking, because of what is happening and what is the, the fundamental root of the difficulty. So, following up on that uh, Clementine uh, experience that John articulated, I think uh, we are uh, the next question I want to ask is about uh, trajectory optimization and you know all the mission design uh, directions that we want to head towards. Uh, so, the next, what are what are the important trajectory optimization problems, and how do we solve them? The next uh, question that I want to ask. And uh, I want to preface that discussion by saying that um, we are getting powerful computers and we want to make use of them. Of uh, I think uh, we, we, uh, we are at, the, at a very uh, interesting place in, in time when really a lot of uh, uh, expensive computations can be performed even on cell phones as well. So I see trajectory optimization to be important and we should be able to implement the, some of the methods that you are implementing on single board computers and several uh, other embedded systems and co-processors uh, going forward with time. Uh, but but uh, I, want to, I want to basically uh, take that and, and give you another experience uh, that we did at JPL went through recently as an example. So uh, they have this awesome power of all these trajectory optimization tools. And uh, because in the system that uh, is the Dawn mission, if you, if you have some time, uh, look up the Dawn mission, recent Dawn mission, um, <coughs> there they, the, they had to, because of the actuator uncertainty, there's a subsystem in there, you command in your trajectory optimization tool, it gives you some thrusts, and you apply some thrusts, uh, and the application is not correct, and that follows along uh, Pradeepo's presentation. Uh, Dr. Gorge talked about uh, how you know there's, there's, a, there's an aspect of what gets actually applied as a force is not what your optimization algorithm provides. So because of that, uh, Dawn mission had to reprogram the optimal trajectory 
about 200 times, um, so, so to speak. And that's that, that's basically an, uh, another aspect of it. If we, uh, the next generation quality optimization tools, and I would be really glad to see uh, Pradeepa's presentation today, should be also cognizant of other elements that are there. So we can't just uh, put a blindness on and solve you know, ready to my ring problem because your, your solution will feed something else uh, uh, next to uh, and, and, uh, and that brings us back into, you know, feedback control problems, right? So if the, the op predatory optimization is only one side of the point. It only gives you a nominal solution. And the real way to implement it is to use sense data and uh, feedback, you know, what where you're supposed to go. Uh, and th that's the other side of it. And so that's, uh, I think, in the next generation trilogy optimization should include, you know, uh, performance of the actuator in the in the loop, uh, if you will, and provide a family of solutions as opposed to a single solution. And of course, that has to handshake with what the actuator design uh, goes. So, it, so astrodynamics, I think, uh, this aspect, especially actuation, <coughs> is the control part of it shouldn't be a siloed approach. You should, the trajectory optimization should be aware of other things that, uh, that you contribute to. Of course, you're solving the exotic uh, algorithms to get, uh, get, get fast solutions all the time. Uh, so uh, in that aspect, uh, Pradeep, uh, as our representative, who we'll talked about that physical problem, do you have anything to add? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I agree. So then solving, uh, um, you know, if you, if you the models get more complex and you are trying to solve, you know, perhaps an optimal feedback control problem. So uh, do you have to take advantage of some of the <laughs> some of the some of the some of the algorithmic machine learning, numeric, pure, uh, you know, that sort of an approach? So if you you add complexity, uh, you're, you're, I mean, from the jumping to you know, kind of uh, starting back to that. So how do we approach that? So do we uh, start with a you know, analytical model uh, for which you know, we have insights. And then when we move on to uh, more complex uh, realistic uh, models, uh, so basically do you think that, that, that translation is smooth? Uh, like what Monarangian is saying, so we have an optimal control problem, the user optimization problem involving <coughs> a very complex models for us with actuators and sensors and other factors. Uh, do you think there in, in, that, uh, in that field, uh, Machine learning and pure numerics several sort of uh, approaches have value. I guess it may be, and we'll, we'll see. And I think there's like that there is. I think <coughs> I to paraphrase uh, maybe a little bit of what, what you guys are saying, uh, or maybe add to it, is um, you know their uh, uh, trajectory optimization and large set attitude maneuvers really belong to a set of control theory, which I call uh, uh, open loop. Uh, Trajectory yeah. design, where you're doing a, a large flat path design. Yeah. Uh, the other half of the equation is, is uh, that which is obviously important in aircraft control and in uh, robotics and other fields, is uh, the very fast time scale feedback control based yeah. yeah. on real time sensing. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that aspect has been uh, perhaps underutilized in the kind of deep space the dome mission. Uh, you can't exactly do feedback because the round trip time of the line is not exactly the ground. Uh, and by the time you get a real time of feedback command, uh, and if you want to generate the distance of this craft, it's a few minutes or hours old, depending upon uh, how far how deep it is. So, feedback control, except for attitude stabilization, uh, is not very prevalent, especially in deep space missions. The point uh, Maji is making is that. Uh, uh, grace class acceleration measurements and uh, precision attitude uh, are available on board. Uh, if we have the ability to throttle and we do a low thrust engine, I think we're missing half the equation. We can do feedback control in real time based on onboard sensing because we aren't realizing the commanded acceleration, but we're measuring the actual acceleration. If we, if, if we can measure that without bias and low noise,
plus times the development mission. So this is an element that uh, <coughs> you know, aerospace engineering in general is a very routine thing. These are aircraft that you're wanting to know for all the time. You've got control. And it, it's always been there for energy control because you don't want to tumble. Um, we can't wait for a trip line on attitude, but with the trajectory, we're close enough that things are going on merely you can get a fix and make an adjustment. But it's obvious when you have to do 200 replants that uh, there's room for improvement. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so I think the uh, I think there's a, there's a there's a gap there, and, it, and, it's, and it's really relies on really the, the deep space tracking network is of such precision that we none of the routine accelerometers that are available historically. Uh, the IMUs that are available, the they, they, they biases are so bad that it gives you a lot of drift uh, between uh, the energy and the So it poses some problems on projected control. But hey, those things are changing. The state of the art in instrumentation and sensing is changing. And therefore, we need to look at those problems. There's, a, there's a lot there. I think that's what you're right there. That's exactly what I right. And I agree with that. Uh, that's another. Aspect. So the open loop projector optimization is a big deal, and it will always be a big deal. It's a highly number of your problems with possible extreme money. We need all the help we can get. Uh, but as I said, there's a, in all cases, we really want to maintain as, as aerospace engineers, our foundation needs to be dynamics, mechanics. And that foundation, if it's weak, we get a bad situation. I, I want to share something with you. I, I, I quote uh, one of the early people in neural networks. Uh, I think he has the most cited paper of neural networks is uh, Bob Narendra at Yale. And uh, Mike and I worked with one of his birthday parties a couple of years ago. And uh, his, uh, his neural network paper written in the 60s has uh, 38,000 citations. Uh, and, uh, and he said that paper is uh, more than uh, about power 10 than all my other papers. Fine. But I wake up some mornings in a cold sweat wishing I could uncover it. And I said, why's that? I said, well, especially for the first couple of decades after that paper was produced, uh, some really stupid things came out of the real networks that, uh, you know, that essentially failed in lots of spectacular ways. And he said, and, and it's well, because it was a black box, he beat his measurements until it like, uh, until the other students done to better moments of that propagation in that setting, until that converges to some pseudo minimum, and you declare victory on training, and then you go apply some drill and do those competitive things all over here, so well, that way, because the difference between interpolation and extrapolation is, is uh, the thing that was sometimes. Uh, and also, uh, he agreed with this group. Historically, if you want to know the difference between uh, uh, machine learning and all other classes of the neural network and, and, and a common folder or a desperation algorithm, it's one very important truth. The uh, common folder starts with, is this system observable? That's the first thing. It also has more measurements than unknowns, so it's overdetermined. And finally, the most important thing is based on the last relation you get a covariance matrix that you pretty believe in, that you get an uncertainty associated with the death. Well, that's one of the big problems in machine learning of all kinds, including the neural network, is what's the covariance of the prediction. But you, 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 you kind of story to story with it, you, uh, you get it, you try to believe it, and it's going to try 10,000 times to get a good answer well when they have it. So we, and there is a diverging thrust now, I see it, where we're trying to come up with statistical metrics that care across the quality of convergence and also trying to come up with closeness of the requested measurements uh, to a set of support data that's nearby. So there are a lot of things happening in that space. But anyway, Bob said one unforgettable one liner was he said when the cults uh, emerge that are using this blindly getting ridiculous results, he refers to this cult of people as the neural networks. 
you know, so when you have one of the principal authors in the field saying something like this, you need to listen up. I mean, that's how you stop this, but this is a toilet area. But learning without an uncertainty metric and without at least being highly concerned about the uncertainty issue, you can don't get one. And that's, that's a bad deal. And, that, and we, we, need to, we need to be responsible adults uh, and not contribute to that. And we're trying to when we use these things to start an opposition out, but that's a different thing. And you can see you're using the full dynamical system to see where it goes. But when you're trying to come up with a complicated input out map, output map, and you've got to human lives on it, that, uh, that's a different ballgame. these tools. To add a little bit to that, uh, in the context of the problem of trajectory optimization and say for the example of the whole thrusters and uh, when we are fitting the data, the problem is whatever when we do the experiment we get the data, we, we always have some assumptions. Right. Okay. And if we overfit by making use of over parameterized model, Okay, we are going to land into the problem when we are have the actual system. Okay, uh, and one of the example I think the student might remember that a couple of weeks ago we had a seminar speaker from Michigan who were working on the whole thruster and doing all the experiment. And what they were worried about was the whole thruster, the way they their initial experiment it worked, and when they go into the space environment it does not produce the same thrust. Okay, the environment is very different because they cannot really have the same vacuum in the lab. Okay, and when they start to create those kind of conditions, the thrust changes a lot. And now if you have a very complicated model, overfit thing, okay, and you trust it a lot, include it in your trajectory optimization, okay, you are calling for a problem. Right. I will say, you want to have a model, you want to know your uncertainty, you you don't want to overfit, and if you want to correct, you want to go for a feedback. Correct. Okay, w with the help of a feedback, you can even correct for your modeling error. We have been doing it for a long time. Okay, and then you can maybe probably make even a simplistic model work. Yep, yep, yep. And not only in aerospace, in the, in the not, not maybe, directly in aerospace, but dynamics and control still. I mean, this is kind of the paradigm that they are following in self-driving cars. That's like, they, in the self-driving cars, uh, in the self-driving auto, self-driving car industry, I was talking to you a little bit earlier, or it's Chris uh, Scott, yeah. So they have, they do feedback synthesis, apparently. They apparently do optimal feedback synthesis. I was talking to a friend of mine, who works for, you know, uh, in the West Coast. Uh, so they do optimal feedback synthesis based on uh, a simplified input output model. Maybe, maybe, maybe what is there? I mean, not much more complicated than a Dubin's model. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and I was like, okay, so this is the kind of thing that you are going to trust, like human life on. So, so very simplified model because they cannot build uh, feedback controllers uh, based on more complicated models. That was one of their their issues. Not ever specifically, but uh, kind of right. DNC. Uh, kind of yeah. The next. Uh, the next item related to you know, sensing ability is, is, is what kind of sensors you want to invest in. Uh, there have been, you know, there is a new LiDAR that is being invented every day. <laughs> and, and, and that's, 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 that's <coughs> from my point of view, I think we are, we live in very exciting times, especially in the perception part of it, thanks to the self-driving car industry. Uh, because uh, there are lidars now that not only sense position, you know, point clouds, but also velocity simultaneously. Uh, and but they, those lidars are not portable. And you have seen the one that produces velocimetry and, and all that. Uh, 
Uh, it's, a, it's about this, uh, the size of, there are five boxes about the size of this podium. Uh, and there, there are pipelines to miniaturize them and put them on board, of course. Uh, but I think, circling uh, uh, back to what John mentioned earlier, space uh, missions are actually driving a lot of the hardware advances uh, that are required. Uh, for example, the uh, gravity wave uh, sensing mission LISA, uh, which basically um, has, is a formation flying mission in some sense, it trails a uh, battery of spacecraft. Uh, formation that is looking, that's using the entire Earth orbit as a big dish in some sense, uh, and, and sensing gravity waves because, it's, uh, because the presence of a body that has gravity can't sense the wave itself. So the, the accelerometers for that for uh, for Lisa are very sensitive, and the multi physics advances there are going to play an important role in how we do our work because uh, I think they will be able to. Uh, so, so before the advent of cheap uh, accelerometers, through a little bit of history, uh, before the advent of uh, uh, cheap gyroscopes, like the mass gyroscopes we carry around in our cell phone, uh, the Euler's equation is very, very important. You would basically, you know, use the equations of motion to infer angular velocity or estimate it. Now we don't. We directly sense it. Yeah. So I think uh, in, in, the, in the future we can we can envision sensors uh, that basically sense what we can uh, what we what we what we are struggling to model and improve for our modeling ability and that and also circles back to the mechanics questions we can actually solve mechanics uh, problems much better if we use better data. Uh, and, and so on and so forth. I think uh, that's an important area and we want to exploit any new information that we can find uh, in terms of sensing technology. So magnetometers are much better now. Uh, you know, accelerometers are much better now. We can do nano Tesla level, you know, uh, uh, accuracy in man magnetic field sensing. Uh, and we can do, you know, micro G level acceleration depending on what is the value that you're interested in. So I think we live in very exciting times uh, in terms of sensing technology. Um, and of course, uh, in, in terms of inertial navigation, we are starting to use uh, X-ray type beacons and, and stars to navigate inertially as well. And that's a very, uh, it's not developed yet, but in the next decade or so, I think that we can build better X-ray you know, imaging devices than we can uh, do a better job at that. So uh, with that, uh, Chris, would you like to add to any of the new emerging uh, navigation systems that uh, you guys are working on, or, or what, how is the future will, for that? I'm not an expert in this field, but I can say from observation that you see, you know, I guess I'm not in the area of space that's pulling the rest of the country. I kind of see space adopting things later because of risk posture. Um, but I can't say that sometimes it, it's better to adopt all of these fancy sensors, and sometimes just going back to simplicity is, is more cost effective. So you have to be careful not to you know, always be tempted to play play our system when good analysis and other things allow you to, or maybe a subtle change in this posture allow you to apply something. Would you like to add anything, Dave, to the discussion? Well, you know, I think one of the things that you see a lot with, with proven technology is the robustness and the ruggedness of, of what it's doing and, and the old adage of if it's, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Um, and so, you know, so we... I mean, we don't necessarily need to be, I think, on the leading edge of all of these things because there's not a lot of opportunity to have a lot of uh, opportunity to fix things once they're once things have been set. So you have to we have to wait, uh, trade off the reliability with the newest model out there. And uh, so so I think a lot of space systems, especially uh, you know one one-of-a-kind space systems tend to stick with things that work rather than really do, you know, 
know, that's what technology demonstrators are for, is to try out new technologies that are maybe applied in a different domain, but then are now are developed in a different domain and then applied to space. And uh, so, you know, and then once it's kind of shown that, I mean, Pete was talking about the example of the Hall thruster that worked in the lab, but it didn't work in space because it was a different vacuum. You know, that's the type of, that's the type of, of unknown unknowns that you get when you start to apply new technology uh, and without really testing it in a, in, in a true environment. That's good. Yeah, go ahead. Um, just to be, I, I think what the space is also changing, like if we take into account these new CubeSat missions, they will require a new kind of sensing than from, different from the traditional. And if you even we want to do some science with this small satellite, okay, so they, it, it requires, there are different power requirements. Your traditional sensors which are being used in the space, we have to report about them, and that's where some of the new technology which is coming out from, say, the auto industry or the new sensor development, or maybe it just need a, we have to rethink about the new sensors for uh, these new missions with the small satellites. That brings me to my next uh, uh, talking point about, you know, GPS. <laughs> So we have GPS, but we also have other things now known as um, um, Baidu. Uh, and you know the, the future of GPS is not necessarily DOD. Uh, so I think there's a big uh, wave in commercial GPS service providers, uh, especially you know if you think of uh, Google and uh, and other uh, people who think they can launch in the space very easily. Uh, so they they want to probably sell they want to probably commercialize uh, location and location and timing solutions. Uh, so if you will, they, they might uh, want to have uh, cell phone towers in space, for example. Uh, so so that is an open market and an emerging market. Um, we got to be cognizant uh, <coughs> of. There's nothing stopping them from doing that. Uh, so so I think we will probably see big changes in the in the in the picture uh, for, with the participation of uh, private uh, companies in providing services like timing. Everybody needs timing and location on their devices. And we are so much addicted to that now and, and, and self driving cars will make it you know, worse in some sense uh, or, or better uh, from in another sense. So I think there's another uh, completely game changing in terms of, uh, um, in terms of service providing uh, which is the timing and navigation and, and, and positioning service, which will be for, for, uh, for graphs, they might sell it to you for cheap, but it will be like a cable TV subscription, and your car wouldn't work probably without a signal, <laughs> and so on and so forth. Uh, so, so I think that's another emerging area. In preparation to that, I think all of us need to be uh, better aware of how GPS works and, and things like that. Uh, there is a need to, to educate ourselves, and if you're a graduate student, you should be um, you know, looking at as to how GPS works and so on and so forth. And, and so on and so forth. Did you want to add something to that? Uh, this is a completely different uh, ball game nowadays, especially, especially with the uh, launching uh, opportunities that are provided by SpaceX and other that use for. I'll second that. We have a, I have a colleague at work who's an expert in GPS systems. Very, very hot commodity, not only where we work, but very big tech companies who can get a lot of So, right, the demand is going up in the public education. I think there's one warning that people are going for, especially technology with all the cell phone towers and the 5G, there is a lot of danger with all the radiation. and you're going to see a market increase in cancer yeah. and other things. And people don't want to hear that. But there's yes. sometimes, a, and you see, may see differences in uh, wildlife. And I, I don't, you don't know how it affects their navigation systems. And, uh, you know, there were theories about honeybees and their 
dying off, but I actually have heard that that's more not related to that, but more of a um, sort of a, a, a parasite or something. Yes. So you have, to be care, you have to be careful about using, some people will want to blame every woe on technology, but at the same point, there are dangers. Yeah, 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 it might be great to download a movie in one to two seconds yes. with 5G or whatever, but at what price? Yeah. That's a good, fair point. Go ahead, John. Did you want to say One other uh, observation to go on orthogonal is um, we've managed to get through this conference without much mention of orbit debris and all of these ambitions to launch a, you know, a thousand uh, uh, Satellites uh, uh, and constellations for various commercial vendors uh, seems like they, uh, you know, uh, really asking for it uh, in some sense. Uh, uh, having a Wild West approach, you can long launch it again more like you want to if you got enough money. Uh, it may not be a very uh, smart uh, strategy to uh, accumulate a problem. Uh, you know, uh, the Churchillian approach of a uh, view of, uh, of uh, space debris and uh, the government is not always count on us Americans to do the right thing. In fact, we've tried everything else, or in some cases haven't tried that with some obvious things. Uh, I, I really feel that at some point in time, uh, the Leo uh, is going to get too cluttered, and, uh, and we're probably one or two big collisions away from it getting, getting really messy. Uh, I hope it doesn't cost the human life. I hope it costs an expensive spacecraft first uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, get some attention. So at some point, uh, either NASA or the Air Force or uh, the Virgin Space Force or some government entity is going to have to assume the role of a policeman and provider of uh, the ground rules and, and resources uh, to produce the technology and produce some serious sequence of demonstration missions uh, to take down some prioritized uh, schedule, the stuff that uh, is flying around there over the air. Uh, you know, we have on the order, of, the U.S. has on the order of 530 uh, uh, spent boosters, and the old Soviet Union has uh, something north of 1,000, mm -hmm. and those uh, 1,600 objects uh, constitute about half of the mass in the Earth orbit, and it's all derelict. And those are those are bad accidents waiting to happen. Uh, if you imagine the, the, the brief brief that the three hand bus would take if it run into a Volkswagen at uh, seventy thousand five hundred miles an hour, you get uh, not a picture of what we're up against. Uh, we, <coughs> we do not want to wait until we have a big collision <coughs> that uh, this is done. Uh, and uh, I think uh, if I could have a soapbox uh, amongst the uh, Congress and the senators and, uh, and somebody who's going to be in the position of wanting to trade policy, I hope, and the Department of Defense shortly. I don't think we'll mention your names. Uh, but I do believe we need to get our soapbox about this. And the initial try is not to go fund the solution to the uh, uh, bring down all of our debris. The, the solution is to fund the development of the technology and a sequence of technology demonstrations <coughs> which is completely affordable uh, and the uh, dollars that we're spending on space. So a portion of our budget needs to do that. That will drive a lot of uh, technical research, a lot of close proximity, uh, uh, robust control uh, sensing uh, and uh, grappling. Space robotics. There's a lot of a lot of things there that uh, we, we collectively in this room are either good at or need to get good at. Uh, and uh, I think that's that's an area where I hope that uh, DOD uh, uh, will take the lead uh, because NASA is focusing on them on this problem. Uh, and, uh, and the technology for doing that is uh, uh, lots of uh, uh, lots of lots of other things that you can do with that technology.
think I'm going to stop today's discussion right here. I, we are we have a meeting for the dinner at 6, 6.30. Okay, and we have a reservation at the tavern. Okay. And uh, uh, I think, what's the time now? It's 5.10. 5.10. Right then? They want us to participate for 20 minutes, but I'm cutting a shot. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's basically 10 minutes yeah. from here. I'd like to turn on your duck and stove or I'm already across the airways. <laughs> <laughs> that we can, uh, if people want, we can take a walk in the, either in the campus or we can just basically meet in the exit. Yeah, let's take a break and meet in there. Yeah. So, so more occupation issues that we have to run somewhere at a time? What do we need? What are the uh, for, for the dinner at 6 30. Yeah, but here. Uh, no, uh, in, 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 in a restaurant. We have a generation. Oh, uh, yeah, there's actually a parking garage right behind it. Uh, so the tavern, if you if you uh, are walking, you basically go down to College Avenue, across College Avenue, and just turn left. Stay on College, and it's right, it's a uh, walk right by. Right. So it's right on College Avenue. In the parking garage, it's in the, uh, it's big, you know, there's an alley behind there, and there's a parking garage there. Please make sure that your area is clean. Uh, cups, cups are tossed out. The drums are picked up. That kind of stuff. If anyone needs a ride down to the town, I have to my car. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not going to be 